Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host, John DeLynn. It is April 15th, 2022, and today we are super excited to have with us in studio the Maven. Hey, Maven. Hi, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I guess I shouldn't assume that everybody knows who Maven is. Maven is an amazing human, but she has gained much notoriety over the past few months as being, I don't know, a producer slash co-host of Mormonism Live with Bill Real and Radio Free Mormon. Is that right? I wouldn't say co-host, but maybe occasional guest host. Yeah. yeah. But it just is a, 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 let's just say an important part of the team. influence. Yeah. Part of the team, but also an important voice on the Mormon, post-Mormon internet right now. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, I feel like that seems a bit high, but... I appreciate it. And people love you. So we're interviewing you and we're, we're going to hear your Mormon story. How does that sound? I feel really nervous like for having <laughs> even shared it already a little bit on Mormonism Live, but I am happy to be here. So this will be the in-depth version for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we're, we're excited to have you. And uh, of course, we're super grateful to have in studio with us, Jen, running sound and video and jumping in with insight here and there and wisdom. Hey, Jen. Hi. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here today with Maven. Thanks for joining us. So for those of you who have no idea who Maven is and don't know if you should or shouldn't care, let me just introduce some of the themes that we'll be covering today because every, well, every story matters and every story is interesting, but, but, uh, there's a lot here. I think that, uh, will be important to important subsections of my audience. So there's, and maybe you can, you can add here, there's being raised in a very ultra, kind of an ultra Orthodox Mormon home, maybe not quite the prepper, but definitely the Ezra Tap Benson, Bruce R. McConkie type Mormonism. Mm -hmm. Um, there are, there are issues, you know, uh, there's issues around sexuality and asexuality, which will probably come into play later, but that's important. There are issues around being a single young adult and even a single woman in her 20s to even early 30s within the church. Of course, there's faith crisis issues, um, intellectual awakenings. What are other uh, coming into your own, losing yourself and maybe finding yourself as a Mormon slash post-Mormon woman? What are there's there's the topic of poverty and just, you know, to what extent does the church lead to pros- following the gospel lead to prosperity versus not what are some of the other major themes you would want people to I know I think you I think you hit all the big ones Okay uh, okay. That was really great. Yeah. yeah. All right. And then just Maven's just a, I think a really super thoughtful wise human. So uh that as well. So Thank you. Should we do it? <laughs> yes. Should we jump in? And I guess we should say Maven isn't your real name. It is not, if anyone was wondering. No, it's a moniker, kind of like RFM, and it's something I've become attached to. So I I think just like most people, it's easy to find out who RFM is, but he still goes by that. And and I still call him that, even though I know his name. I think I will continue to go by Maven in this space. I know, perpetually, maybe, so... And then what generation do you qualify as? Are um, you are you millennial? Yes, I'm millennial. Um, I am on the early end of it. So I heard someone on the radio call it a geriatric millennial. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if I appreciated that really. Um, uh, yeah, I, I heard a, a moniker for people like me because my, my youngest brother is 10 years younger than me. He's also a millennial, but his growing up was very, very different from mine as far as technology goes. And so there's a subsection, and I, it was after the, um, oh, the Oregon Trail game. It's like it, an Oregon Trail millennial. And that's, I, so people who know that, like, they will know exactly where I'm at. Right okay. There, so. so a little bit of millennial vibes in this episode as well. Mm-hmm. All right. Where does your warm story begin? Let's jump in. All right. So usually we start with parents and family, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I... Uh, on both sides of my family, uh, go back to the beginning of Mormonism, not any real big names that I'm aware of. So, um, no big connections to Salt Lake city or anything there, but I, one of, uh, I know on my father's side, we have ancestry joining the church in England and coming over there, um, and some Scandinavian ancestry as well. So, um, it's actually six generations going back, um, or 
eight generations on my mother's side because the women all married younger, um, whereas it's six generations back mm. on my father's side. Makes so, sense. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, we've been in it. I've been in Utah for a while. Um, my my mother's family, um, her growing up was not the traditional Mormon upbringing at all. Even though her grandparents were LDS, they were kind of, I guess, the, the Jack Mormon uh, you know, farmer types. My great grandpa chewed tobacco, but they still had the belief in uh, Utah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And this is like in the Great Basin area, um, up in that corner of the state. So that's where that side of the family was. But they still, they still had the belief, and they were still Mormon. Um, but my my grandparents, my mother's parents, were the rebels. Uh, so they did not follow it. They had a civil marriage. Um, it was pretty rocky. And so my mother's upbringing was actually very sad and very tragic in a lot of ways. My What town is this? This is in <laughs> Roosevelt, Utah. Which for those who don't know Utah at all. Um, it's near Vernal. It's where, I guess, the corner of Utah that is bordering Colorado and Wyoming. But for my mother's parents, um, I know that my grandmother um, was, was a drunk. She was very neglectful. Um, my mother is the oldest daughter in her family, so she was kind of the mother for her younger siblings. Um, and um, she had a younger brother that was two years younger than her. And I know that he was sometimes uh, really physical with her. Um, just I, he, I, their parents, um, my grandparents divorced. So I, I never actually recall meeting my grandfather. I know he drank a lot too. So he, he just was never really part of um, my life or part of hers. I think um, maybe around eight years old, I think might have been when like that happened. So yeah, so it was just her and, her, and uh, my grandmother who was just not there as a parent. <laughs> so, so your maternal grandparents were kind of the Mormon cautionary tales of what yeah. not, not to do. Yeah, basically. And I'm guessing that's going to shape your mom quite definitely, a bit. Yeah. It definitely did. It was yeah. a very rough childhood for her. And I know, I know that she had to... Um, go to bars to get my grandmother and, and bring her home sometimes, mm, you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, and so, so it makes sense, I think for a lot of things where she went and like I said, I know her little brother would like kind of beat her up sometimes. I don't know like how bad it was. I just know like it wasn't a good relationship. Um, so for my mother, she really was, she went to church. I, I could, I completely understand how that would be a haven for her probably. And, um, she was really looking for a happy family and for a knight in shining armor, like to come and rescue her and, and take her off to the castle. And, mm -hmm. you know, the Mormon version of that is a priesthood holding worthy RM, you know, who would take her to the temple for a celestial marriage like her parents never had. Um, and then uh, my father's family, he's the oldest child in his family also. Um, his mother it was my grandfather's um, second marriage. And um, my father grew up on kind of a homestead. I know they had some gardening and some chickens and, and things like that. And it was kind of a bit more rambunctious, out in the weeds kind of a lifestyle. He did serve a mission. He's the only one of his brothers to do so. And um, it was back just like there was a really short period of time where they were 18 months. So that's when my Early dad Early 80s. Yeah. Um, and so when he came back, I think his family had moved to Roosevelt at that point. And so that's where he and my mother met when he was a, a fresh RM. And so um, I don't know a whole lot about their courtship other than I think it's just a pretty typical Mormon one. Um, you know, my mom met the RM and they got married in the Jordan River Temple. And then I came along just about nine months later. So, yep. And that marriage didn't last. Um, it didn't. So, well, so I came along and then I got a little brother two years later, similar to my mother. And it was shortly after that that they divorced, and so already your mo your mom's Mormon dream isn't material. It's already not working yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's hard. It is hard because I and I know. I mean, I was given a lot of the same promises. I know she was I, the messaging. A lot of it is the same, like year after year and generation after generation. But I know the messaging I got was that you like for marriages to be good and for the best chance to be successful, you need to have a temple marriage and that you were less likely to have a good marriage if it wasn't a temple marriage. So I'm certain that that's also what she was thinking. Like if I, if you, if you do the things, you get the blessings that are promised. That's the constant thing there. So yeah, so it's already not working out. Um, again, I was really, really young then. I do have some memories of that. I do remember, um, 
like I remember my dad not being there and being confused about that. I remember um, having to meet up with him, you know, for weekends and things like that. And uh, he had this really like unique van that didn't have, he used for work, I think, and it didn't have seatbelts, but I mean, it was like the late eighties, early nineties. So like seatbelts, mm. you know, like, <laughs> those are optional anyway, you know? Um, and my dad joined the military during that time, I think because of like needing to pay child support and I, I think for the health insurance and, and things like that. Um, you but, did, did you ever find out what went wrong in the marriage or um, has that been talked or and you don't have to share really. it also if it's not I mean, something I assume, I, you I assume share. the same stuff that happened later. Um, but like, yeah, so I guess if I'm skipping ahead, the divorce didn't uh, work out either. And so, oh. Yeah. So they, uh, so they actually remarried. So the divorce was only about a year. Um, and then they remarried each other. Uh, they had a civil wedding. And I, so I do remember actually being part of that. I think I was a flower girl in it. It was just a chapel wedding because mm. they hadn't annulled the ceiling. Uh, at that point. Oh yeah. So the ceiling was still in place. So they just did a, a, a another civil ceremony to just oh. kind of recommit, I guess. So, hmm. so then we were a military family. So, Oh, so your yeah. dad stayed your dad. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. And I think that's why, uh, <laughs> honestly, uh, you know, they, they remarried. I think, um, I think that was my dad's primary motivation in the, in remarrying was to, they connected to the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Was to, to be the main person over us, the main guy for us. So I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so we started to move around a lot. And so this is like me getting out of Utah and having a lot more experiences, I think, than a lot of people who are raised here do. Um, and so, um, I think we started out in Texas. I think that was Fort Hood. Again, I was really, really young, so I don't remember a lot of these things. Um, we were in North Carolina for a, a little bit. Um, that was in Fort Bragg. And then we ended up over in Germany. And that's where I was when I was eight and I, I got baptized. Um, in Texas and North Carolina, I, I, one thing for sure was a lot more rach, racial diversity than there is in Utah. And so that was all really very normal to me when I'm starting to go to school, like kindergarten, first grade, et cetera. A lot of the neighborhoods I was in, it was like my family would be the only white family on the block. And so um, as I was getting older and I, I loved to read, I was a voracious reader and I, um, I loved reading about brave people doing brave things. So part of that would include kind of Mormon stuff. Like I, like Joseph Smith, I thought was a hero and early pioneers, the sacrifices they made, but also like um, early women, um, Florence Nightingale, Amelia Earhart, um, Juliet Gordon Lowe's who started Girl Scouts. I was in Girl Scouts. I did the selling the cookies and things, all the things. Is a Girl, um, is a girl Scouts great? It is. Yeah. yeah. Very empowering. Yeah. Um, which is why they didn't do that when they had <laughs> scouts for the boys. <laughs> yeah, but I used to exactly. wonder. Yeah. That's why uh, the church didn't adopt yeah. it. <laughs> I, I, I did wonder when I was a teen, like, I mean, I used to be in Girl Scouts. So like, like, how come hmm. we're not in it now? Like, why is young women, why do the boys have scouts and the young women? But I guess we're getting ahead a little bit. Yeah, but yeah. but that's why I figured it out now. It is very empowering. They mm. they like to tell you that, you know, girls can do anything. And um, and I really loved these messages. And um, again, not just women, but also the racial stuff. So I really loved learning about uh, civil rights. I, the Underground Railroad was a huge interest of mine for a long time. I loved Harriet Tubman. I thought she was so brave because she got herself out, but she risked that freedom. Like she worked so hard to get to, cut, to keep coming back and, and get more people out. And I just thought like, that was so cool. Um, and I, like the Holocaust, I read, you know, I tons of stuff on that. People who were hiding Jews away. Sure. And I just thought like, you know, this was really... Um, you know, like the hiding place. I remember that was one of the stories I, I read. Um, anyway, so I, I'm reading all this kind of stuff and I, I'm just so inspired by all of these people. And at the time, I really liked to think, um, you know, if I lived in these times, if I was there, I would do the same thing. Like I, I would be brave and I would, I would stand for, for what's right, you know, for, for these people. And, um, but this is all in the past. I live in a day and age now where like sexism doesn't exist anymore and racism doesn't exist. Like if those have all been solved, you know, what do you mean? Like I honestly, that was the mentality. That was the mentality. When you were I thought I mean, I'm reading about stuff from the past. People used to think like women oh. and black people weren't smart enough to go to college or like have these kinds of professions, but we know that's silly now. So now like, and you know, women and black people can vote and they didn't used to, and we can own property now and we didn't used to problem you know? solved. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, I live in the best era ever. Everything's been fixed. Everything's great. Okay. For a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
yeah, so I guess we can go into like where I, uh, that started to fall oh, apart. Jen showing um, her be a menace shirt. Like, yeah. But shout out to black menaces. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because, because we were a military family, I like in our military wards and stuff, they were, there were a lot of black families. So that, that was very normal to me. And I didn't know yeah, about very. anything about the church's past racism. And it was, I think it was in a ward that I, I said something once I, the church isn't racist. I don't remember who it was I was talking to. I just remember it, it was a black man. He might not have been in the ward, but he might have been like on the base, but knew that we were Mormon. And I, I, I said something I, again, like in my third grade naivety, like, and, you know, my church isn't racist. And I remember his face just being like, whatever you say, you know? <laughs> and I was just like, like, what is he talking about? You know? Um, so I just know it was later that I learned about it. Um, and it bothered me, but unfortunately at the time, I really, really trusted in the idea of prophets. And so I did believe the idea that, you know, the preexistence, that there was something, you know, that they had done. But um, again, I just made myself say like, you know, it's okay because, you know, that was in the past and like everything's equal now. So I don't have to really think about that much, but it was, it was definitely a disappointment to learn, but um, as we'll see over and over again, if there's a conflict between uh, my like personal conscience or values and the church, I felt like I needed to follow the church. The church, yeah. yeah. And so I feel like that's where like pieces of me kind of over time, I started uh, kind of like leaving behind um, unknowingly to myself at the time. So I think, um, well, I want to talk, I guess, a little bit about our, our family dynamics. So, um, with me and my little brother, um, he had some, a lot of behavioral issues when he was younger. And, um, I think just, um, I mean, he was very accident prone, but he also had a lot of anger issues. And I think, I, I mean, just being in the military, it's, and, and my mother worked too, but we were always like, just always struggling. We were always like a little bit lower, I mean, it's socioeconomically. And so I, sometimes we would be like the family, like if you do, um, oh, what is it? Like the Christmas thing, uh, we like sub for Santa, like that kind of stuff. Like I would be, we would be that family sometimes. They would be chosen to receive the yeah, gifts they would, they would that get. other people right. donated to. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, and not, not like every single year, but just occasionally like that, that would be us. Um, and so there was always just, but my parents worked really hard, you know, and of course they paid tithing because we can't afford not to, you know, we really need those blessings a lot. So, um, yeah, so that's what we did. And so I think like with my brother, I mean, uh, there just wasn't a lot of, I think financial resources or, um, and just like mental and energy resources sometimes to maybe deal with it in the best way. So he's kind of a wild child. They did try to put him in sports and things like that. Um, but he was just kind of like just all over me a lot of the times. So I, I bore like the brunt of most of his physical um, just aggression or, or hyperactivity, if that makes sense. Um, and, uh, and anger, like I just, this is just one really quick story. I just remember we were at a kid's birthday party and my brother was, he was only four. He was a small kid. Like we're a small family, all of us. Um, but the kid in front of him, uh, someone had kind of backed up. So this kid took a step back and he stepped on my brother's foot. I mean, it was very light. It wasn't a stomp or anything, but my brother, like it hurt him or, or offended him. I don't know. He said, ow, and he comes around in front of the kid that just accidentally stepped back on him. And he's just stomping on this kid's foot like several times over just to like pay him back, you know, for this accident that happened. And that's just kind of like this is an example of kind of how it was like, you could get out of control really quickly. It's disproportionate responses. Yeah. 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 Um, and so I, by comparison to that, I, <sighs> I was the good kid. So I kind of saw myself as the Nephi and kind of like my brother as a bit of the, the layman and Lemuel. Um, we were definitely very different in that regard. Um, like I said, I loved reading. I loved school. I loved church. I, I loved all these things. Um, I felt really grown up when I could finally read enough to be able to read the Book of Mormon. Like I would start, even if I didn't always understand it, I just, I just really liked that kind of stuff. By I, what age were you reading the Book of Mormon, are you guessing? I mean, like for sure by eight, I know I was trying to, I was reading like in Family Home Evening or like scripture study, we would do it, but possibly earlier. I learned to read pretty young. And so... Um, and so I, that was another thing. Like I was, I was told all the time like, that I was smart, I think because of the, the reading and stuff, but I actually had really middling grades in school. Um, and this comes out later, but I just was recently diagnosed with ADHD just a couple years ago. 
And so like all this time, it just made so many things make so much more sense, but it mm -hmm. often is lost um, on girls because it's not, it's not as outwardly expressive as it can be for boys. A lot of it's internal. And so, yeah, so I did really struggle keeping up on assignments and things like that, but, um, um, but I did well testing. So, and that's another reason if you do well in school, which is typically one of the big indicators if you're not doing well in school. Um, so the few that do well also will often get missed. So I think that was part of, that adds to some of my struggles that happen later, just not knowing that. Um, so yeah. I've so noticed a lot of post-Mormon women um, identifying ADHD mm -hmm. later in their life. So Mindy Gledhill has come out about that, oh, Stephanie yeah. Purcell and Kara. Kara Burrow, yeah. all, all of them. I wondered yeah. about her. Yeah. Like there were some TikToks yeah. you did where I was like, hmm, because yeah. once I found out about it, I, I did this big deep dive research and then I've been like armchair diagnosing people. But I think I, part of it is just our generation. Like they just weren't looking for it when we were that mm -hmm. age, you know? And yeah. again, like if we were doing okay, you know, if it's not causing significant duress to the adults in your yeah. life, yeah. <laughs> then you get missed, you yeah. know? Yeah. So, um, um, yeah, but the indicators were definitely there. Um, so I wanted to talk about, I mean, early on, my parents did pretty good with FHE and which is family home evening, uh, doing a, like a lesson once a week to talk about gospel topics or do something fun. Um, it would be back and forth and scripture study and family prayer. Prayer we were pretty consistent with like in the evenings and then scripture study was a bit more hit and miss, but I still loved doing it. And I remember feeling close to my family when we did it. And I knew that's like what we were supposed to do. The uh, lesson that I remember the most that had a really, really big impact on me was uh, actually a lesson from the Doctrine and Covenants. And I forget what section it is, but it's where Joseph Smith is talking about how to tell a true messenger yeah. from a false one, yeah. right? And so um, it, the, the whole handshake thing, you know, the handshake test. And so at the so, at so point, for for those who don't know this, you know, <laughs> do, you, do you remember what it is? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I mean... So yeah. the idea is that there's there are evil malignant spirits running around as angels who look like normal humans mm -hmm. and Pretending but you can't be angels of light. <laughs> but you can't know whether they're real humans or not. And if then if they're an angel, are they a good angel or a bad angel? Because Satan can be sneaky. Right. Right. So Joseph, Joseph Smith, Smith gives us a way to know, right? right? In the Doctrine and Covenants as scripture. Yes. And so it's the handshake <laughs> test. And so basically the, the way I understand, if I remember it correctly, um, is there's two types of messengers of good ones that you could get. So you could get a resurrected being, um, which would have a physical body. So if you ask to shake their hand, they will shake your hand and you will physically feel it because they have a resurrected body. Now you could also get a, a a messenger that's maybe like somebody that's not resurrected, a family member even is what I understood. Like if you had a grandparent or an ancestor come to give you something, then uh, you could ask them to shake their hand. But because they don't have a physical body, they would know that you wouldn't feel it. So they would refuse to shake your hand, even though like the spirit is also made of matter. So like they could physically hold on to your hand, but you wouldn't, you just wouldn't feel it and you wouldn't know. So they would, they would refuse. But uh, a devil... Or, or Satan appearing as an angel would do it. Would so go to you, shake. Right. So if you shake the hand and you don't feel anything, like that would be. Because they can't not deceive. Right. So they would go to shake the hand. Yeah. You would go to grab the hand it. and you wouldn't feel and it. And that's how you know it's and a bad And that's one. how you know if a, if an evil malignant spirit is yes. trying to deceive you. Right. And <laughs> they're not smart enough to actually know the rule and then nope. like do the opposite. Somehow they can't. Right. And I, I'm take I'm a very, very little, I'm a kid. I was eight or nine. So all of this stuff I think is great. Like this is need to know information. And I really do yeah. think like, I mean, I, I, for one, I'm like, I'm so grateful for the restoration and prophets. Like we can know stuff like this because like these poor, like my neighbors, you know, my friends that aren't Mormon and, and they, they're Christian, you know, they think they know stuff, but like they could be deceived by this. And I really genuinely thought, I think because of the, I already was getting like the exceptionalism, like I'm a member of God's true church, you know, the missionary zeal, all of this kind of stuff. So I really honestly thought like I would get a messenger in my life. Like, it, it seemed completely realistic that I either I would either need a good angel at some point to give me some really important message from God or just that just because we're so righteous, because we're part of the true church that Satan would want to try to deceive me out of it away from the true church. And I might, you know, get a, a deceiving angel. This matters. Yeah. So I, I, think, I, really I, think Jen, I think Jen found the reference. Did you find it, Jen? Yeah. It's in DNC 129. 
um, four through eight. Okay. And all I can say is thank goodness for modern day revelation. Yeah. Right? <laughs> very, very important. Exactly. <laughs> no, but but also just jokingly a little bit, I'm 52 and I have yet to meet a spirit where I get to perform this test. It's kind of weird. Have you, I guess maybe I that's mean, part of your story. Maybe, right? Jen, have you, have you ha been able to meet a spirit yet? I have not. So you haven't been able to try this out? No, I haven't. Okay. Well, let's keep, I mean, viewers, listeners, if any of you have been able to try out this important test that, you know, modern revelation, let us know. We'd love to hear about it. Okay. Sorry. Back to you. No Ada. problem. Um, so we're going <laughs> through this lesson. Um, so we get this part, right. And again, I think this is amazing stuff that I'm learning. Um, very important. And, um, we get to, my dad starts talking about the priesthood and, and casting out devils. Um, I don't know. I guess maybe it's the same section or maybe this was a riff and it was kind of going off on the side, but, uh, my, I remember my dad explaining that, that he could raise his arm to the square and he could command demons to leave or an evil spirit to leave and they would have to obey. And, um, and I thought that was also like really awesome and really cool that we get because we're the true church and we have God's real authority where it's like somebody else doing that. It would not work, you know, because we are right <laughs> and we have all this right stuff. Um, and so I think this is where, um, you know, and Brad Wilcox's talk reminded me of this, what he talked about his daughter, I think, blessing the sacrament, you know, the whole playing church thing. Um, and he got, he got concerned when his daughter said the sacra sacrament prayer, whatever it was there. I remember thinking like, oh yeah, because like she doesn't know yet. It's played as a laugh line, but I thought that part was really sad. Cause I was like, I remember when I didn't know when I thought I was equal, you know? Mm. And so this was the point like where it, it fell apart. So I, I either asked a question or I think I just made an assumption and I said something like, well, when I have the priesthood, I, I'm going to cast out demons or, you know, something like that. And, uh, and so that's where the hammer fell because my dad said, uh, well, well, you, you won't have the priesthood. And I didn't get it at first. I was like, well, not now. I mean, when I'm older, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and he said, uh, mm -hmm. no, you, you'll never get it because you're a girl and like, women don't get it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And especially again, like at this time, I I'm voraciously reading about all these like female, uh, you know, pioneers, um, Madame Curie, you know, like all these great women who have done things. And again, I'm in Girl Scouts, which is very empowering and like girls can do anything boys can do. So I'm, I'm really in this. And so this is the first time, you know, and it's coming from my dad, like, no, there's something that you can't do because you're a girl and not just like my physical dad, but my heavenly father, who's also supposed to love me, you know, um, but it's heavenly father that doesn't want me to have something because I'm a girl. So I remember feeling really shocked. And, and also like my mom, she's the kind of mom that I, you know, the phrase, like if mom ain't happy, ain't no one happy. Like that was, that was kind of how things were. And so my first reaction was like that my mom would not stand for this. It's just no way. So um, when my dad said that, cause, and I saw my parents as equal as well. I totally thought they had equal authority in the home, different roles. I did recognize that, but I still, you know, I, I just didn't notice, I, I think, I guess until this point. So I remember looking at my mom and, and saying, what, what about mom? Doesn't she have it? And I was looking at her and I, I still remember like where she was sitting and how she was sitting even cause she had her legs like tucked up under her. And I remember when I looked at her to say, like, what about you? Um, she like pursed her lips and she kind of closed her eyes and she just did this really slow kind of shake. And when she opened her eyes and looked at me um, and it just was a really sad look. And I probably had the same one, I think, cause I was just learning for the first time, like this big difference here, you know? And so, yeah, so it was just like this kind of connection between me and my mom. And I like, like, no, she doesn't have the priesthood either. Like no women get it. It's not an adult or a child kind of a thing. Um, and then of course, at that point, um, my little brother pipes up, who's like six or so at the time. And he was like, what about me? You know? And my dad was like, yeah, when you're 12, you'll get the ironic priesthood. And that just was salt in the wound because like my brother hated church. Like he, he had a hard time sitting still. Like he was always, you know, getting into trouble and he was layman. Right. Yeah. And so, um, it just didn't make any sense to me that he didn't, he didn't like reading scriptures as a family, it just that nothing spiritual, like it seemed he really liked. And so, um, yeah. So why does he get it? Why does God want him to have it just because he's a boy when he doesn't care and he doesn't want it, but I care and I want to do good things. Um, but I can't because I'm a girl. 
Um, and it wasn't just that also, but like, I mean, talking about all this demon stuff, like I was really honestly legitimately scared a little bit, like demons could come, you know, and I did have a nightmare that night about demons coming and like, I couldn't do anything about it because I don't have the priesthood. So I can't like raise my arm just and make it leave, you know? And so that was something that like legitimately troubled me for a little bit until like it faded enough out of my memory not to think about it. You know, you're making me think of something. I often talk about how the law of chastity, we often explore our Mormon stories, how the law of chastity serves as this binding force to the church because everybody gets caught in the guilt and shame sort of cycle there. This belief in spirits is another one because if you believe there are evil spirits all around that are trying to get you, even though I don't think I know anyone who's ever really experienced a spirit, maybe they felt scared and attributed that to being a spirit. But I, th I think a lot of us who are more in the secular world will admit we've never really met a spirit before, but the belief that there is a spirit right. and that the, and then you add to that, the fact that the church will teach that it gives you the power over the spirits. I guess you just helped me realize that's a, that can be a binding force for people. It could be, even if it's completely not true. <laughs> yeah. I think so. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. I think I just had to justify it as like thinking that like I was under my father's protection, maybe. So even if I wasn't around my father, like I don't, I, I don't think Heavenly Father would allow a demon to get close to me where I would be at its mercy. I had to like work this out in my mind. Like, mm. how am I okay? <laughs> how am I still protected? Mm -hmm. Even though I won't ever be able to like, yeah, send yeah. one away. Um, oh. At the time, like I said, I'm very literal. This is all very real to me. Um, mm. I really, you know, yeah. um, it was something that bothered me. Mm. But that is the start of like what, what every woman in the church does, which is like when you're confronted with sex, which is constant, it's constant. Um, there's never one time where you just like accept it and, and just, you know, and turn it off. You have to renegotiate again and again and again and again. Yeah. Cause what's different about your experience than maybe mine is you're, it's like, there's going to be a, a boogeyman that comes anytime, but you can't have a gun. The guys get the gun. Mm -hmm. You got to find a guy who's got the gun right. to shoot the bad guy. It, analogously, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that would stink to feel like, yeah, Heavenly Father didn't give me the gun, but he gave my brother a gun. Right. Well, I got to call dad or brother. Yeah. If, if a bad and spirit like, I'm comes. the responsible yeah. one. If you're going to give someone a gun, <laughs> yeah, give it to <laughs> don't me. give one to him. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm it's, so sorry. Kind of like, that's activity. tender. That's sad. Yeah. That's sad. I mean, but just the, the learning stuff <clears> and then <throat> renegotiating it. I mean, you either ignore it um, or you try to work it out and justify it. Um, or you try to pretend that it is equal when it's clearly not, but different, equal, but different or separate, but equal, which what some people mm -hmm. have said, but yeah. that obviously has different connotations. Yeah. So I think that's why I, I'm, I am hearing more like equal, but different. I think they're trying to get away <laughs> from like the segregation <laughs> racist aspect of where that yeah. phrase came from, yeah. uh, where it was very obviously not the like impression that they're trying to give when they say that. So anyway, um, yeah, so that's so that's like I guess where all that kind of started. Um, um, I think that's it as far as that goes. My my father didn't like moving around a lot, which is um, a, not a good fit for the military. For the military yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, so we were in Germany at the time. I did get a third sibling um, along that time, and that and this was another thing where it's like um, kind of a Saturday's warrior like. There's one more. My mom felt like there's another one for spirit. us, for our family. Yeah. Spirit. A specific spirit that's supposed to come to our family. Um, but my dad wasn't really into the idea. We've got one of each. We're good, you know. Um, and again, like the, we always were struggling financially. So usually well, adding an extra kid is not yeah. like, you know. Um, but I, I think my mom kind of pulled the ultimate card, which is like, okay, if there's, if there's not going to be any babies, that there doesn't need to be any baby making activities. Ooh. So, um, <laughs> so that's how I got my youngest brother who's 10 years younger than I am. So, um, yeah, so he came along and then, uh, it was shortly after that he was, uh, he wasn't even a year old before my father switched from full-time army to national guard. And we moved back to Utah, back to the promised land. Um, Zion. so yeah. And there was some major culture shock for me, which is kind of funny because, um, I was used to being, almost like a minority in religion, but also in skin color. And, and like I said, in certain neighborhoods. Um, and so like just coming where, and I forgot, or I didn't realize like Utah is the Mormon Mecca. So I remember on like one of my first days in school, I was in fifth grade. Um, I met a girl, like we, we became friends. And I, I guess I already had like this persecution complex already also, maybe because of being out, like out in the field. Um, 
So I meet a friend the first day, and as we get to the end of the school day, I kind of tell her, like, I think I should let you know uh, that I'm Mormon, and you should probably tell your parents and, like, see if they are okay with that. And I honestly don't remember ever having a kid not be okay with it or their parents not be okay with it, but I still had it in my mind, like, I should tell her just in case, like, they won't want her to be friends with me or something. And I remember her saying, like, well, I'm Mormon too. And then I was shocked. I was just like, oh my gosh, this is my first day at school. And like, I met the other Mormon girl, you know, (laughs) um, there was another girl nearby and she was like, I'm Mormon too. And then I was like, oh my goodness, like, all three of us are more, I think we're all here, you know? And the, that's when the third girl was like, um, it's Utah. Everybody's Mormon. And I was like, oh, so that was new. Um, but not only that, but just like following the commandments again, cause we were pretty strict and very like Bruce R. McConkey, Ezra Taft Benson kind of stuff. And I guess I didn't get into like the politics of it, but when I watched Emma's episode, I related so much to her because my dad was kind of the same where like every time a Democrat is a president, um, that's the time, like, they're, they're going to take our guns, they, you know, they're going to outlaw it, then they're going to call martial law, they're going to do something to basically set themselves up as a dictator and, you know, take over everything. I, I, my dad said that for Clinton, he said it for Obama, and, and now for Biden, it's the exact same thing. So there were a lot of I guess, similarities there that I really related with Emma, just no, no bunker. <laughs> How else was your home kind of a more fundamentalist or ultra-Orthodox home um, if, if you want to share, if you want to save that, but like, yeah, no, there's so like I, the no Coca-Cola or no um, PG 13, you know, there are different ways that families express their ultra orthodoxy. That's a good point. There were some things, um, like we didn't drink a lot of caffeinated soda, but I know later as a teen, I think that was something that we got a lot more lax in. Um, but I, I don't remember being told like, I can't drink it. I just didn't like it. And we didn't have it very much. And that's kind of, that's an extra thing. Like, you know, um, um, again, like with money, like you don't waste it on soda unless it's like a special occasion or something, Mm. you know what I mean? Um, so I don't remember actually having much, but I do remember like my dad had, uh, not a first edition of Mormon doctrine by Bruce Art McConkie, but, um, but the next one, and I remember him telling me, uh, like reading me one section about the um, with the whore of Babylon, and he told me like uh, about the first edition, and that, that this specifically, like Bruce R. McConkie points it out that that is the Catholic Church, that is what's there. But it had the to Catholic take, Church is the whore of Babylon. Is the whore of Babylon, right? Like that is the <laughs> the I believe that's the section that it was under, um, something like that. And I remember him saying like they had to take it out of this, you know, because it's not PC enough, and PC politically correct was always said like that with that intonation, like, like a slur almost, you know? So it's not that Bruce R. McConkie changed his mind or was wrong. No, It's that he had to It's not fall PC in line. enough. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that, I remember that being just a little teeny bit of a conflict for me at the time, because on the one hand I was feeling like, well, if we're right, we're right. You know? So like, if it's true, it's true. Yeah. It, you know, yeah. and then on, you know, on the other hand, I was like, okay, I can see, but you know, that would maybe be offensive to people and maybe kind of hurt the overall work. But I remember having that. Yeah. Just like that little point of conflict. Like why did, if we're right and we're the true church, like why do we have to roll back like what we know to accommodate people who are wrong? You know what I mean? That's how I thought about it. And sometimes yeah. orthodoxy is is more, it's more orthodoxy, less orthopraxy. So, so maybe it was just beliefs. It was just mm-hmm. like political or conservative political mindset. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. I am. I know like my dad definitely listened a lot to Rush Limbaugh. Um, um, cause my dad, like he was, uh, he did a lot of mechanical work. And so I know like in his shop and, and things, several jobs he'd have, like that would be like what was playing. And so that kind of ideology was definitely where he was at. Um, and so, um, so equating Mormonism with conservative, U.S. Absolutely. conservative politics. Yeah. yeah. And okay. in fact, there were, there were times where I kind of, I almost feel like, um, religion was the politics and, and kind of Mormonism was like the flavor of Republican oh. religion is kind of how it seems mm, to me. Mm-hmm. Cause I, d- I do, I did wonder about that. Um, um, especially later, my dad would have like one of my dad's most common callings would be young men leader. And he was really good at that. And I just remember there was a, a program once that had been misprinted. My father was the speaker that, that day, but it had Bishop in front of it. Um, and so they would, you know, they played it off as a joke. He came up and, you know, and, and people, elbow, maybe you're going to be called as a bishop, you know, whatever, but it was just a typo, you know? Um, anyway, but I remember thinking at the time, like my dad is not bishop material. I don't think he would ever 
be a bishop. And uh, I remember like trying to figure out why or kind of think like what's different about my dad than, than other people. And that was one of the things I kind of thought of was like, I didn't really feel a lot of spiritualism from him, not like a, like about Jesus, you know, it really was, yeah, just like the scriptures, just like, can, yeah, the orthodoxy and the, and the politics was kind of the most of it for my dad is what I got from that. So got it. anyway, um, oh, I, I did want to talk about like the culture shock and, and just following things because when you're, again, when you're really orthodox and you're apart from everyone else, um, people like will accept what you say about your rules, if that makes sense. Um, just for an example, even as an adult, if I was out of state and uh, applying for a job, like a retail job or something, I would tell people, yeah, I'm Mormon, so I can't work on Sunday. And they would accept that. But they don't accept that in Utah because everyone's Mormon. You got to take your Sunday. Like this isn't a, or you don't get the job, you know, kind of a thing. So, um, and this movie is going forward a little bit, but in sixth grade, I had like a little like puppy love crush yeah, with a boy in my class. And so I get, but we're really young, right? It, you don't date until you're 16. And even then you're supposed to do group dates and you don't single date till you're 18. So we're 12, we're quite a, like, not there yet. But I remember a girl saying like, well, if you like him, why don't you just date him? And so I said, well, I'm Mormon. And she's like, me too. Why well, go on dates? But I didn't know what to say to that, you know, cause I Mormon was usually enough before. And mm. so, yeah, that's when I realized like there's kind of different standards. Shades of Mormon. Right. Right. And there's wrong ones and right ones. And I'm a right one, you know, and she's <laughs> wrong. Right. Um, so that's kind of how I was. So it was, it was definitely very orthodox. And again, cause like I always wanted to be the good girl. I always tried, um, wasn't always successful, but like that was my intent. So, um, uh, as we start to get older though, things really start getting toxic in my family. We're just not really good communicators at all. Um, there's, there's just not any healthy way ever. I recall that problems were worked out or anything. Um, and of course like FHE kind of fell by the wayside and so did, um, scripture reading and so did family prayer. And at the time I completely saw those as related. And so I thought that our family struggled not because there were like deep problems, you know, psychologically like with maybe like my mother's upbringing and, and her attempts at, you know, at parenting with the, with trauma that she had, that she never had a chance to actually work through, you know? Um, and then just my parents' relationship was not good. And then, and like me and my brother in close age to me, it was never good there either. Um, I really honestly thought that FHE and scripture study and prayer would be like the magic bullet that fixed everything. They literally, all we have to do to have a happy, a happy family is to do these things. And so I would be re really overbearing uh, sometimes with my parents, like trying to force it, trying to make it happen, trying to like wrangle everyone together. Cause I really, I just, I just really hated <laughs> the discord. It was really um, awful to be at home, like when things were like that. And I just wanted it fixed. And <laughs> like, this is all that we have to do to fix it. If we just read scriptures and we pray and we have family home evening. I remember yeah. thinking the same thing when I, in my family growing up, because I was just, I just kept thinking, okay, if, if we'll just do family home evening and we'll just read our scriptures every morning, like everything will, will be the happiest family and everything will be good. And you know, nothing bad will happen and all these right. things. And I, and I do remember like finally just like giving up and just like deciding, okay, when I start my family, then, then I'll do that. And then it will be okay because I finally had to give up because it just wasn't happening. Exactly. And so did you have That's that That's exactly same? what happened with my family. Okay. Yeah. I, and you it were being so Nephi. You were literally yeah. being Nephi. Yeah. I mean, and sometimes it works. Like when I was younger, they'd be like, okay, it's a good thing our kids are here, you know, to like help us be good parents. And then, but after a while, like they, they just, they didn't, they didn't want to anymore. And which it made sense. And when we did do it, <laughs> Like it wasn't fun a lot of the times, you know, um, especially if people, I, my younger brother, especially like brought their, um, against their will, you know, um, it wasn't, you know, a harmonious FHE, but I still thought like if we at least just do it and have the habit. So maybe it's not, it's not going to magically just from one, but if we build up the habit. And so I resented my parents because I, I, again, I just thought like, this is something so easy we could do that would fix our family and they're just not doing it. Mm. And why, why yeah. are they doing it? Um, but really, you know it's hard to want to be together as a family if it's, if it's toxic and, and that doesn't kind of help. So 
So yeah, so I got to the point eventually where I was just like, I, I have to give up on this and, I, and I'm going to look for, I'm going to, I'm going to do it on my family. I'm going to do it right. And we're going to have like the best, most amazing family ever. Um, <laughs> and then I also had, um, especially getting into my teens, my relationship with my mom was like, it started to get really, really, really bad. And I still, I still think about it. I feel like I figured out some things because I know she had a terrible relationship with her mother, but, um, my grandmother actually turned things around right when my mom got married. So she was able to attend the, the temple marriage of my mother. And so I knew her as like a normal Mormon, lovely grandmother. She was nothing like the mother that she was to my mom, you know? Um, and so I think my mom really, honestly, probably more than anything, really wanted a good relationship with me. I was the only girl and I was the oldest. And, um, but she just didn't know how. And so if when things didn't go the way she wanted to, um, instead of working it out, I, I feel like I was punished a lot for, I guess, not behaving in the way that she was wanting me to or expecting me to. Um, and if I was upset about things, uh, I feel like her method to try to make me feel better was to talk about her childhood, which was, I will agree, it was absolutely worse, you know? Um, but that doesn't mean that I also don't have pain or I like, yeah, you can't, sure. I have no right to feel any pain, but it's trauma Olympics of, basically. Yeah. That's kind of what it felt Your like. Your trauma is not as bad as mine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think she meant well as in, you know, like I really did think, I think she thought that I would think, okay, I, I don't have, you know, my life's pretty great. I love you, mom. Like, you know, let's go do shopping together or something. Um, but that's, that's just not how it went. Um, and so when things didn't go well, then yeah. Um, or if I, I guess not criticized, but if I, if I said something or tried to point out anything that she did that bothered me or, or hurt me or something, um, I always meant it as like a, something to work out or talk out, but I think it, um, maybe scared my mother in a way. And so I would get like, um, I'm the parent and you're the child. So just kind of by default, like the parent is always right. And the child is always wrong. And so, um, and again, like when I was younger, I really tried to be the good girl. So I, I acquiesced a lot, but as I became a teen, I started to get more and more upset at unfairness that I was feeling and see, you know, seeing. So then I started to push back more and then that just kind of made things worse. Um, and then some of the unfairness, I, I think I, I did have to do with gender um, and being the only girl because um, I know I just feel like, uh, I know part of like my brother being able to do a lot of things he did was just because of the hyperactivity. And, and I think my parents partly wanted to give him an outlet and maybe also like just have him out of the house and making friends, you know, things like that. So my brother was involved in a lot of sports and things like that. And I did have some activities when I was younger, but I remember as I got older, it got harder and harder for me to be able to do after school activities. So, um, so I guess I should say I, I went to school in hurricane Utah, um, for people not familiar, it's spelled like hurricane, uh, but that's not how it's pronounced. Um, <laughs> hurricane. Hurricane. Yeah. <laughs> It's Southern Utah, a Southern little bit Utah. north of St. George, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Or Cedar City or? Um, no. Yeah, like it's between St. George and Cedar City. Yeah. I would say it's like, I mean, a little bit north, but more like east, east. Yeah. kind of like out that way. But um, but I lived in a little town called Apple Valley, and that is in the middle of, right between uh, Hurricane and uh, the FLDS, um, Hildell, Colorado City mm -hmm. compound. So, so. I mean, don't ask me about that. Like ask Lindsay Hanson Park because you would know way more about them than I did. I think maybe because they were like close and maybe like a little too close uh, religiously, you know, they were kind of an uncomfortable presence. So I never really learned much about them. I knew they were there, of course. Um, um, I knew like tangentially a lot about them. But anyway, um, so yeah, so just leave like we lived really far out of town. And part of the reason why Apple Valley is a really unique little area, it's just, it was initially just a settlement and never was a town. It was settled by... I, Feel like kind of like the libertarian types who just wanted to have their own property and not have a city government telling them like what they can do with it. And that's exactly why my dad was there. Um, and because he, he was a car enthusiast. So our, our acre of property there, I think uh, at the most we had like cars on cinder blocks. Cars, yeah. Um, <laughs> I've seen that. I think the most would have been maybe like 20 or I can't say car cause they weren't like full cars like a junkyard know? like Sanford yeah, and Sons yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. um but that's but that's what you know because my for parts you know yeah. to, to build things you know my dad held all these projects that he wanted to do in the future and stuff so yeah so that's why we were there and there's no city government that can come and tell you like you, you're not up to code or whatever but for me like the biggest problem was the distance like to hurricane I didn't have a lot of peers up there and uh so it really was 
pretty isolating. And um, if I wanted to do anything in the afternoon or like stay after school, I had to find a ride. So I had I had so many of my neighbors' phone numbers memorized because I, I would have to call and just be like, I, do you work? Do you get off? At, will you be coming <laughs> like along the way at this time, you know, when an activity was over? And I hated doing it because I really felt like a burden on other people. But if I wanted to do anything, like I had to get a ride. My parents did not want to make a special trip to go and come back. Are you saying you didn't have a cell phone? Uh, no. That, that was very bougie um, back then. Like <laughs> rich people would have cell phones. Um, I did end up getting one a little bit later and it was so big and clunky. <laughs> it was like a house phone. Like it could stand up on its own. Like I had it at someone else's house and they mistook it for their phone when their phone rang and they picked up my cell phone. <laughs> for their home phone. <laughs> That's how big and clunky it was. But that was later teen years. But yeah, I didn't have, so I would have to arrange these things ahead of time, like on our landline. And then Apple Valley too, like even once cell phones were a thing, the reception was really bad out there. Like coverage was really awful. So this yeah. is kind of the poverty theme a little bit. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but when like, I mean, I mean, even just like the next year, I took home a paper once like, uh, cause I wasn't doing any sports. I never had done any kind of sports, but the, there were tennis tryouts coming up. So I remember I like took home the tennis paper um, and I thought, you know, maybe this is something I could try out. Maybe, maybe this, is, maybe this is something I could do. I remember my parents looking at it and going, Oh, it's $80. Like we can't, we can't afford that. So, I'm sorry. You know? And so I just like, okay, you know, I just accept it. I, I believe my parents and yeah, but it's, it's only like the next year and our financial situation is the same as before. Uh, but for football, which was like $250, like way more involved than, I mean, just as far as practices, just uh -oh, everything, like no, way more. Your brother. Yeah. yeah. He's like, my brother is in football. Um, oh, and so, so yeah, so I tried yes to, to like, him. yeah, oh. you know, and I mean, but it was pretty calm. Like my brother, like he got to go out and play like a ton. He was always out of the house and I was always in the house. And part of it, that's my fault. I am a bit of a homebody and I, I was like a bookworm, but it did seem like the few times that I did try to get out, I, it was just harder for me. It just seemed like after a while, my parents said no to me because it was easier on them to say no. And even if I pushed back, it, you know, if they were firm, then I, I would get, I would give up and acquiesce and be like, okay, fine. But with my brother, it was easier to tell him yes, because if they really did like grind down and say no to something, he would be so upset. Um, it just, there was always like a price to pay. And I don't think he did this consciously or purposely, but somebody would get Squeaky hurt. Wheel. Yeah. Something would get broken. Um, you know, just because he was just in a bad mood and just didn't try anymore. So a lot, it really was easier and I understood it. And I, I mean, honestly, I felt the same, like, yeah, let, like if he's going to be like this here, let him go out and play with his friends, just be out, you know? But again, um, and cause there was one, like particularly like, going to the pool, which is, I, it's hot in Southern Utah, there's no pool in Apple Valley. And so, um, that was a big treat. And I had friends that were willing, who lived in Hurricane, they were willing to drive all the way to Apple Valley to pick me up take me to the pool and bring me back. That's an hour out of their day. It's at least 15 minutes. And that was an extremely rare offer. No one from town ever wanted to like bring me home from stuff. Um, so yeah, so I was just like, this is the, that's the big hurdle, you know? And that's usually what my parents would, would say no over. Um, but they said no. And um, my mom specifically, I don't remember like if my dad was there, but I remember asking my mom and, um, and I was really upset when she said no, because I just did not understand why. I, it was the summer I had never done anything almost. I'd been home the whole summer and I just wanted to do this one thing. And so I kept pushing and pushing. I wasn't letting this one go. And finally she said, what about me? And I, I didn't know what she meant. And she was like, well, how come I don't get to do anything? Like, like I'm here, I'm doing the dishes, you know? And at the time it, I just, I was like, you're an adult and you work and you can drive and you have money. Like you have a paycheck. I didn't understand like what that had to do with me or why that was my, so I just felt like she's, my, she's just punishing me. She's mad about something. She just doesn't want me to have fun. And so like, that's how I saw it. Um, and what, I, what was she saying? Well, I mean, I think, again, I think this is where there's just kind of some enmeshment between us where I was some kind of, I, I think a reflection of her. So I think it felt more unfair to her if I was doing something that she wasn't able to, but she could, she didn't have to do the dishes right then and there, you know what I mean? But I think she felt trapped and she felt like she couldn't, even if she like technically could. I guess what I'm wondering is if, if the role of the Mormon woman is very prescriptive mm -hmm. and set and a little bit rigid, if your mom felt kind of constrained by that, 
And then if she's saying, well, if I'm constrained, you're going to be constrained. I think so. I, I absolutely think so. And again, because she had such a hard childhood, she was really looking forward to mm. like doing things correctly that the way her parents did not do them. And she was supposed to be happy. <laughs> like that's what they keep, that's what they promise. Mm. And, um, yeah. and she really wasn't, but she really did try. And I, I did see that like she, um, did try to fit this role more of like the perfect Mormon mom in the ways that, that she envisioned it and could. And yeah, I, I guess and I, you're I sensing agree with your she assessment. wasn't super happy in her no. role as a Mormon woman. No. Um, that she wasn't her parents, but she still wasn't happy. No, no. And it, in fact, there was a school assignment once where I was supposed to ask my parents, like, what did they used to want to be when they were a kid? Like when they grew up. And when I asked her, she said, happy. Hmm. Um, that was the answer to that. And then, but on the flip side, if there was ever any time that I seemed ambivalent about being a mother, which I I don't feel like I ever was, but I, I, if we were like watching TLC and there's like some birth show on or something, I think if my face was like, you know, then my mom would be like, being a mother is great. It's, I mean, like the childbirth is painful, but it's, it's really beautiful when you have the baby after. So like, that was the only time she was ever really like effusive about being a mother is if I seemed to not be into it, but I was, cause I was, again, I was very orthodox. So I'm already taking in this messaging. So I think it was just something, some, if my mom saw something, then she would do that. But outside of that, it did not seem like she loved it. And it did not seem like she really, um, I mean, she loved us, but, uh, wasn't really happy with us a lot, you know? And uh, there was actually one time that my grandfather called, I had answered the phone, I, but I didn't recognize his voice or know who he was. And so, um, he just asked for my mom. And when I handed the phone over, she booked it out of the house, just like, but I get like, it's, it was a, it's cheap house. So she's standing outside, but I can still hear her like on the other side of the wall. And I hear her just like praising me. And again, this is the time when our relationship was really, really awful. But she's explaining like, you know, my, my daughter's doing well in school. She got Sterling Scholar. She's doing this. You know, my brother's like doing great in football. The team is, you know, all those kind of stuff, which she's normally not her go-to when she's talking about us. And I remember just thinking like, what is going on here? Why is, you know, and then when I found out it was my grandfather, it made sense. Why? Because it was, kind of like a, a no thanks to you. Like I have this great life, dad, which you were not a part of, you know, and I'm doing fine without you kind of a thing. Mm. That was what that was for mm. her. I think to kind of, you know, stick it to him, which I understand. Like he wasn't, he wasn't there for her. You were Sterling Scholar. I was Sterling Scholar. Which, which category? Um, foreign <laughs> language, Japanese. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, but don't speak to me in Japanese because I won't be able to say much back. Um, but yeah, I really, yeah, I really enjoyed that in school. So I mean, um, if I'm, if I'm a Mormon mom raising a Mormon girl, I want her to know that she's got limits because her whole life is going to be about limits and being in the box. So part of my training for her is to make sure she knows she can't do everything she wants to do. It's kind of the opposite of the Girl Scout message because she's going to, her education, she may or may not get, and she's going to have kids and she's not going to be able to have a career. She's not going to be able to pursue her education as much as she wants. And she's going to be a stay-at-home mom. I mean, am I wrong? I initially want to push back on that. Um, but I actually <clears> think um, I'm not saying that's true right. for everyone. Right. No, but, but I mean, generally. Because I feel like, again, like, because I was just this big reader when I was younger, like, people would, would tell me, like, you're, you're smart. She could go to college, you know, which no one in my family had done. And I think I just got that message. I just, assumed, I, I'm going to go to college, you know. I think my mom did want that for me. Um, but uh, I know, like, when I started talking about going on a mission, um, that was not something that she was into. Uh, she was not, uh, like, very supportive of that. And so I'm, I'm kind of thinking maybe that that, is, that does kind of go along with it. I was just going to say, um, the feeling... At I had, when, when John started to talk to I kind of had a pushback too, like in my mind because, but not, yes, like what, what you're saying is true. Like that is like, they do, they do need to let us women, female know that like what our place is, but they've been taught how to spin it to where we think that we're so that's such an amazing role. Like that's what you want. That's what is like, it's just, I don't know. It, they, they spin it to be this amazing, amazing thing. Like, you know, and a non-selfish thing. And like all these words, they, they used to praise you to be in that role. I think part of it's self-assurance. 
yeah. also. That that's where they're at. So it's you, reassuring to themselves that they also made the right decision. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You just said it like right. point, point blank. Yeah. Yeah. And both of us probably are like, oh, wait, yeah. but then it, it is that, yeah. but then they spin it at this weird yeah. thing and it makes it, your, your mind and your body actually like react. Yeah. Cause they'll <laughs> never funny. say, they'll never say, well, you're not going to really pursue your education to its first You're not going to go to college. You're not going to be able to do what you want it's to. It's more, not, you get yeah. to be a mom and mom is the most sacred Thing, yeah, right? that's what the church mm -hmm. says. <clears throat> yeah, but I was just, you know, my mom and my sisters were all taught a woman doesn't need more than a couple years of college. And the whole purpose of going to college is to find your eternal companion. Or to have something, if your husband dies, then you might have, have something, something to fall, to back, fall on. back on. Like those yeah. are the two narratives. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't even think I was told that I should go to college. Yeah. But I'm, yeah. Yeah. It, and it, I was so, I was very smart. Like yeah. I took AP classes in high school. I tried to get as much calls college as I could in high school because I knew mm -hmm. in my mind what was sent. Yeah. What, you know, what was expected of me. So, you know, I had, you know, super high grades and was super smart and was taking like AP calculus and history and like all of these things to try and get myself ahead. And it's just, now looking back, I'm like so sad. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree, but I, you did hit it like, right on the head there, and I. I don't uh, mean to be telling you what it's no. like to be a Mormon woman. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's true though, and I think, and I feel like that plays into my best friend as well. Like her, her mom also married young, and you know things like that. So I think, yeah, there is a sense. Of, I think setting up the expectation correctly. Um, Can I just make? I'm sorry. Just one more observation. You're yeah. teaching me things. Another thing I'm realizing is no matter how much better your parent, no, no matter how much better your parents give you a life than what they had as a Mormon, it seems like the church still benefits from the children thinking that their parents didn't do a good job. Because what that does is it makes them want to graduate from high school and do the Mormon thing better than their parents did. Because mm -hmm. by your mom's standards, she gave you a way better upbringing Absolutely. than she had. She was so there. by her mind, yeah. she's she's the mom of the century, maybe a little bit, at least better than what she had. Absolutely. But then you're like, ah, oh, this is a this is not the upbringing I wanted. I'm going to do Mormonism even better. Right. It seems like the church might benefit. From that scenario. I, I agree. Yeah. And I, I think that was part of the problem that she couldn't figure out what was, what's the problem between me and my daughter. I'm doing so much more than my mom ever yeah. did. I think she just didn't understand. She wasn't able to see what the problem could be. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. and that's why I feel bad because I, she really did want that relationship with me. She just didn't uh -huh. know how to get it, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, but in uh so I, like I start young women and this, I, it's not a normal lesson, I don't think, but my first Sunday school lesson in young women happened to be about budgeting. And so that felt very grown up to me. And again, like I'm, I, I never suffered like from Peter Pan syndrome. Like I don't want to grow up. I wanted to grow up. I wanted to get out of the house. I wanted to be making my decisions. I, you know, I wanted to, I felt like I needed, this wasn't my real life. My real life was going to start when I was out of the house and I just couldn't wait. So just kind of biding my time as I like growing up as a teenager. So, um, um, yeah, so I really digging into church stuff. And then this is like a real quick aside, but it like in middle school, uh, normally I liked school, but seventh grade was a really rough year. I lost my friend group and I was bullied by them. And it was kind of, and that was something also that really enmeshed me in the church because then like, I, I didn't like being at home, really didn't like being at school now either. Church was like the only like haven left. And so, um, and I was really lonely. So like, I have no friends anymore because like um, my own group turned on me and part of that was my fault. So I, it, it's still just like, just girl stuff, I guess. Right. So anyway, that was a rough year, but it was over after that. Like, I mean, summer vacation, we, it just, everyone moved on, but that year was extremely tough for me. So I really, really got into church. I had my scriptures with me all the time. I was like, you know, I would eat my lunch and then I'm by myself. So I would just be like reading from the book of Mormon and the Bible. Um, and just, you know, um, really, I really felt like God was on my side. And so I, I felt like he was my only friend at that time. And so, um, yeah, so I think that's where like a lot of it came in. And then again, with the family stuff and young women, I do want to do things correctly and the right way. So I am, um, I'm taking in all of the I guess the toxic church teachings, the Ezra Taft Benson, you know, it, I mean, this is how you will be happy. Even though I could see like my mom did the same thing, 
and she's not happy, I still, and this is something the church, you blame people when, when things don't come out right, if the promises that don't come forth about this, you know, temple marriage that's supposed to be better than if it wasn't. Like the, you did something wrong. The blame reversal. She did something wrong. My dad did something. But wrong. just so people know, the right. Ezra have Benson that would you know he's my cousin. Like, but he would have given these famous general conference talks in the early '80s, saying a woman's place is in the home, having babies, and if a woman works outside the home, it's basically wickedness and bad yeah. for the family. Unless it ruins it's the marriage. An, unless it's an extreme emergency. Right. Yeah. And see, that's another thing too, because that, cause my mom did work out of the home and, and he even says in that talk, like if you, if you need to, you know, not have piano lessons or something like that, so the mom can stay in the home, like you need to do that. Um, and so I really thought part of the reason why we struggled and that we weren't more financially successful was because my parents did not have the faith to have my mom at home. And so I honestly, like in my mind thought that if, if they had enough faith to just have my mom quit her job and, and do the stay at home mom thing. The Lord would bless us in ways, that, you know, my, maybe my dad would get a promotion or, or a different job entirely, or just other things would happen and we would be better off. Like that is how I thought the world worked. God blesses you if you follow. And so I, I honestly felt like some of our poverty was because my mom worked and brought in more money and we would be better off if she didn't. But she had to work so she that you to. could survive. Well, I mean, that's, that's the secular view, you know, if you don't believe in God. And if you don't trust that he's going to bless your family, then oh, I guess you're right. John. Ouch. So, Ouch. Yeah. So that, I, that's how I saw it. I, and I really, um, yeah, yeah. I, I just, I definitely judged my parents like by these standards that I was learning. And so, um, and I, I do feel bad about that now because it really wasn't their fault, but there else like, there's this prosperity gospel, you know, like it. And so I really, I, cause it wasn't just like the, the stay at home mom, my ideal Mormon family <sighs> Uh, was like the the businessman dad, you know, white collar worker, and a house that had at least two stories. Because I felt I felt like all the good Mormon families had like a basement with a den that you could have activities in, you know, or like watch a movie like on a really big TV. Um, so at least two floors, you know, if it wasn't a basement, then a second floor where you had, or an extra living room, you know. This is what like the great Mormon families look like. And they always had like tan or beige walls with white trim and those really expensive, <laughs> like Jesus pictures from Deseret book that were like hundreds of dollars. So it's like, like my family would never have in a million years. Like that would be way extra to have. And our, our little tiny houses, like we wouldn't even, we didn't have like a, a display wall, a mantle, like where you could put something like that. Like that's not the kind of places we lived in, but that was kind of like my idea. Um, oh, and like big, huge family portrait where like where everyone's smiling, but it's like a real smile, not like we're doing it for the pictures. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So. That's, yeah, I, I really did think like part of the discord and then also part of just the, the financial struggles, like was because my parents weren't like, there's something they weren't quite doing right faithfully. Otherwise mm. we, we would be more successful. Yeah. So, so that was that. your Mormon dream yeah, that, your, right. that your parents weren't living up to. <laughs> right. Um, that you would have someday. Right. Like better than other people. But yeah, I just, I did definitely think I was going to improve on that. Um, and so that was one thing that I, one thing that I really got into besides the family stuff was I was, I got really worried about apostasy and just like milk stripping stories, you know, people who were offended out of the church, you know, things like that. Um, and it really, really bothered me because again, we're like, we're talking about eternity here. So I'd like, how can people in this short life that we have? And it, it just really worried me. Like, what if that happens to me? Like, what if there's something that, that offends me that I give up my entire salvation for? Right. So I would do these like Abrahamic tests in my mind. Like what, what's something that could happen to me that, you know, and I, and I would just work through it, how I would get over it. And one of them was polygamy, obviously. I mean, the FLDS are right there. Um, I did have like a, a brief little interlude with some anti-Mormons who totally lied about Joseph Smith and said that he had a 14 year old bride, which like, obviously he would not have done that. Um, but I did know like there was polygamy in early church history and there were some pretty young ones. So I was just like, okay, well, like, even if that's a lie, and I was like 14 or 15 at this time, I was thinking about this. I was like, well, what if, okay, just what if the prophet who was Gordon B. Hingley at the time, like, what if he said like polygamy is coming back? And I was like, whoa, I, you know, no, no woman likes that. Um, but I was just like, you know what? Like the, the important question, one might call it a primary question is like, it, do I trust the prophet? Do I think he speaks for God? And I was like, okay, yes, I do. So I, I would accept that if that happened and it's not going to happen, but if it did, I would accept that. And then I thought, you know, what if someone said like, or what, you know, the prophet said like, um, God told me to marry you. 
Um, and at first, you know, I, I was like, yeah, Joseph Smith was way younger. So like, that was just like way different than Gordon B. Hinckley. He's a lot, 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 lot older than me. So that, that would never happen. But then I was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm giving myself an out. I don't want to do that. So, okay, no, what if it was Gordon B. Hinckley? Like, what if I did have to marry him? Um, so I wrestled with that for a while. Like, well, do I trust him? Like, do I think he's the prophet? And yeah, I do. So I was like, okay, I would. And it just, so I would just, I would do stuff like that where I'd be like, I would accept polygamy. Um, I would be, a, you know, a teen bride. I, I don't think, I didn't like the idea, but I honestly thought like, I, I trust the prophet and I don't think they would ever ask that if it wasn't from God. So it's almost like, the, it's almost like the Jim Jones Kool-Aid test, but you're mm-hmm. doing it to yourself yeah. in your own mind, like an Abrahamic test mm-hmm. in your own mind. Right. Yeah. I remember reading an enzyme story. Almost brainwashing about, yourself. Yeah. Oh, oh, absolutely. Right? I was definitely actively working to like wow. program myself, honestly. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I feel like we've talked about a lot of things. I did actually want to talk about the future because I did want to go to college and I did really want to graduate. Um, but it was definitely just like to be educated. Like that was the goal, like to be an educated woman. It would make you a better wife and mother. I did want to be a wife and I was absolutely preparing for that. But um, I... Um, Anything I wanted to do besides that, like the mission, um, I remember watching a program about the uh, Jerusalem Center on TV, and that looked really cool. So I was like, I want to do that someday, um, because obviously I was going to go to BYU. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't go anywhere else. Like it's God's school, right? So, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, and then, um, but I did think, like, even though I did want to do all of these things, I honestly thought there's no way I can do all of it because, like, especially like mission, I mean. I could be married during that time and still do it, but I just thought like likely that I'll be pushing my marriage to like 25 or 20, that's pretty old. Like I was like, I just, I don't think I'll make it that far. You know, <laughs> I'll probably have to give up one of these things, at least one, um, because I knew like if I'm in school and I get married, uh, you start having kids, you don't put them off. It's, it's, you don't put them off for financial reasons. You don't put them off to finish college, like, even for the whole backup thing. Like I was the, that was just wordplay. I feel like really the the backup idea because if you if your husband needs to like move or you know start a job somewhere, like it's your job. Your your education is over until later. So um, yeah, so everything was always like my whole future was always Plan B because Plan A is marriage. So I'm just planning my backups. Um, I did want to talk about like I my best worst bishop. I think. Yeah. Um, and I, he was be, like, he was truly a good bishop. It's not like stories that we have on here a lot, but uh, I, at the time I thought he was a terrible bishop. And so this is what kind of makes it funny. And so he, first of all, he was not a white collar, like businessman bishop. And so that was already kind of a, a strike for me. Blue collar bishop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, um, I mean, you are in Apple Valley. Utah. I am in Apple Valley, yeah. And so, like, well, so not initially, a lot of IBM executives. Well, exactly, yeah. Um, but you know, I was just like, well, you know, the Lord qualifies who He calls. So, um, I definitely <laughs> just saw it as like this is pro- a really good experience for him. The Lord's going to teach him a lot, you know. Versus like the other bishop, where I thought like he's bishop because like he's already got the skills to be there because it, like you know. And, and this guy is learning. That's kind of, that's how I saw it. So, um, and then so a couple of my experiences kind of uh, f- like fit in with that. So there was a, a youth temple trip where we uh, were doing baptisms and this was something I just, I, I happened to be menstruating. And so I, I get cramps really, really bad ones. And so that is the only thing that will like make me start asking adults around me if they have Tylenol or something. And so, um, uh, one had Excedrin. And so they gave that to me, which is, I think it's Tylenol, but it has uh, a lot of caffeine in it. And it was just uh, a little too much stimulant for my body. So this was not something I was able to figure out for several years, but at the time I, it caused a panic attack, but I didn't know what that was. I'd never had one before. I just felt dread and doom. I felt like something really, really bad was going to happen. And of course, my only framework for interpreting that initially was the Holy Ghost, you know, like warning me maybe, you know, but but warning of what? Like, I couldn't figure out what that was. Um, and then uh, because we were going to the temple, I was like, you know, actually, I think this is maybe Satan. He doesn't want me to go to the temple. So he's making me feel really, really bad and just like awful so that I'll be like, oh, I, I'm not going to go. I'm going to stay home. So I honestly thought that like the moment I walked in the doors, like, it would just go away and I would feel amazing peace, you know, from being in the house of the Lord, but that's not what happened. I still felt bad. And not only that, but like it was getting worse and worse. And again, it was just this, just this really awful, awful feeling. So at the time I thought that, um, 
like it was an evil presence of some kind, either like the devil himself or like, you know, one of his minions or something. I thought maybe I'd done some kind of a sin and I brought this presence into the temple and then I lost it. Like when I thought that thought, I started crying. Like I was just bawling. I just thought like, this is the worst thing I've ever done. You know, like this is the house of God. It's the most holy special place. And I've done something like to bring something evil in here. So I start crying. The adults are like, you know, what's going on? So my bishop takes me, like we go to this little side room and he's asking me what's wrong. And so, I'm, I mean, he, do, he did two things really great. I mean, first of all, he, I said, I, I think I sinned. And he's like, well, well, what have you done? And I was like, I don't know. I was like, I'm not very nice to my brother sometimes, you know, but I, I thought that's like, kind of like a daily normal thing that you just like keep trying to do better on. You know, I was like, I just, I can't remember. So the first thing he said was like, well, if there's something really serious, the heavenly father wants you to repent for, like he will make sure that you remember it. He would never do this to you for something that you don't remember, uh, which seems really obvious now, but like, it wasn't to me at the time. And then, um, um, after that, he just, you know, sometimes like we feel bad and we don't know why. So he, he was telling me I was fine, but I just didn't believe him because I was not feeling fine. This is called scrupulosity. Yes. I, yeah. well, I wanted a blessing. I really thought I have something. I needed him to like cast out of me. I really, really thought this, like, this is how literal of a believer I was. Yeah. And he wouldn't do it. Um, or if he did, I actually don't remember if he did do it, it wouldn't have helped no, because because it's scrupulosity, right? It's religious well, it's OCD, caffeine, it, <laughs> it's like it's a stimulant yeah, sure. mixed with scrupulosity, but the stimulant needs to work itself out before anything will feel better, you know. But again, like at the time, like I be he couldn't make me feel better, so I like he's doing something wrong here because if he had the priesthood or you know, I, or he was doing things right then I, you know, this would have fixed. And it was something that troubled me for a while to like eventually kind of fade it out of my mind. Like, why did that happen at the temple? I never figured out what I was supposed to learn from that. Um, so his blessing didn't help in your mind. Um, if he gave me a blessing, I just, I honestly don't remember if he gave me one or not, but I, the result would have been the same either way. So you still felt crummy, which you associated with being demonic spirits. Yeah. Or? Cause it was just, it was just doom. <laughs> this is dread. There's something really bad. So you brought evil spirits to the Lord's holy yeah, temple and that's, that's really bad. That's what I thought. Yeah. And he didn't like confirm that. And your or bishop like, couldn't you know? fix it. Yeah. <laughs> no, didn't fix it. Oh. Um, another thing that happened was, um, just like a random memory. And I, this I think happened probably before the temple, but I just remembered something like silly that I had done as a kid, like with another boy in my class. And, uh, I almost felt it's hard to kind of explain, but basically it was just like, I know, just like, like the edge of our pants, I like, kind of pulled it down a little bit, like to show our hip and, and the boy like touched it. It was really just hips, but we were like, I know we thought we touched each other's butts. Like he did the same thing. I just, I did a touch, you know, and it's just something really juvenile, right? It's, it's so embarrassing to talk about it now, but I was just like, I know this is, this is a story. We touched, I butts. Say. We, touched we touched the butt, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, like finding Nemo. I touched the butt. Um, anyway, when I, it was something I totally forgot about, but then I like remember it as a teenager. And of course there's all this like law of chastity stuff. Right. So when I remembered it, I was like, oh my gosh, I have violated the law of chastity. Like I have done something really awful. And it's funny now, but at the time I was devastated. I really, really thought I, I was like all the shame, all the embarrassment. Cause I, I need to talk to the Bishop. I need to repent. Like I'm not going to be able to take the sacrament. My parents are going to know. And I think part of it being like so juvenile made it all the more embarrassing for me. I almost wonder if I would have felt less embarrassing if it was actually like a real thing because they would have understood that. But they, I, I just thought they'd be like, why, why did you do that? You know, I don't know. So, but I don't know what to do because like, I guess I just the shame of it. I, I don't know. I, I don't want to do it, but I know that I have to. Like, that's the only way to get clean is to talk to the bishop. But if I ask to talk to the bishop after church, like, they're going to know. Everyone's going to know. So luckily for me, there was a, a youth activity in uh, Apple Valley, and there, our bishop was, like, dropping kids off at home. And it just so happened I was going to be the last one dropped off. So I was like, okay, like, I've, I've got this, like, moment where it's just going to be me and the bishop between this, this last kid and then me. So I bring it up then. So I, I confess, like I tell him what I did and I'm sobbing, I'm crying. I'm so embarrassed to even be saying it, you know, and, and I just feel just so sinful and just awful. It was just really, really bad. And so like I get done again, like wiping the tears away, telling him what I did. And, uh, you know, he tells me, um, you know, when kids are young, it's very normal for them to be curious about their bodies and also about the bodies of the other gender that, and, 
he, you know, he said that it, it's, it's normal and um, it's not a sin. And so I, I want to tell you that you're okay. Uh, we don't need to do anything else. Just make sure you live the law of chastity now and, uh, and you're good. You're fine. Nice. It's just like super great. Yeah. Like that is like, but at the time I was just like, this guy does not know how to bishop. Like he is doing it wrong. <laughs> you know, uh, like he, you know, but at that point, like I was just relieved to have confessed. And I just thought like, this is on his head now. Like if he's not doing it right. And I was supposed to do all this. I felt like, yeah, the sin is on his head now. I did my part. So, you know, I'm, I'm totally fine. Like not having this public shame and embarrassment and having to tell my parents like why I can't take the sacrament and all this kind of stuff. But I really did think like, it, he's just, he's a bad Bishop. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, well, I mean, he's trying, he's learning, but he's not doing it right. Um, anyway. Um, so that like, those are my teen years. I, I don't think there's any like other major stories. No, there is, there is one more. And again, this also goes just with the, um, uh, like every, all, all the clothes that we had, they were always like from thrift stores. So when we moved back to Utah, it was always like the DI. And I've also just never been very like fashionably forward. So even though like you can get nice stuff at thrift store, I, it was just always cheap stuff. I never um, like liked my clothing or was ever like, into fashion. It always just kind of stressed me out trends and things like that because I could never like keep up or fit in in that kind of a way. But there was one time, and again, this was from the thrift store. Um, uh, I think my mom had bought me this red dress and I, it, it was all red, but it was also like completely covered in lace. And it was like pretty modest, but it was kind of borderline. So even at the time that I got it, I was kind of like, well, I don't know if this is really like, because of the scrupulosity, I, I, am I, I'm kind of like on the border here. And I, I didn't like thinking that I was maybe on the border, but like it came down to my knees. Um, I think the best way to describe it is just like, like a weather woman, like someone on the news that that kind of like. I mean, it'd be a form fitting dress, but not super tight or anything, but it usually it kind of goes down to the knees. Um, and it was, you know, the collar was high. It had wide shoulders and it had sleeves, but like, I guess like here, like where the sleeve kind of ends, uh, from this point all the way down, it was just lace. So it was something I knew like garments wouldn't go in, even though I'm obviously too young for that, but I know like, because they're like, some of it would show on the sleeve. So that was another thing that kind of made a borderline for me. And then just the fact that it went to my knees meant I had to like really be sure to sit ladylike, you know? So it was just kind of, and I it was developing a figure and, it, and this was like the first thing that kind of showed that. And so again, like technically it was modest, but it, it was borderline. So it made, I only wore it to like one family event. Um, and so I liked it, but it just hung in my closet and, but my mom liked it too on me. And so like Sunday after Sunday, she would be like, why don't you wear that red dress? You know, you should wear that one. You look really good in it. Wear that red dress. And I just always felt a bit much for church. So I, I, but finally I caved one day and I wore it and everything went fine. I did feel good in it is that it's like, it was really the only dress I ever felt in that I, I felt good in, but I got out early in young women that day or something. So I remember I was standing in the hallway and I'm, I'm leaning against the wall and I was just off in my own mind somewhere, just waiting for like, you know, Relief Society and Priesthood to get out so we can go home. Um, but there were some, I think I was a, a Maya maid, which would be that I was 14 or 15 at this time. Um, and there were, uh, priests down the hall from me. So they were 16 and 17. I think that's the ages for them. So, um, I, I was in my own mind, but sometimes like when, you know, somebody's talking about you, you just kind of snap to the present. So I had a moment like that, um, because I heard one of the boys say, why do girls dress like that? And mm. I knew I was the only person in the hallway, like besides those guys. Yeah. So, well, I'm first, I'm trying to check like in my wait, wait, is there somebody else in the hallway, you know, um, because they're, they're behind me. And I definitely like the last thing I want to do is turn around so that they know I heard them. Um, so I just, I just freeze. So that's what one of them said, like, why do girls dress like that? And then the other guy said, like, they think it makes them look good, but it doesn't. Oh. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting emotional now. It destroyed me at the time. So How old like, are you again? 14 or 15. Oh. Yeah. But I thought they were right. You know, like these were like righteous boys. You know, I think one was the son of the bishop or like the first counselor, you know, and they were, they were the good Mormon family, like <laughs> with the multiple stories and the beige walls and the family portrait, you know? And so I remember thinking like, yeah, I really did something wrong here. Um, I knew, you know, like I knew it was wrong, but like I let my mom, like my mom pressure me into wearing this, you know? So, and that was another thing, like now I'm mad at her again, you know, because, um, yeah, because I wasn't like what I was supposed to be. So I, you know, 
And I kind of felt like, man, um, in the future even, because like, again, because these boys are like two years older than me, they're going to go on missions and then they're going to come back. And like, that's when I'm going to be like graduated and marrying age. I'm like, what if this is the reason why like I don't like I, I'm written off by a worthy like RM in the future priesthood holder because they're going to remember this. You know, I saw them as like really righteous about it, you know. And so and I thought it was a good lesson. Like this is this is a good lesson for me, you know, to not push through the borders, you know? Mm. And so, yeah. So like well, I what it should have been, it should have been this moment of like, you're coming of age and you're wanting to feel pretty and you're wanting to feel loved and accepted. And it could yeah. have been this beautiful moment of acceptance. And instead it's this moment of shame it's and vanity. loathing and yeah. vanity. And yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. So like I cried in the, so I being the, I was going to be the first one done with church and like waiting for everyone else. But then they ended up waiting for me because I was trying to like get it under control, you know, cause I didn't want to talk about it with my family. So, um, so I like try to get it under control and then just like that 15 minute ride, just really trying to like keep back. Cause again, I don't want to talk to my family about it. Um, so it's just a really long ride where I'm just really like bottling it up till I can get home. And then, um, um, and I threw the dress away and I, I had to go through oh. extra steps because like I, my mom had like had seen me throw away stuff before <laughs> like that she didn't think. So I knew like if my mom saw it in the trash, like she would be like, why are you throwing this? She really liked that dress. And so I made sure to like put it in the bathroom trash and then like wrap it up and then put it in the kitchen trash when the kitchen trash was full and I put more stuff on top of it. And then I, t and then, like I did all of this to like take it out to, the, to be sure my mom did not see that I was throwing it out, you know? And then like throughout the years after she'd be like, whatever happened to that? red dress like you looked really good in it and i'd just be like i don't know i can't find it you know mm. i just yeah so anyway i'm so sorry so that was yeah but i mean again like i just i thought that that was a good lesson for me so that's like the teen stuff um oh no no there's more just kidding just kidding all right anti-mormons really quick um i had said uh i, I had learned about from anti-Mormons that Joseph Smith, I really loved Joseph Smith. And I thought he like a martyr. I thought he was the greatest person ever. And I really thought like the reason why people don't like Mormons and the reason why they don't like Joseph Smith is because like all these anti-Mormons just like lie about him. They just say like the worst, most awful things. And, uh, and then people just believe it. And so, um, I, I, it was like a really early internet forum kind of a thing that I was like, I'm just going to tell them what Joseph Smith was really like, you know, and then they'll know the other side of the story. And then I quickly learned that these guys were all dark. They already like were under Satan's spell and, you know, and, and they were a lost cause and this is not my job, you know? So I, I quickly kind of got out of there because I, I didn't feel good. Right. Um, and then, uh, I had a, like one teacher at, at the school that was not a Mormon. And I remember her telling my friend and I, cause we were really good friends with her. And she told us one day, like she had heard from somebody that used to be Mormon, that there's a part in the temple ceremony where like, uh, so like you're, they touch your genitals, like you're, you're naked and then they bless your genitals. And I remember my friend and I just like, just, it was just the most unbelievable thing that we ever heard. Lives. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just like, man, these anti more they will make up the worst stuff possible. Like this was just like the most degenerate thing I could think of anybody like making up about the temple, you know? And so like, of course my friend and I hadn't been yet, but we're like, no, that is not what happens in the temple. Absolutely. That is an anti-Mormon lie. These, you know, they just hate us. We're, you know, persecuted. We're giving this narrative. So she's like, oh, okay, okay. You know, so I go home and I go tell my mom, like, you, like, you will never believe what I heard the anti-Mormons say. And, um, I tell her and then like only for her to kind of be like, well, um, well, like you wear a shield, so you're not completely naked. You know, I, I was not expecting the conversation to go that way. You know, by the time I went, um, like there wasn't the shield, like they had changed that. But for my mom and at that time yeah. there was yeah. a, an open shield where the sides and, and she's like, and it's not touching your genitals, but it's just like, like your hip at the side, you know, or just like your breastbone here. So yeah, that was kind of like the disturbing thing was just how much truth there was to it. But I still, you know, they're still lying. They still made it sound worse than it actually is. But that was just like one thing. I, I had a similar moment at BYU as a freshman before my mission where the God makers had come out and it's like, they're claiming that you wear a green apron in the temple. And I'm like, no, you only wear white in the temple. And my, one of my friends who had just gone through the endowment for his mission, he kind of looks at me and kind of just, he can't tell me, uh -huh. but he just kind of opens his eyes wide. And I'm like, whoa, the God makers the got something that you can't, right. They can't say no, that's yeah. not true. Yeah. Then you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. When, when you find out the anti-Mormons were telling the truth, it's, it can be disturbing. 
Right. Yeah. But see, that's what made it even more worse because they were mixing truth in with the lies, uh, you know. Partial truth. Very devious, devious yeah. people. Um, I remember <laughs> in seminary, we actually briefly talked about the Hoffman case, and this was a rift. Obviously, it wasn't part of the lesson. But again, like anti Mormons, you hate the church, you become a sociopathic bomber, right? That's. That's how it goes. So I, I had learned about this like way back then. But one thing I remember my teacher actually kind of making fun of, he was like, there were, there were, I mean, cause obviously if you don't know anything about the real origins, if, if you just have the sanitized version of church history, the idea of a salamander, like giving disinformation to Joseph Smith is, is, is stupid. It, it, it sounded stupid. And so my seminary teacher was saying that there were members of the church who, I mean, obviously there were members who left over it cause they believed it foolishly. And then there were members who believed it, but still stayed and they were justified. And they like wrote articles or saying like how like uh, this could be actually like a, a reference to an angel, you know, things like that. That is that we're all kind of laughing about it, right? Um, but I know now that article explaining and justifying it that way was written by Elder Oaks, whose picture was on our wall in the seminary building. And so I wonder, like, did he not know that it was Oaks that wrote that? Or did he know? And he was still kind of just making fun, you know? And then the other problem with that was like, why are we making fun of the people who stayed in the church? Even though they believed the lie, at least they stayed, right? They didn't lose their salvation like the other ones. So I was kind of feeling a little uncomfortable about that. And I just had this brief thought that I kind of pushed out because I don't have to worry about it. But like, would I want to believe in a lie if that's what it took for me to stay in the church? That was an uncomfortable kind of a thought. Another way wow. to phrase that is, if the church wasn't true, would you want to know? Um, I right? didn't think of it that way, no. No, I'm saying that's, like, a, that's like yeah. a different way of thinking about a similar yeah, I already like, I took for granted that the church was true. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like if I had to justify something that actually maybe I didn't really need to because it wasn't true in the first place, and so you know whoever was justifying didn't have to anymore once it was obvious when you know it came out as a fraud. But yeah, it, that was an uncomfortable idea to think that you would to keep your testimony you would believe something that was not true. So yeah. Um, but again, I, I didn't. I don't have to worry about that. So I guess I do want to say just really quickly, faith was just something really easy for me. I, I, I really enjoy watching stories because everyone experiences Mormonism differently. And so I know like a lot of people, they, they're like, I never believed, I never connected. I feel like my brother was like that. He Nothing really connected that way for him. Um, so he was out of the church like before he was even out of the house. It made sense. Um, but for me, I just, I really accepted everything I learned like as a kid, all the primary lessons. I think I just had no reason not to believe it. So I really just... Um, and I like held it strongly. So, and then as far as like dating and stuff goes, I think, um, well, I mentioned in, I, in sixth grade, I had uh, my first, like puppy love kind of a thing. And it was just, it was a boy from my class. Um, but, uh, and our parents actually worked together. So they were actually pretty okay with it. Um, and when we had a, an actor, like after school activity, I would like, hang out at his house with his family and my parents would pick me up there. But anyway, we're 11 or 12, um, but we're already like, we're getting ready to go into young men and young women. And we're already getting like these purity culture things. So people were already just kind of like telling me to be careful basically. And so like we decided, we had to talk, like we decided we wouldn't even hold hands at then because we were too young, you know, and someone really had given me the idea that like, well, if you, once you start holding hands, like that becomes boring. So then you move on to the next thing, you know? So I was, I was very worried about this slippery slope, you know, I didn't know like where the point of no return is, you know? And so it's better just to not even start. But, um, I mean, as alluded to, I, I identify as asexual and, and this, uh, this boy came out as gay shortly after high school. So, I think we would have been okay holding hands. So, <laughs> that's all I'm gonna say. Um, and then uh, I would always like I would have I almost almost every year I had like at least some kind of a crush on a classmate, whether or not it was returned. Um, but even if I did like uh, if it was returned, it just always kind of settled into a platonic friendship, a, a best friendship, and I always really loved that. Um, and so and I always thought like that's where and that's the ideal relationship anyway, right? You want to marry like your best friend. So, um, so that's how things were as far as that goes. And, but again, like the slippery slope, I it was never like really very touchy, but it was very flirty. It was easier for me to get along with guys than with girls. So, um, yeah, but when I finally got to be 16, just at like a few months in, I had one of these like platonic guy friendships. Right. But then 
I like one of his friends was a 19 year old who was getting ready to go on his mission. And like he started liking me and I was extremely flattered by that. So I did start going on dates again, not dating because I'm 16 and I can't steady date. So I have to intermix it with dates from other guys so that I'm not steady dating. But, um, but yeah, he was like my main thing and he had a leather jacket, which I thought was like pretty cool at the time. So, um, yeah, I'm, I know it just made me feel like really grown up because he's 19, you know, he's an adult. He's been out of high school for a year. I still have two years left. So like, I felt like, um, I mean, for him to be interested in me, I thought I was really lucky. So luckily like that could obviously go very wrongly, but for me, it didn't, um, you know, he went on his mission. He didn't ask me to wait, which is like, I don't even know if that's a thing anymore, but it was still very much a thing, like part of the culture then this idea of like, of waiting for your missionary. And, um, so many of my friends really thought that I was super lucky to be dating this guy now because by the time he gets back from his two-year mission, I would be 18 and graduating. And then I, I don't have to like wait like most people do for their peers and have this awkward stage of where you're waiting for a guy like, you know, to turn 21 when the guy does. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I had my guy like already lined up and I think my mom really liked that too. Um, and adults in my ward even were like, oh, you know, like asking me, are you going to wait for him? But by this point, um, one thing that I had learned, uh, despite all the you know messages about marriage, and I did want that, I did think that one mistake that my mother had made was marrying the first guy that came along. And I did not have to do that. And, and not only that, but I had recognized, like my mom never had a chance to like be her own person and find out what made her happy. So at this point, I felt like I'd need some time outside of the house, like outside of my family on my own to at least figure myself out. I only thought I'd like a year or two, I was enough, but I felt like I really did need that before getting married. I mean, to even know that I was marrying the right person, I had that sense. And so I knew from the beginning, I didn't want to wait for him, but it really threw me off when it, cause I thought that was a smart thing. And I thought it made sense when my peers would think like, that's romantic. You can get married at 18 when you graduate. Um, but for the adults in my ward to also seem to be like thinking along those lines, I thought was strange at the time. So uh, Are you saying, was it your mom's journal that? Yes. Yeah. This was another attempt of my mom, I think, to try to connect with me by giving me her journals so, so that I could see how miserable she was. And, and she was, I learned a couple of things from it. one was like, don't only write in my journal when I'm miserable. Cause I was doing that too, because it was really difficult to get through, but she really did. end like almost every entry with like, I just can't wait until I, like find my priesthood holder and get married in the temple and we'll live happily ever after that some version of that was at the end of like almost every single entry. And so that's when I realized like I'm on the same path as my mother. Um, I am going the same way that she is. And that's where things like really start to diverge. That's where I was like, I, I need to be happy as a person myself and not expect that to come from my husband, which I had been at that point. I just thought, you know, love, true love. That's all you need. And, and that will, you know, I, I think it's, I think all kids kind of take for granted that their parents ever loved each other at one point. Cause that was another thing. I randomly came across a photo of theirs, a really small one. It was just, it was in a book. So I'd been flipping through and I found this wedding picture from them. And it was, it, again, like the relationship was not good at, at this point. I remember looking at it and they're smiling faces and then, and it hit me like, oh my gosh, they really did love each other then. It hasn't always been like how I know them. They were young, like me. They felt this kind of a way. And that, so that was another, like, something went wrong. I got to figure out what went wrong so I don't do that. So, mm. yeah, so that's what happened there. Nice. Um, and then um, as far as, like, like, LGBTQ issues were starting to come up. And so this is, I guess, another orthodoxy thing. Um, I'm extremely naive about a lot of sexual things. Um, there... Um, Bill Clinton had a, a particular scandal <laughs> that he's well known for. And I remember at the time, I, I have a pretty good vocabulary. I'm trying to figure out like what exactly what happened because I don't know. I'm thinking like, well, you know, when I take an oral test in school, that's a spoken test. So what is this spoken sex that they're talking about on the news all the time? <laughs> like, I, I couldn't quite figure it out. So finally, I, I asked my mom, like, what, what's oral sex? Um, 
And uh, she totally passes the buck to my dad. And like, she's like, really, mom? It's a sex question. I feel like the same gender parent <laughs> should be answering it. Uh, but no, she passes it totally. So I, I go out to my dad. He was outside, I think, mowing or something. And so I ask him. And so of course, he attempts to, he's like, ask your mom. And so, so I said, I did. She said to ask you. And he's just like, I'll tell her, thanks. you know. And I don't remember said, but he explained it enough for me to like, be properly disgusted. And I was like, that's exactly what a degenerate like Democrat would do. You know, like they have no more. Morals, you know, um, so I guess that is something I skipped. Like that part, I just part of the politics thing was really this idea um, that uh, like Democrats and atheists and scientists in general were people that like were really genuinely bent on uh, destroying America's freedom and destroying religion. Like they hate God and and like this is what they do. So uh, initially, it really uh, like just very black and white thinking like we are the heroes and they are villains. Um, Liberals hate the country and religion and God. Right. Conservatives the, love God. Communism, and, I, Ezra Taft Benson, like yeah. you can't be, you know, without the mentions of communism and, and any kind of socialism, anything that's going to help somebody else, um, it's going to lead to communism and, and just destroy the country. And, and all of those kinds of things too, like anything about, yeah, just anything that would benefit. That's that's the front. That's the lie that they use to dupe you. So really, there were no good Democrats. They were either like you were part of the elite, part of the uh, the agenda, you know, or you were uh, duped into believing the fake agenda, but you're supporting Satan, really. Like, that is really how I saw things. So, um, and, and one of the, uh, like, key ways uh, that they were uh, setting about to destroy the country and destroy religion was through the gay agenda. So... I remember my father and, a, and a, an uncle coming home from a gun show or a car show or something that had happened in St. George. And um, uh, they came and they were really upset. They were talking about uh, like two guys that they had seen holding hands. So I, I meant like they had used the F slur, which I heard on the playground and stuff at school. That wasn't really new, but I, I never didn't actually know what it meant. So this was the first time I actually asked, like, okay, what does that mean? And so my dad explained to me, and then again, like, because I'm naive, I'm like, but like, how does that work? You know? And then when he explained that to me, I was just really like grossed out. I was just like, oh, why would somebody do that? Um, and my dad said like, they're degenerate. Like that was the answer. Like that's why gay people do what they do. And it didn't really answer me, but I just, I just trusted my dad. So I was like, I guess that must be it. I remember like Ellen was also really popular then. And so even now, like if I'm going to say her whole name, I have to think carefully about her last name because it's just so common, like Ellen Degenerate. Like that's, that oh, was her show. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so like, that's what um, like she would be called. So, um, and I, uh, I learned that past prophets said like being gay is a choice. And again, like I can trust the prophets. That's what's so great about being part of the true church is that we can get this revelation. So when things are really confusing like this, where people are saying like, this is a cho like this is not a choice. I was born this way. I can't help it. Like that's how like I, we can know that they're lying because we have prophets that tell us the truth. So um, I was in like, and this was also like for underserved people, like because of the, the income thing, I was part of a program called Upward Bound, which like allows you to start college classes as a high school student. So I was doing the summer program and I had a teacher, it was like a communication 110, you know, just really low level class. And this was like the first liberal Mormon I met. So I was really unsure about him because like he was claiming to be Mormon, but he was believing some very different things than what I thought makes you a, a good Mormon. So there were like, I, I guess a few red flags about him, I thought, but there was one day in class he was talking about, friend of his who was gay and he was telling all the like horrible things that happened to this person um they had lost jobs they had been kicked out of um i mean their family um but even like housing rentals things like that they'd been beat up uh, enough to be hospitalized before it was really really awful stuff and i felt really bad i never i mean even when i thought it was wrong and it was i never thought like that meant they deserved this kind of treatment you know but I was still feeling really uncomfortable with the way the conversation was going because it, you know, obviously was, you know, pro-gay marriage. And I, I did not believe in that. And so I remember, like, again, that feeling that the need, like, I need to say something. I need to stand for what's right or, you know, or, I, you know, anyway. So I just, I didn't like that I was being made to feel uncomfortable uh, for the consequences of somebody's unrighteous choice, even if they didn't deserve those consequences. So I speak up. At one point, and I said, like, um, but he chose that, though. Chose? He cho like, to be gay, right? I mean, he chose it. And I, it's so embarrassing now. But like, my teacher just, like, lost it. And I think rightfully. 
but I like I did not do well like with men yelling at me. Busted and so this hell. was like a really he started yelling. Yeah. He like how dare you kind of. He was like why would somebody choose that? And he, he lists all the things again. He was kicked out of his family. He like all this, you know, he was kicked out. He, he was hospitalized. He like anywhere he goes, there's Believe. this risk. There's that. Why would somebody choose that? Tell me why. Tell me a reason why. Mm. And I had nothing. I didn't know why somebody did it. It certainly didn't seem worth it, you know, for a choice, especially like if you are attracted to women. Yeah. Like, why would you? Yeah, do something with someone you're not attracted to for all it, it, it was just the first it just really really hit home and so um i didn't say anything but it's it unsettled me for days because like i couldn't come up with a reason so like i i think it is you know they were born that way i maybe that's true but the prophet said it wasn't so that was like the first time i was like could the prophet be wrong about something really big like this and it was really uncomfortable for me but I did eventually get there because I know like when, you know, my friend uh, came out after he came out to me right before I went on my mission. So it was just a couple of years, you know, out of high school. I already knew for sure at that point. So I, I don't remember really a specific moment because it wasn't then. But maybe it just kind of, like, I guess, maybe slowly settled in from that. I, it's not a choice. Um, but I still kind of had to go through the stages of like, all right, it's not a choice, but they still shouldn't do it, you know. Like I'm single, they're single. We're both not having sex, you know, unless we're married and I might not ever get married. So in that we're equal that way, you know, um, which is not true, you know, but anyway, that, that was like my first, um, I guess like first time really understanding the issues like around LGBT stuff. Mm, so, and thank you for also, sharing. yeah, like just the idea thanks. that a prophet was wrong. Thanks for being vulnerable. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's basically it. I mean, I didn't take sex ed in school. There was like a health class. It was opt in. So you had to get your parents like to sign if you wanted like that part. And I didn't even ask my parents because I, I thought if I asked them, they would think that I wanted sex. So I definitely didn't want them thinking that. So, um, yeah, but that's, that's high school. And then, I mean, I graduated. I didn't wait for the missionary. So, um, I guess I could say real quick, I, um, I actually didn't end up even applying to BYU because I went with a friend to tour Snow College. She had wanted to go there. And when I went there, I felt like I felt the spirit there and I felt like that's where I needed to go. So when it actually came time to apply for colleges, um, I did not apply for BYU. Um, I went to Snow. So, yeah. So I guess you're graduating from high school in some ways a very Orthodox Mormon. Yeah, graduated it, from seminary, of course. <clears throat> Scripture master, I did all of that. So yeah, devout mm -hmm. Maybe on the lower SES sort of side of the spectrum, but also determined not to become your mom and not to become your parents. Right. Some some things on your metaphorical shelf, some items on your metaphorical shelf. You're precocious. You're a reader. You're a thinker. Yeah. I knew but, like the but, shelf thing. I knew that talk. I had read that talk at the, like, mm -hmm. as a teen. And yeah. so I did like going through life. If there was something I did think of it as like, I'm putting this on my shelf. Like I, that is how I thought of, of things. So it's kind of funny. That's such a, a big thing on this side of it. It was always a part of my life since my teens, the shelf. I do <laughs> want to say this real, real quick because I was being conditioned to be willing and able to give up everything. So I actually, and this is something that has stayed with me is that kind of a superstition about making plans that are too solid because I thought by doing that, you're almost inviting the Lord to test you in real life. So anytime I heard a story of someone like a, a woman who said she didn't want to go on a mission, but then felt compelled to by the spirit or the reverse always wanted to, but then she met a guy and she felt the spirit said she needed to get married. And even guys like I, I wanted to be a seminary teacher and that didn't work out or I was going to play football and that didn't work out. There was just kind of this idea that like if there are hopes or plans or things that you really, really want, um, if you want them too much, like God might have different plans for you. So even talking about, it was always, I want to, if I get to, I will, I, I hope I can serve a mission. I'd like to graduate college. I always kind of worded things that way because I always wanted to be open to go wherever the Lord would have me go. I love it. Yeah. So where does your Mormon story uh, pick up? pick up from here. Yeah. Um, so it picks up with me going to snow college instead of BYU. Um, and you didn't do BYUI. Um, 
so my friend wanted to do a tour of Snow College, and I, she was too shy to go on her own. So I went there with her, and I felt the spirit there. So this I, I is felt Ephraim, like from Utah. This is an Ephraim, Utah. Yeah, it's uh, it's near Manti, where they, the Manti Temple. If people are familiar with that and the pageant that used to be there, um, yeah, Ephraim is just north of that, and that's where Snow College is. And is it snowy at snow? Um. You know, what stands out to me more, I think, would be uh, the turkeys. <laughs> There's a lot of turkey Lots farms. Of and uh, when the wind blows the right way, uh, you're very aware of that. So, like, <laughs> that is a part of campus life. Um, it's, it's known as a bit of a, like, Manti is known as some fringy fundamentalist Mormon groups. It's kind of viewed as a bit of a f- fundamentalist I don't, I don't think I was aware of okay, that, actually. Fine. Yeah. Um, I just, in the, like, just the campus life, really. So, you're saying that you felt the spirit. I, yeah, it was really, I mean, and I had been on a lot of college tours as part of the program that I was in, but they always get, it's really out of the way. So I had never been there. So yeah, I don't know. I just felt like it was the right place to be. And, and so did my friend. So we both uh, ended up there, but not for each other, but for separate programs uh, that we found there that we were interested in. So um, yeah, so I didn't even apply to BYU. Didn't mm. even know, like, um, I was kind of what, like if I could get in or not, but then again, like, there's an application fee. And if I know that I feel like I'm supposed to go to snow, like that's too much of a fee, like for vanity <laughs> to know if I would have gotten in or not. So. Holy goes for the wind. Yep. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. What evidence need you more than the gift of the, the, the testimony of the right? Holy ghost? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I felt like that was the right place to be. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. And I'm fine. I think probably it was better for me than, um, it's a small school, you know? So I think, uh, I don't know. Provo might've eaten me up a little bit. Who knows? Yeah. I yeah. know. Yeah. Okay. So you leave home and go to Ephraim. Yes. Ephraim, yeah. Utah. Um, I go to Snow College um, to just, yeah, start my um, associate's degree. Um, they had a teaching English as a second language program there, the te- uh, TESOL program. And so that's what I was interested in. And the reason why I liked it was, I, I think maybe just from being in the military and having lived in Germany, I did have kind of a, a travel bug. And I did like learning about other places and other cultures. It was just fascinating to me, different clothing, different ways of thinking, things like that. So, so this program was interesting to me, but also I felt like this would be a perfect backup, you know, um, it, for jobs. And so it's, it's really to flexible. motherhood, you mean? Yeah. To motherhood and in a marriage, because I mean, with, uh, with TESOL, I, you could teach in the country, you can teach out of the country. So, you know, like if my husband traveled, it, it didn't matter wherever, like, like, cause he's just a big blank to me. Right. So I, I just thought that wherever he ends up, if he, if he's like in the state department or something, I could always find a job somewhere if we needed it. Um, I could do full time if we need to, I could do part time if we need to, I could just do private tutoring and just have people in my home. Um, because you, you can do it in the U S you can do it anywhere. So I, it just seemed perfect. And I would get to meet, you know, the international students, which was, I think the highlight of, um, of being there for me. Yeah. So, yeah. Actually, before I I went there a little bit early, and the reason why um, is because so I actually graduated a semester, not a semester, a quarter early from high school, um, but I did stay to like finish seminary and whatnot. And as I the closer I got to leaving, the more excited I was getting about starting my new and future life. And so what I didn't notice happening at the time was my mother getting more and more sad about it which makes sense now, of course, like the, the only girl and the oldest kid leaving the nest, like that's a sad moment for anyone. And I, I wasn't seeing that though. And so tensions between my mother and I like rose again, because I think because of these miscommunications. Um, well, I, developmentally, your job is to differentiate and to leave home, not to bond more with your parents right. during that time. I think my mom was hurting and the more excited I was, it seemed to hurt her more. Mm. I think I did not see it at all. I was completely blind to this. It wasn't until after that I I kind of like realized and maybe pieced some things together. It was your job to be blind to it, by the way. Okay. (laughs) Appreciate that. Um, I was like talking about it constantly, just nonstop. I I got the schedule. I was like picking out my classes. I'm just so excited to be out on my own and like to be picking all these things and like looking for where I'm going to live. And, um, uh, you know, all this stuff. And so I remember there was one time where my mom invited me to go grocery shopping with her. And again, this is in Apple Valley. So normally if we did grocery shopping, Hurricane did have a, um, a grocery store. It didn't have a Walmart then, but it does now. It's a lot bigger now. Um, 
so normally like for a we would do a big trip we would go all the way to St. George to go to the Walmart it would be a, a big it's not a quick run to the store right so um it's like 30 minutes to get to St. George and then a couple hours shopping just really like you know bulking up on everything and then 30 minutes back home so like for this instant she she asked me if I wanted to go with her and I said no but I didn't the question wasn't literal. What she really meant was, will you spend time with me? Mm -hmm. And I did not see that at all. So when I said no, um, that was, no, I don't want to spend time with you to her. You know, there's this half hour, like talking time, just us girls, yeah. like going there and coming back. And so it would be stuff like that. I think that really hurt my mom. And so I, I was at work, I think. And then I came home one day to find that uh, everything in my room had been shoved into my brother's room because they had always shared, like, yeah, you know, ever mm. since my youngest brother was old enough. And then um, the older, younger brother, the closest to my age, all of his stuff was moved into mm. my room. So and, you were moved out before you moved out. Right. Yeah. And that was that was really distressing to me at the time. It was it was really, really unsettling. So it was definitely like a, a big deal. And I, I did not see that coming at all. And I was already, like I said, I'm already planning on moving out. So I didn't know why my mom couldn't just like wait a couple more months, you know. But of course my my brother has been wanting his own room for ages, forever. So of course he was on board for that. And you know, so it was mainly the two of them. Mm. And my father had said, like, he was there, but I, I mean he was outnumbered. So so um, he did say, like, I don't think this is a good idea, but that was about all that he could really do, I guess, at that point. And so, um, yeah, so my youngest brother was still in there. He was like seven or eight at the time. And he was really sweet about it. Um, but yeah, I just, it just really, it was really, really, really unsettling. And so I refused to sleep in there. Um, it, it, there was a bunk bed all my stuff was in there and I would hang out there sometimes, but I slept on the couch for two weeks and I, I just made plans to move early. So I found a, a place that was open in the summer, like that would take me for just like a, a month. And then, so I actually ended up moving even earlier cause I just didn't want to stay home anymore. Um, but yeah, so that was kind of like a weird kind of shocking thing that I wasn't expecting, but my youngest brother was really, really sweet about it because I, I mean, I was in there once, I think I was texting on my phone. I did have a cell phone at that point, but texting was also like where you had to hit the button a whole bunch of times, like to do an S or whatever. Anyway, it was quite an endeavor, but that, that's what I was doing. And uh, he came in and it, he knocked on the door. And so I said, um, yeah, you don't have to knock on the door. Like, this is your room. And uh, he's like, oh, I just, I just wanted to make sure like, you know, like you didn't want to be alone or something. And I just thought like, this is really like, this is the youngest kid, you know, and it's his room that like his older sister was just shoved into, you know, he didn't have any say in this either, but he was like the sweetest about it. And really like, it seemed like the only one <laughs> that cared about my feelings at the time. So I know that's just something that's always stood out to me about him. But anyway, yeah. So I'm out two weeks later. And then my mom was really hurt by that too. She, she got really kind of tearful. And at the time I was just like, why, why, why did this? <laughs> like, this is what you did, you know? Anyway, so I'm there early. And then, um, I, I met, uh, so I, I met a guy who ended up becoming my boyfriend. So I, I can't remember, he helped me with moving or something like that. He just happened to be walking by and he was in my ward. So, um, yeah, we just started hanging out a lot and, um, he, so he's actually a Japanese cop. So he's one of the international students, not one that I ever ended up working with because he was uh, out of the T-cell program. But he had come, uh, he was not a member when he came to Snow College, but he did end up like meeting with the missionaries and, and having some good Mormon friends. And so he had been a convert, I think maybe a, a couple months to maybe a year um, by the time that I met him. So uh, yeah, and then- um, Did that affect your Mormon journey at all? I mean- I mean, a little bit, I think, um, you're trying to figure out who you are, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, and then I meet a guy right off the bat. Right. And so, and you're um, supposed to get married. So, right. Like, you know, what's funny is actually like we became a couple before I realized <laughs> that we were a couple and part of it was, yeah, just uh, like miscommunication, but also just the, like the Mormon dating standard is that you're, you're supposed to be dating around until like, you go exclusive. So he had asked me like, uh, like, do you want to date and, or, or like, will you date me or something like that? And he meant exclusively, which I did not catch. I just thought he was asking Matt out like on a date, you know what I mean? 
So I can't remember when it got reconciled, but I was fine with it. I did like him. So I was pleased to realize that he had been my boyfriend for two weeks before I, I was aware of that fact. So anyway, so that's kind of how it went. So it's kind of like I ended up in the relationship before I even realized it. Um, but he was, uh, like, he was sweet. He was a really great guy. Um, I mean, in the end, I think it's, it's really good that it didn't work out, but we were like, he helped me be, he was very social. So I think that's where like my sociality came from that first year was just like through everybody that knew him. Um, and so you mentioned off camera that this is the only boyfriend you've ever had. Yes. Yes. And you, so you dated him for how long? We dated for a year and by then he wanted to serve a mission. So he made the decision to do that. And, uh, um, yeah, you know, so like he he went to the temple and everything, of course, which I couldn't do because I hadn't, you know, I hadn't gone through any of that kind of stuff yet. But yeah, he wanted he just like he really loved the gospel. He really took to it. And so he he wanted to he and he got his call like back to his home country. So initially, like I was going I was thinking about waiting for him. Like that was the plan. But he I actually got dear Jane. So he dear Jane me, like as as a missionary. But it was actually I it was really a good thing. The relationship was not very good by the time we were getting to the end of it. And I think I, because I was young, I didn't, I didn't realize it because it was good at first, you know? And so I kept, I think as things started to not be so good, I kept trying to think like there's a way we can fix this and like kind of bring it back. Um, and that some of it was culture. Like a lot of times we, there were just misunderstandings and we would know or sense that it was a cultural misunderstanding, but even knowing it and trying to talk it out, sometimes we still just like couldn't get past it or, or figure it out. And, um, and there were ways like, I mean, he is, he's a really good guy, but there were just ways that I guess he was a bit more controlling. Um, and so I, I got to the point where I was just questioning everything I did. It just seemed like everything was wrong. So if I, if I was nervous about a test, you know, he would be like, well, you, you should have studied more and then you wouldn't be nervous, you know, but like, but that's not true. You, you can study a lot and still be nervous about it. And also studying is something like there's never an end to, you can always study more for it, you know, anything. Um, so it'd be, it'd be stuff like that. Um, and yeah, if I didn't do well on the test that, you know, you should have studied more. If I did do well, like if you'd studied more then you wouldn't have worried. So you, you've highlighted your ultimate discovery of, of an asexual identity as a, as a main theme here. But, but, you know, and I learned about asexuality through my, my child, my number three child, Claire. So I didn't know anything about it until like this year or last year. So I imagine you wouldn't have known much about that either at the time. And so, no. but as you now, and we'll talk about asexuality maybe in part three more, but as you now look back on that one year long dating experience, are there reflections you have about uh, self understanding or things you observe or noticed or notice now about that experience that later help inform this identity. Yeah. Uh, there's some like, <clears throat> you know, in retrospect <laughs> that I realized. Um, but I, I would say it was mostly invisible just because it's what Love the chastity. church wants. Yeah, yeah. Like I am exactly, I yeah. think I'm normal and, and that everyone feels the same way I do. So actually, so if I knew. It's easy to keep the law of yeah, chastity. Like I really did not understand what the big deal was. Um, and so like, if I did know like someone masturbated or, or someone had sex, you know, um, especially if it was like a weird place to me, like, like in the back of a car or something, I, I would just be like, what? you like, you have to go out of your way to do that. You know, that's so gross. <laughs> like I don't get why it's hard. So that's where I'm still at. And of course the older I get as a single person, the more and more I do realize like it is unusual not to have some kind of a something experience somewhere along the way. Yeah. But at this point, I did not know that. I thought I, I, I'm You're normal. You're just really good at living the law of chastity. But I didn't even think I was, I just thought I was normal at <laughs> yeah. this point. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, some people don't do it, but I just, I just yeah. didn't think it was hard. But mm. I, I do remember, um, there was one point, um, uh, like we were watching a movie together or something and I didn't realize it, but like, cause we were kind of like snuggled. Right. Um, so my hand ended up like a bit close to his groin area. I didn't notice it, but he was just like, what are you doing? You know, he's kind of in this kind of flirty way. And so I'm like, what? And he was like, your hand. And so like, when I saw it, I yanked it back and I said, ill. And then his face, like he looked really oh. hurt. Yeah. And I was just like, Oh shoot. You know? And I just remember kind of like berating myself, like, all right, you know, it's time to grow up, Maven. Like you're an adult now. You're 18, right? 19. So, um, yeah. So it's just like it's time to get past like this idea. Like you know, 
ill penises, you know? And so um, I remember just feeling really immature um, that I did that. And I felt bad that I hurt his feelings. And, you know, like the other end of that is, I mean, like, like what if he accidentally touched my boob and was like, gross, like that would make me feel bad. Like it's, I mean, it's just part of my body. Like, I'm sorry, you think it's gross, you know? So that was like one thing that I remember doing, but that was just like my gut reaction to that was just okay. to be like, Ugh. so anyway, that's, that's one thing. Um, and I know this, is, I, I feel a little bit embarrassed to say, but like we did kiss and I like kind of make out, I guess, but never with tongue. I never, like, it was always just like closed lips. Yeah. I, and I'm really, I'm really grateful to him. He really respected that. And I kind of think maybe because he was a convert, because I, I just know so many friends that, um, like LDS guys would, were more comfortable pushing, but I think because he was a convert and, and I think he was just more motivated to really be pure. And, uh, and so I think that's why he was really willing to follow my lead on that and, and not ever like pressure me more like beyond what I was comfortable with. That would have been normal to everybody else, I think. Um, and not only that, but I mean, cause he, I, he wasn't a virgin. And so, and that was something that he had a lot of shame over, which I, I think is really sad now because, um, I mean, of course I'm curious. Uh, I'm, I'm just, just as curious as the next person is about sex and things like that. And so, I mean, I didn't ask for explicit details, but I, like, I did ask him about it. And it, like from the way he described it, it was almost, I think, um, I think it was Natasha Helper Parker's interview, like, like just a really beautiful experience that was planned. You know, they did it because they, they loved each other. They, they wanted to be close together. You know, it was somebody that like, he was in a relationship with and had been for several months. So it was actually, it sounded like actually a really beautiful kind of first time. And so, um, I feel bad for him that, uh, uh, he's been taught to have shame around that now and see it as like an ugly, sinful thing. You know what I mean? Um, but it was also good for me too, because I, again, with the Orthodox, uh, bringing up, I, I really did want like the, the RM, uh, um, priesthood holder. And I ideally wanted somebody who was as pure as I was. So mm -hmm. starting off the bat already with someone, which of course it was fine because he was a convert, so he couldn't have known, but it just got me over it permanently. You know, I just, I just realized it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter um, uh, what someone's experience is. And if I'm honest, I think part of me kind of thought like if we got married, I, I almost kind of liked that he knew what he was doing. That there would be like a little bit less, it seemed a little bit less scary. I think the thought of it, mm. knowing that, that he like was experienced, I guess. Does that make sense? But he dear Jane you. Yep. That did not work <laughs> out. Yeah. So, um, what's funny though. So before he leaves actually, so my best friend was there. Um, and she, she met a guy right at the beginning of the second semester of college and they were engaged by the end of the month. So, um, uh, with the fastest, you know, that was before, um, well, that, yeah, that was like the fastest engagement I knew. And so I was really upset about it. I, I really felt like she was making a mistake. I, it was like the like first person for her as well. And so I really felt like it was, she was just rushing into it, I made, making my mom's mistake, I think. So I tried to get her just to slower roll. I think it's just like, you know, let's just, you know, if this is it, you can take a little bit more time. Like there's no rush for this. Right. So I remember going over to her apartment just to have a talk and um, she had a roommate there and uh, her roommate had just found out that she had gotten engaged. She did that the real, like the high pitched squeal, you know, and um, let me see the ring and all this kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I, I was getting like more and more upset, but this roommate, I remember, I remember just being like, I'm so jealous of you. You get to have sex. Like she's like, super excited for my, uh, my friend for it. And I just remember thinking this is, that's the stupidest thing. I've ever heard somebody say, and that's a stupid reason to get buried. Um, which of course I learned later, that's the, uh, the primary reason for a lot of people <laughs> to get married in the church, you know, yeah. is, is precisely for that reason. But I just remember thinking, uh, yeah, I just, I don't know. I just feel like almost overwhelmed with how dumb I thought the statement was at the time. So, um, yeah, it didn't go well. And I, like, I'm basically lost the friendship over it initially for a little bit. Um, so it wasn't until after, um, um, I did a study abroad, uh, that summer in between those first two years of college and came back and then we kind of reconnected there. So, so I, I studied abroad in Japan. That's exciting because you love yeah. the language and you got the Sterling Scholar and like, it's a chance to really practice your right. Japanese. I actually, I actually got to go over there. And so I was, um, I was in a school, it was just a really tiny, like women's college. There were only 400 students. And I think there were about like 20 international students. And I was the only Westerner 
all of the other international students there learning Japanese were um, like from other Asian countries or at, there was a couple Islanders as well, but I was like, I was the only white person there. And um, yeah, it was, it was definitely interesting because there were things that I didn't do. Tea is very big in Japan. So there was a tea ceremony I was in that was really awkward because it was very formal and very, yeah. it, now I feel bad about it because it was probably perceived very rude, but I would not drink, drink the tea. Yeah. I've done that. I did that as a Mormon. I, I was at like this really formal big deal with MIT. I'm with MIT. There's mm. like state officials in China and they were all supposed to drink a little glass of wine or whatever. And I'm like, but I wouldn't drink it. You know what I mean? And really insulting to them. Yeah. I, and you, you look back and you're like, who, who, but, what's but the big deal? You have to stand for yeah. your principles, yeah. right? Like no yeah. matter the pressure. Yeah. So that's where I was at with that. Yeah. Anyway, so one of the activities that the school had planned was a visit to an onsen, which is a public bathing house. And so they're, I mean, they're split between genders. So it's, um, you know, males on one side and, and females on another, but it, but it is just like open and public. And it was something that at first I was absolutely definitely not going to do that um, because I just, just e furiously embarrassed at even the thought of being naked in front of other people. Um, but my Indonesian friend said, you know, that they would go with me. And so I thought, okay, because they also care about modesty too, like I do. Um, I don't know. I just, it just felt more okay for me, like to know that they were okay with it. And so, yeah, I was like, yeah, it should be fine. It's just women, you know, like it, it's, so I don't think it's immodest, you know, I didn't actually have anyone there to check in with, which is good because I, I did, I gave too much uh, like decision-making already um, uh, a lot to the church anyway, but yeah, so I decided to go with their encouragement. But what they meant was that they would go with me to support me to the onsen, uh, but they weren't actually going to go inside. So we got there and then I realized like they they were leaving. Um, but I didn't want, I, I didn't want to look like a coward by being like, well, no, yeah, if you guys are leaving, I'm going to leave too. So, so I stayed, um, they give you like a little tiny, like a tea towel. Basically I got undressed. Um, and I, I think I was like, cause there wasn't anyone else in, in the locker room at the time. So what I, I go through the doors, um, I really nervous, but I just want to like be there, I guess be seen. So people know that I didn't chicken out and then just like get the heck out of there as soon as I can. So I walk in, um, and the, like one of my classmates sees me, so she waves at me and I just like, I just remember thinking it, she was, um, she was a model. She was, she was Chinese. And so of course she looked like perfect. And I immediately just felt like a toad. I felt so ugly and just like, like my stomach was poochy. You know, I just, I, d I just hated everything about it. But, um, luckily I had more like classmates, um, you know, at the side. So there was a classmate to like, just right inside the door that was just like, Hey, you know, come over and sit by me. So the way it works in Japan, and this is true for like, even in, in private homes, you bathe outside of the bath, you, you, you wash all of the stuff off um, and you like sitting on a stool. So there is just this line of stools like where everybody was. So you wash first and then you soak in the tub. They, do, they, they like to do herbs and things like that. So it, it really is kind of like a sauna experience and they even do that in their private homes. So this is the same, only it's public. So I sit on this little stool, I'm hunched over and I'm just kind of dying inside. I just do like a really quick wash. I'm wanting this to be over, um, but we're done. My friend's done. So then we like, we head over to the sauna section. And once I got in there, I just, I'm, it's just big and wide and open. And I just saw everybody there at all kinds of uh, shapes and sizes. There were old women, there were young women, like they were teen girls just chatting. Like it's a normal day at the mall. And I just remember like, it just looked so normal. I, I didn't see that anyone looked embarrassed or, or feeling like I felt like shy or anything like that. And so I think just seeing how normal it seemed to everybody, just something just kind of switched in my brain and I saw it as normal too. And it also worked for me. I didn't feel self-conscious about my body anymore because I just saw everyone as people like just yeah, just who they are instead of just their faces representing who they are, just the whole body. And so it wasn't, um, instead of comparing it as like, you know, like, like models you see in magazines, these are, this is what beautiful women look like, or even in church magazines, you know, these, these, the blonde hair, blue eyed, kind of like happy Valley, um, ideal, like this is what, you know, good women look like. And then everyone else is a comparison that all went out the window. It wasn't a comparison at all. It was just, it was just people and who they were. And I, I, 
I have never been there since then, but I would really like to uh, someday get to the point where I, I feel as comfortable in my body as I did then. It was just, it was really, really normal. There was this like cute old Japanese lady that saw that we were all foreigners. So she came over and we all sat down together in the sauna and she was just asking us about school and like what interested us about Japan, why we were there. It was just totally normal, completely naked conversation, but like it was very comfortable. And so, yeah, anyway, that was a, an interesting experience for me, like outside of, I think the kind of purity culture stuff, like actually being comfortable with your body. That seems extraordinarily healthy. And the only thing I can think of that kind of compares is when I've been to Europe and I'm seeing all these paintings or even magazine articles with, with nudes. And I just remember having this awakening. It's like, why do we make such a big deal about the body? I think it's harder because we make it so taboo and forbidden. If we just, it's just a body. If we could have that attitude, there'd probably be a lot less sexual unhealth. I so, agree. I mean, I just think for all these reasons, it just seems so healthy that, that people would normalize nakedness. It just occurred to me, maybe that was the switch in my brain because uh, like with, with modesty and purity culture, your body is a thing attached to you maybe, but it's still a thing um, that it needs to be covered up or, is, you know, is affecting other people. And so um, with that, like there's kind of this idea that there's something shameful about you or, um, I mean, they say sacred and that it's not shameful and it's, it's just for the right person at the right time kind of a thing. Um, but that's still the feeling. So I, I kind of feel like maybe that was the switch. It was not that, um, yeah, that, that bodies are, are objects or that they're, they are shameful or should be hidden, but that they are people, that they are who we are. Like, and I think maybe that was, I guess, the feeling too that I, I, I've been working on getting back is like is that ownership of my body. It's like, it, this is, this is me you know, versus the, the red dress where I'm, you know, apparently doing something wrong, like yeah. to somebody else by having a body, by having some curves. You know? Obsessing about modesty objectifies people. Yeah. And we objectify ourselves yeah. when we do that. Yeah. Yeah. So after that, I, I go back to uh, snow college and I had a, a much rougher year that because I mean for one being alone but also like because my boyfriend had been so social um people knew me like as his girlfriend so it was really awkward sometimes for they like, meet people and they'd be like I know you but they didn't know my name um so I would say his name and they were like oh yeah and like how's that guy like how's his mission going you know and I, it was just super awkward because I, I was like I don't know we didn't we're not together anymore yeah so like it was definitely really awkward but um and then also too talking about the the ADHD from before while I did well in school and in high school I especially I got you know better grades than I had um in younger years but for especially for women with undiagnosed ADHD college can be really really difficult because of the unstructured nature of it and so that's where a lot of people um just really fail out and I was definitely struggling which now I understand is like is because of that but at the time when you don't know I, your brain just doesn't work the same way everybody else does but you don't know why it's hard to do things so even if I really wanted to do well in school I really wanted to study I just wasn't able to do what I wanted to do sometimes um and then else like I was being depressed about like this relationship I had that I I had lost so it was definitely kind of a struggle year um, but one thing I do remember taking during that time, I took a, like a human development class. So I had taken like the Institute, the church's version of like courtship and marriage class, but there was a, a school, like an actual school version. It was taught by a Bishop. And I think that was really good for me at, at the time, because, um, I think because I, because he was a Bishop, I could trust the education I was getting. But I remember on the, the very first day of class, when we were going over the syllabus, um, there was going to be a sexuality component and he was adamant. He was like, if anybody skips class these two weeks, I'm going to fail you. I don't care what your grade is for everything that you can get a hundred percent and, and think you can slide with the SE or something if you, but no, I, I'm going to fail you if you skip this. And he went on this 
big rant at, about Mormons, you know, and he was just like, it's, you're not going to lose any purity by actually learning about sex and how it works. Um, if any of you, if you're adults, but if some of you have controlling parents, I understand, like, if they have a problem with it, tell me and I will talk to them. I'll explain it in a way that they understand. And if any of you on campus, if you have a bishop, that he's, I know all the bishops, so I'm pretty sure, like, I know all of them are fine with this, but if you have a new one or something that doesn't know and thinks you shouldn't take this, then talk to me. I'll talk to him. I've been a bishop. It was this whole rant, really, really big. And that was the first time um, that I was like, yeah, I guess it is okay to like learn about sex, you know, but I think, but I hadn't thought it was okay before, I think because of the first strength of the youth pamphlet. Cause one of the things that talks like, like you're not supposed to think about it too. If you think about it too much or ruminate about it, like then you'll want to do it. So that was, I think also partly why I think even learning about sex seemed like kind of pushing the boundaries for me at the time. So, um, I remember after that first day, I did meet up with my friend, the one that had gotten married and, and we had reconciled at this point, um, over the summer. And so I remember, cause I had a question, but I didn't dare ask it in class and not that first day. I assumed it would come up later, but that part portion of the course was going to be like several months away, I think. So anyway, I remember going to my friend, um, just kind of talking about things cause she's experienced now, right. She's married. And so I remember asking like, um, you know, if it's like, you know, when I get married and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the honeymoon night. If it's like, if I, if I don't want to, or like, if I'm scared or like, like, or even if we start, like if it, if it's hurting and like, and I don't like want him to go anymore, um, like, can they stop? I didn't know. I really didn't know. I, and you know, I, I did kind of think I like the, I get kind of the slippery slope thing. Like once a guy gets going, like there's just kind of like no finishing or it's just like, I don't know, animal instincts take over or something. I wasn't sure. Um, I was really horrified by the idea of course, but, um, yeah, so I'm asking her and, and, uh, she's saying like, well, you know, like once guys get going, like they, you know, and she's kind of implying that that is the case. And so I remember saying, but like, I mean, but like, what if it really, really hurts? Like I, like I am in a lot of pain and I, and I want this, you know, I want him to stop. And I just, she kind of gave me this weird look and she was just like, I know, she's like, you might get raped on your wedding night. And I was really, I was really shocked and horrified by that idea. Um, and I knew it happened, but like, I didn't, again, like I didn't know how much I guess fault or like, you know, you could put on the guy. Um, I didn't have my boyfriend anymore, like to ask it. I never had asked them that, but I, I thought, I was like, I don't think he would have. I, Cause he was really respectful of me, but again, like I really wasn't sure, but I remember just thinking like, I can't handle that. Like if that happens, I can't stay married to somebody like that, you know? So I was like, even if it is like, if that is true, that's how men are. And um, there's gotta be like 10% of men who would at least have the self-control to not. And so I was just like, I just really need to find somebody like that I can be really sure like would be able to do that. So, um, I just remember that was a, a memory I had that I, you know, and I, I did learn in that class. Um, and from, you know, that that's absolutely not true there when kids, as far as consent goes, like any time to stop is a time to stop, whether but it's that's not taught or not. in, in Orthodox Mormonism ever. Yeah. Ever. I, yeah. I mean, I don't remember being taught about <laughs> sex, but the, I mean, again, just enough like that. I yeah. just don't know how it works. And that seemed like, a, an idea of how it works. I'm sure there's language, something like women submit to your husbands or, you know, well, yeah. I'm sure. I mean, yeah, there's def there's definitely that. And so, um, I think that's very important for <clears throat> LDS women to know married, married or not married mm -hmm. that they can say no at any time. Yeah. Married or not married. For sure. Yeah. For sure. It's important for them to know that. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and not just that, but like, I do know people like, like who had really a bad experience, I think for that reason, like because guys told them that like, um, or, or made them feel guilty. Like you got me going and you know, now look at the, the, the blue ball excuse, you know, like, and so it's really ironic that the, the churches like kind of purity teachings about this, especially cause we're made to feel like we're responsible for what, guys feel and guys do. I mean, not just like, I mean, from like modesty, but also, yeah, like if we're making out and things like that, like it, we're not supposed to be arousing those feelings in ourselves or in other people. So it actually makes it easier for, for guys to um, guilt 
girls and and I just I'm just thinking of friends and roommates that have had experiences like that where they did break the law of chastity because they kind of felt like it was already their fault of you know the effect that they had on their boyfriends and so they felt obligated you know I guess to to make them feel good to finish it but anyway so that's really sad I, I feel really lucky that I think that didn't end up happening to me but it's a it's an unfortunate reality for a lot of other people so um, anyway, it was a good class. I, I did learn a lot more about, I was still very naive in a lot of things. It, it, it is, it was still by a bishop. So even though it was very like progressive <laughs> for where I was at, it probably still wasn't maybe quite where it could be. Um, but I do want to say just real quick, I, that is where I learned that like movement was involved in sex. So, I mean, cause anything, if I had seen any kind of depiction in Hollywood or something, um, it would have been like, you know, very PG 13. And so a lot of times, like there isn't movement or it's very slow, you know, kind of like sensual looking um, or it like it, scenes would be after the fact. So like they're together, but they're talking or something. You know what I mean? It's not like I saw a whole lot of scenes like that, but the ones I saw, that's what it was like. So it's kind of funny when you bring in soaking and that whole thing that was on TikTok everywhere. Like, honestly, for a long time, that's kind of what my image was of sex. Mm. Like that that's... That's it's how more it stationary, works. More stationary. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You just it, you insert and th- I, that's how it goes, you know? And so it was in this class and it's kind of funny now because the, and how I learned that because we didn't show any sex scenes, obviously, like, you know, I want to say it was like a really old kind of like ultrasound basically of the act, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, that was the, that was when I learned that like, the, and it was really actually kind of horrifying to me because that did not seem like celestial or loving or, you know, I, I've been told, I mean, all this purity stuff, it, it just like the right kind of sex is, is beautiful. It's between husband and wife, you know? And so, um, yeah, the, I, the idea of movement at the very, like when I first learned about it, it just seemed really animalistic to me. And, and it, it, just, it kind of made me feel dirty just to even learn about that. So, um, so that's it for snow college. Um, you were there a year? I was there uh, two years. So I was there the first okay. year where I had my boyfriend. I did the study abroad, came back, and I finished the second year. And then uh, I actually had never considered uh, BYU Hawaii before. I was going to go to Provo. Uh, that was going to be in the plan was always to transfer. Uh, because at the time, I think it is a four-year university now. But at the time, it was just it was a community mm. college, a two-year thing. Um, but BYU had a, Hawaii had a, a little scholarship for TESOL program graduates from Snow College. So that's what uh, even kind of cottoned me on to the idea. So I applied there and I got in. Um, and it was really great. It was definitely, it's, it's a really unique campus. It's not like Provo or Idaho at all. It's, it's way more lax as much as the church really, really tries hard to try to turn it into Provo and Idaho. I feel like every time they, they bring in new ad, like ad administration there, um, it's always, they Tighten always, up. yep. They always import, uh, you know, rich white guys from Utah to come into, you know, and they just don't match the local Wayne. culture at Wayne all. Culture. Like sometimes like they've, they've tried to like ban flip flops, you know, and like, you just can't. <laughs> you just can't do that, you know. Um, you can try, but it's just not. I mean, and for church and things like that, you, you know. Um, Maybe. Right. But like for everywhere else, like it's just like there's just some things that you just yeah. can't fight. It's just a losing thing. Um, but not not only that, cause, because there's, a, again, there's a, um, uh, I mean, a, a money aspect of it. Because uh, so BYU Hawaii is uh, pretty close to, or at least at the time, uh, half international students. So it's a small campus, but because of that, because so many are from, uh, Asian countries and Islanders are are the most, but there's some, some other like Europeans and from other places kind of scattered, but uh, it's one of the most diverse campuses in the country because of that. And so, um, I mean, not religiously, but yeah, but ethnically. So, uh, so it was really great for that reason. But I had, um, I had one experience that really kind of opened my eyes to, so even though I've got some travel in, I, I'm still very ethnocentric in my view. It's, it's still the world revolves around how I think about things, how I was raised. Um, it, you know, it, this is the right way, you know, and everything else is either like a neutral deviation, like maybe a this kind of traditional clothing doesn't make a difference, but, but you know, this thing that doesn't match with the gospel does make a difference kind of a thing. So I, um, 
I remember listening to, it was just a short presentation um, from a guy who's from a, a country called Tuvalu. It's an island country and it's very, very low lying. It's very close to the sea level. And it is like, it's been disappearing because of climate change. And so of course, I know climate change isn't real because that's part of the, you know, Democrat atheist science agenda to overthrow, you know, proper businesses, I guess, and, and take over the country. So yeah, like I, I don't think climate change is real. Um, until I, I, until I hear this guy, this is the first time I've ever heard about this country of Tuvalu and this guy is from there. And so I remembered, I mean, I, I'm glad that I just least gave him space like, to listen, but there was somebody else there, a guy who I assume was raised very similar to me, who also like me did not know this country existed an hour ago, like when this whole thing started, but did start to argue with this kid about climate change, that it's not real. And that, um, I think he did say like it, it, Democrats, you know, and so, and this kid had definitely heard it before because it, like, he, it was obvious in how he handled it. Um, and so he would just kind of basically restate what this guy was saying, but in a way that just kind of made it obvious, the kind of just the, the ignorance and the racism that was involved in that. And so, cause I remember him asking questions like, um, so you think a uh, United States Democrats just hopped in a boat and came to our Island and told us like, we're losing our Island because of climate change. And we just said, okay, like you're white. So we believe you. And like, we're just Brown Islanders. Like we're just fishing. So, okay. And so like, I remember listening to that. I just going like, just like the cringe on the inside, like, oh my gosh. And, um, and this guy did not give up for a while. Like uh, he still kind of would go for a few things, uh, you know, um, but it was just, it was just really obvious just how awful it was. I just remember having like this pit in my stomach and this just like secondhand em embarrassment because like it was embarrassing, but also like, again, like an hour ago before I, I, if I would have been having this conversation with this guy, it would have been agreeing with everything he said, you know? And so, yeah, so there's, I mean, that the two things. So um, first of all, it just kind of saw for the first time what it looks like from the outside, you know? Um, and then I guess just, yeah, I, I didn't realize, I, I just didn't realize like just how bad some of my ideas were. So it was the same uh, sort of like, you think they choose this LGBT moment. Just about, just, yeah. But now it's about political stuff. Right. And, and climate change and poverty. It just made me realize for the first time, just how... <laughs> how easily it comes to some people to literally just hear about a country that exists for the first time and presume that you know something, that you know more than somebody who from there, yeah. who's lived there their whole life, you know? And I just, I just remember, just, yeah, I guess just realizing everything that I've ever learned and everything that I believe comes like has always been really spoken authoritatively and I just always believed it. So like the Rush Limbaugh, you know, Glenn Beck, anyone on Fox, like, and I just realized it was about everything, anything political, anything economical, anything cultural. Like it was always just stated, like, these are the facts. And I never heard an actual, I never heard the other side ever represented fairly in any kind of way at all. Like I said, like Democrats were, you were either in the elite where you're knowingly trying to take the country down and turn it communist or whatever, or you're one of the ones that have been duped by their fake messaging about inclusivity and things like that. Right. And so I just took for like, I just thought they know everything. Yeah. This is why Mark Twain says that travel is fatal to prejudice. You just, you learn things you couldn't, learn otherwise, right? Right. Can I just say, I have to give this public service announcement. We have listeners to Mormon Stories podcasts that are both liberal, politically liberal or politically conservative that are both Democrat and Republican. Mormon Stories does not have a preference for either side. I'm John, I'm a registered Republican in Utah because I think my vote counts the most that way. But I think there are good reasons to be Republican and Democrat, conservative or liberal we do not, uh, just because Maven's talking about her awakening into seeing other political sides. I, I just get, I get every time I, we, politics right. comes up on Mormon stories, <laughs> I get these hate messages. Mormon stories yeah. is woke and Mormon stories is hates conservatives. And that is not what's going on here. This is Maven's story. Please don't send me texts and, and comments <laughs> and emails that, that we are, don't that we hate Republicans hate conservatism. That's not what's going on here.
Sorry. No, I, I appreciate that. that. And that's good to say too, <laughs> because like you said, there's good reasons to be either, but there's also bad reasons to be either. Totally. And so I feel like totally. I, the, the, what I was raised in was toxic in some ways. <clears throat> and so, yeah, you absolutely can be a Republican and not think <laughs> Democrats are literally evil, yeah. you know, but, but this is the messaging that I was raised with. Yeah. And so, and it is something I'm working on now because I do tend to assume my upbringing uh, in talking about these kinds of things in these spaces. So it, it's a good reminder sometimes to t like just because somebody like is Republican or conservative, it doesn't mean they think about things the way I was taught to think about things. Yeah. So I, I do appreciate you bringing that yeah. up. Um, but for me, it really, I just really did take for granted that, um, like just these white men, just, they just knew everything about everything. So if they, if they know, if they said anything about poly, I just assumed that they, they knew. I would venture to say that for your dad, Glenn Beck or Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity might have been as important as G Gordon B. Hinckley or Thomas S. Monson, or maybe even more so. I'm just guessing. Possibly, yeah. I'm just guessing. I I would agree. Yeah. yeah. That, that's a, there's a certain type of Mormon where that's or human where that's just the case. Yeah. 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 Um. So so that's how I I, I was raised. In, so that so this this incident with this person, you know, arguing, um, with this guy from Tuvalu that. It made me realize like um, just because something is said to you authoritatively by someone who yeah. appears to know, it yeah. uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they know and it's worth listening to yeah. the other Good side. Lesson. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, that was, I, that was just like, I think a big moment for me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I was in the TESOL program and I worked, uh, so BYU Hawaii has a, like a pretty enmeshed relationship with the Polynesian culture center. Um, and, I still, like, there's still a lot I don't know about. So I would love to know, like, if people have more insider information about this. Um, but the Polynesian Culture Center is a huge tourist attraction. It is run by the church. I don't know if it's technically a nonprofit or not, or if it is, like, one of the for-profit ventures. But it relies a lot on labor from the students at, at BYU. It's literally right next door. And so, um, uh, I mean, most of the jobs were for... Um, for, were for a lot of the Islanders, there was a specific program and I, f I kept getting changed up. So I don't know what the exact acronym is now because it changed. But at, when I knew it, it was the iWork program. And so, and at the time I thought it was just really um, um, benevolent, really amazing that they would, you know, the students can come from these poorer countries where they like would never be able to afford an American education. And, and they just, they work for, you know, 15 hour or 14 hours a week, or I think it was 19, like just under 20. Um, and, it, you know, teaching about their culture to white people and the, and they get education for it and just, scholarships or whatever. Right. Yeah. yeah. So like their, their education is paid for it. They also got housing, you know? So I was like, this is, this is really great because that's how I felt. When yeah, I went. yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I get like the seedier side of it kind of comes out later. Um, but yeah, as, as a white person, there's a few less jobs that you're able to do. Most of the like facing jobs they want from Islanders, even if it's not your specific country, but, it, but if you're Brown, you fit in and you can be there. Mm. Um, if you're white, uh, there, I waitressing was what I could do. So there's a, uh, there were, um, like a three lunchtime areas where you could do a, a luau. Uh, the biggest one uh, was Hale Aloha. I worked in the second one. It's called Hale Ohana. And that uh, when you work there, you get a free meal at the, you know, from the buffet, but like we would have to make it and then we would clean everything up and then you could eat your meal at the end. And it's the same thing every day. So most people got tired of it after a while. But again, I, I did not have a lot of money and a lot of things in Hawaii are expensive. The tuition, maybe not so much, but the food and groceries and things like that. So I, for a year, I ate some kind of combination of that buffet, like five days a week. And I remember one time my roommates actually say, like having a pizza party and, uh, I, before I was going to work, they're like, well, we'll save you some. And I just remember like being so worried that they would forget. Cause that's, it's easy to say like, yeah, we'll save you some pizza. And then, and then oops, like everyone ate it all. So I remember like having a specific conversation with my roommate. I was like, okay, once I leave, I can't go back and get buffet food, you know? So I was just like, so please, just please make sure you really do save me some because if you don't, I'm not eating tonight. And so, and they pulled through like they totally had some. And so I was just really grateful, but I, I remember just really being genuinely worried about it. I was like, you know, um, free food for college students. Like there's usually not leftovers, you know? So um, that was a thing. And I'd actually ended up, I mean, I never had like before or since, but I had kidney stones while I was there. Um, and I, um, I kind of wonder if maybe that was it 
be like because of eating like this the same meal. I don't know. I honestly don't know why that happened or what it but in my mind, I think that's a plausible explanation, but but that's what I needed to do. So anyway. So you weren't having a diverse nutritionary experience? Not really, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I did like it. I was there again, I was still struggling because <laughs> I mean, it was every time, it's just like the same story over a new semester. I would always like recommit, like this is going to be a better semester. I'm not going to struggle so much at the end of it. Uh, but that was still happening anyway. Um, I did get, um, uh, I guess, kind of an interesting calling. And I still don't know. I, I keep getting like different information about it. But I was called as a Sunday school secretary in my college ward. And I remember like the bishop giving it to me and saying like, I, I mean, I checked them and it's technically not a priesthood calling, uh, you don't have to have the priesthood for it. So I was like, okay. Um, so I was fine with it. I didn't think it was that big of a deal, but I remember the first time I met with the rest of the Sunday school presidency, um, they were really surprised and, and they were like, yeah, I, I, I thought it was a priesthood. Call. I was pretty sure it was a priesthood calling, but I mean, they were cool about it. They never made me feel bad or anything. And I think we actually had a really great presidency. Um, we, uh, like, I, I feel like we fulfilled our calling really well. And the Sunday school president and ended up marrying my roommate, which I may or may not have had, I think, something to do with. So anyway, it was good. But um, I've heard since, like, I mixed messages, I guess, since then, if that, like, if that bishop had gone rogue and it should have been a priesthood calling or not. Um, um, it's at this time, this was another thing that kind of made me struggle. Um, uh, well, there's kind of two things happening. One was the TESOL program. I was starting to realize I wasn't really enjoying it uh, or the classes. I really liked all the work I had done with international students, but, um, but the, so I didn't really like teaching. I was more interested in learning about other cultures and other things than teaching my language and my culture. And I think I was kind of feeling a little bit of uh, guilt over it, kind of sometimes. <laughs> I was like, I, I mean, I'm, even in Hawaii, like that is a colonized country, you know? And so it, it just, I kind of felt like I'm, I'm kind of contributing to colonization a little bit. That wasn't the main factor, but it was just like something that kind of niggled at me during that time. But I just really didn't enjoy uh, the, uh, I just didn't enjoy the classes anymore, but I wasn't sure if it was, yeah, just the classes or, you know, like if it was something bigger or not. And I wasn't sure what else I would do anyway. And it was also during this time that my parents divorced again. So um, I, it, it wasn't exactly a surprise. I did think they were trying to wait till my youngest brother was older. He was only 11 at the time. I was 21 and fin finally missionary age. So that was another thing like I was thinking about, but just because I, I was struggling so much personally, um, because of, because of my parents' divorce and then just struggling in school, I wasn't really sure anymore that I could handle a mission. And I thought like, cause I, I knew a lot of sisters come back like for mental health reasons. And so I really, I felt that if I went on a mission and um, if I didn't do well and I came home early, even though it's optional for us, we don't have to go, I really felt like I would just feel like a failure the whole rest of my life. Like I did not think I would be able to get over it if I, if I had to come home early. Um, so that was a concern to me. Um, and then I wasn't sure, I mean, I had always wanted to go and now I'm old enough to go, but I wasn't feeling like a really strong feeling about it. Um, and so, yeah, it's just that just a lot of things were in turmoil at the time. And uh, like with my parents' divorce too, I think one thing that was really interesting to me when I first heard about it, when I heard it, that it was happening, um, was the, the feeling that I felt was, uh, I guess, um, I don't think juvenile is the right word. I feel like four-year-old Maven was back in my brain and four-year-old Maven's feelings, I, I didn't think I was going to get emotional about this, um, came back. And um, it was just really interesting because like it was so real. So it was really like memories coming back um, because I didn't understand. Four-year-old Maven couldn't understand what was happening and like had a lot of fears about like, like abandonment, you know, um, and like, and these things are known, you know, I think uh, about this and, um, you know, like my dad's gone and I know he comes back sometimes, but I just, I don't get why he's gone, you know, and like, is mom going to leave, you know, this kind of stuff. And it's, it just was really weird to me because like, I'm 21. I left them. I'm hundreds of miles away. Um, but yeah, it, it was just a really interesting thing. It was just, I, uh, I think just that part of my brain just unlocked and came out or something. Um, I just recognized like, this is, this is 
three or four year old Maven that's like, you know, and then, and that was it. It just it didn't last very long. But, um, but I do want to say like, I, I'm, I know there's a lot of people in this space uh, that are facing this. And so um, I don't, I, I guess I don't want people to think like, uh, it, because a divorce will hurt my children. Like I shouldn't do it um, because sometimes that really is the healthy thing to do. And it's never, it's never going to be fun. It's, it, it's never um, an easy thing, obviously. But honestly, I, I sometimes wonder if things would have been better if my parents you know, maybe had done it sooner um, rather than later. I don't know. It's it's something you can never know, but I, I guess I just wanted to put that out there. I understand that there are parents in this spot and it's very difficult, but um, but you have to do what's what's right for you. Um, anyway, so um, at this time, I like, was really definitely not interested in dating, um, but I, I still ended up on dates kind of like um, on accident. Um, so uh, I don't know. I just... It's kind of funny to me now how it happened, but like, like one of them was a guy who I di I didn't realize at the time that he I just naivety, but I, I thought we were friends, <laughs> you know. You really can't just be friends with guys as an adult in the church. Um, but I also ended up um, on a date with my elders quorum president, who's a really good guy, and I think still is really a, a good guy. But um, he admitted something to me on the date which I don't, I still don't know why he told me, but he was talking about, this is like the second semester that I was there. Um, but he told me the first semester uh, in his calling as elders quorum president, like part of it is, you know, uh, divvying up, you know, what used to be called home teaching. And so he said, like, he told me the way, because I mean, I always thought like they pray about it, right? That, that was always what I learned. And of course there's like a cute little, like, meet cute stories about people who meet like from home teaching, you know, a guy and that's like the start of it. So I never, that was never my expectation, but I did always kind of wonder like, or maybe even hope even like whoever was assigned to like me, that could be the guy, you know, um, that could be the start of like the romantic story. Anyway, I learned like definitely not the case here because what he had done is, I mean, at everybody's pictures are on everything cause it's a student ward. So he went through the list of girls and he picked like the, like, it was a lot, like 30 of the girls that he thought were the hottest or the cutest. And that's who he assigned to himself to home teach. And apparently it was so like blatantly obvious and egregious that other elders in the quorum, like had a talk with him about it, that he was deliberately like, you know, sequestering like these hot girls for himself. And so I was really kind of shocked at this admission. I mean, cause for one, like I guess prayer was not involved. I always thought like the, the guys took their priesthood seriously since it's something like that they get and I don't get, you know, but not only that, but like I was not on his list. Like he was not my home teacher. <laughs> so I was like, I, if that was the case, like if we switched, I would not be telling somebody that, you know, um, my, uh, one of my roommates was though. So that was kind of like funny to me. I was just like, okay, that was a really awkward date. But anyway, um, yeah, nothing came out of like anything I did there. And I finally decided to go ahead and serve a mission. I felt like I had prayed about it and I kind of felt like what God did was give the decision to me that it was, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess a neutral to him. I would be blessed if I went, but it, I wasn't one of the women that he gives a revelation to that you must go. So, um, oh yeah, I, I forgot this part. As I had started to talk about going on a mission, um, this was the first time I really started to get a lot of negativity about sister missionaries, if it had been around before. I mean, there was a, a little bit of a stigma still about going that, you know, if you're, if you make it to 21 and you're not married, that, you know, maybe there's something wrong with you or like less desirable about you. There was still a lot of my peers who would feel embarrassed or, or, or ashamed to be 21 and, and, and even be thinking about going on a mission and not be married at that point. Um, but I mean, I didn't feel that way because I did want to go on a mission, but this was the first time I, I started hearing a lot of the guys saying like, I, I would never marry a returned sister missionary. That was new to me. And every time I asked, they always had like really, they, they would just, they would never give me a straight answer about it. And so I'm, I was like, I, like fourth or fifth time I hear a guy say like, I, I like, I did not like the sisters on my mission. I will never marry a returned sister missionary. I, I just was like, why? Just, just tell me why. And he did try to do like the waffling thing. Like you just, you just don't get it. It's just, just, I, you know, it's just, it's just a thing. And, um, I was like, just, just give me an example. Just, just tell me, tell me something. And so he finally said, well, I was a district leader and like the sisters would call me about 
really stupid arguments, um, you know, and I, it was just annoying. And I was like, really? Is that it? Like, what were they arguing about? And he'd be like, I know, stupid. Like, one used the other's hairbrush or something like that. And I remember being so annoyed because, like, as much as we, like, love and revere and worship missionaries in the church, we all know, we all hear some really bad stories, you know? And so, like, at this point, I've heard of missionaries stabbing each other, you know, or just, like, full-on knockout, blowout fights, you know? And so I just, like, how is it... How is it possible that like a stupid argument about a brush is enough to say like any woman who has served a mission is just an instant like off the list of possibilities for a companion, especially when we know like the stupid stuff that elders can do, you know? Anyway, um, I had started to suspect at that point that it probably had more to do with, um, I, I had already a sense that returned missionaries were really good talkers, and that not just being a return missionary alone was not quite the guaranteed good guy pass that I, the idea that I had as a teenager. By this point, I know like you still got to vet <laughs> somebody. Um, anyway, that was my suspicion um, at the time was that you can't, uh, yeah, you can't out talk a sister who's also like been through the same thing and knows the talk as well. Like you will have to walk the walk in addition and, and she'll hold you accountable. And so, uh, but if you get this, that uh, sweet young thing, 18 or 19, that's still in that like hero worship phase and just like really looking up to you and your priesthood, it's just a lot easier to um, uh, feel the hero and maybe kind of uh, manipulate her and be in control and, and, you know, make her feel that you're a lot more spiritual than you are. Anyway, I was already getting that sense. So you serve a mission. I serve a mission. I get my mission call. I am certain that it's going to be foreign because of my experiences. And also like, because I, at this point I'd actually had done an internship in Japan teaching English, um, which was also really awful. And um, that's, I knew for sure I couldn't go back to that major, but yeah, but I've been there twice now. So I'm expecting the call to be Japan. And if it's not Japan, I'm expecting it to be somewhere else. And I'm going to like really, really learn a foreign language. So when I get the mission call, uh, it was to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I was upset. And that's an understatement. I was, I was extremely, I really considered sending it back. I've heard that you could do that. But the, at the end, I was like, no, I don't dare do that. And I, I, you know, I trust that this is revelation. This is how they're like, so there must be a reason why it's Philadelphia um, and so it just took me a while to get used to it. I was, I was really embarrassed, you know, it's kind of like that, again, I guess that stigma of like being serving in the States versus foreign, like it's, it's cooler to serve foreign, but I really, really thought I was going. And part of me actually thought, like I said before, like I, I was always having a plan B, you know, ne never say I will do this, or this is what I want to do because you're, you're inviting heavenly father to Abrahamic test you on that and see, um, um, if you'll really give it up or not, or I guess like Abrahamic test is not the right word as, as we learned with Sandra. <laughs> um, anyway, and this was one, this was something that kind of confirmed that to me because I really did think it was foreign. I just, I took that for granted. So I was like that, you know, this is proof of that idea, this kind of superstition. Um, that's why that I really honestly felt that could be partly why the Lord was testing me and my faith and, um, and my pride and vanity maybe by sending me stateside. So I decided to, you know, I accepted it. Um, I remember talking to a couple in my ward who used to live there. And so they were like really excited. And, um, and it's so interesting because like, they were friends of the family. I, I just really thought they were really nice Mormon people, right? But when they were talking to me, they were like, we loved it there. And they were like, it was, it was a really, really great place. Like, and then their face just seemed to change. And they were like, until all the black people moved in. And I just remember being really shocked for one that they would just say that. And then I, their face, I really felt like their countenance changed, you know, when they, when they did that. And I had no idea they felt this way. So I remember thinking like, that is really, that's really racist. But I, I didn't say anything to them. I mean, because you don't, <laughs> when you're, you don't correct people like that. Um, and I, I do, I feel really sad about it now, but um, I just was really shocked and also just not expecting it. But Anyway, um, yeah, I, uh, I get ready to go. Um, so I'm raised like everyone else, like my whole life, 
looking forward to going to the temple, like starting from the primary songs, right? And then especially like with a lot of chastity stuff, especially it gets really drilled up, like be worthy, be worthy, be worthy, temple marriage, temple marriage, temple, you know, and, and the endowment, like you want to be worthy for this. Um, Satan's going to try to get you. And it really did seem like sex was his primary tool to try to get you off of this path, this path. And, um, I get like just constant promises that like you go to the temple, you make even more covenants with God, like baptism, you get more promised blessings, you get all this amazing knowledge. So like that was always my goal. So I, I'm finally here and I'm serving a mission. I'm getting ready to go to the temple. At this point, I do know that a lot of my friends maybe didn't have the best experience. I'm, I'm noticing that there's some hesitation, I guess it maybe is the way to put it. And I'm troubled by it because I, it's supposed to be the most amazing thing ever, right? So of course there's something they did wrong. Maybe they didn't study enough. So I want to make sure I'm studying enough that I, you know, I don't get thrown off by the most sacred experience that I'm supposed to have. Um, and then besides that, I also just decided to just be like super open-minded, no expectations, like whatsoever, just, just, just take it in. And I even, I it's, I knew it was going to be a long ceremony. So I was like, and I'm not even going to try to remember things. Cause I can always keep that. I'm just going to just go with the flow and just feel the spirit and like, and the magic of it all. Right. So at this point, I actually did know like uh, about some of the clothing. Um, I, I knew that about the apron and stuff like this. So, uh, and I, I knew that there would be hand signals uh, because there's a quote, I think from Brigham Young that talks about that, like uh, tokens and signs. So I, I did kind of know that there was some stuff like that and I didn't question it at the time or think it was weird. So yeah, so get ready to go. I'm in there. Um, it all starts and I, I get like, it just trouble right off the bat with that very first covenant. The men stand up, they covenant to hearken unto God. And then the women stand up and then we covenant to hearken to our husbands. And that was a major like record scratch moment in my mind. Just like, what? Um, and I just remember like, like having this sinking feeling, but like because of that, but also because I'm having a sinking feeling, I'm not supposed to have a sinking feeling. This is supposed to be really great. This is, this is sacred. This is how God wants it. Like, this is what God set up, you know, and I'm already having trouble in the beginning. So I just, I just pushed it out. I kind of pushed it aside. The ceremony keeps going, right. Watching the movie. I noticed like once the Adam and Eve leave the garden of Eden, Eve never speaks again. Um, and that was something that really distracted me a lot. I would just watch her, uh, just looking back and forth, like between the men. And I, I remember thinking like, she does pretty good, like being a silent mute character and not making it look really awkward or like looking like she's bored or so, you know, like I, I just was really pulled out of the movie because of that. Um, but yeah, I just, I would focus on her. And then, um, the veil part was really tough. I did know that there was parts where like you would cover yourself, like your face with the veil, but I think, I guess I thought like the men would too. Um, so like when that part came up, that was another one that just kind of like, I just felt like a dagger and I just um, tried to push it out or like, I think I, I can figure out later why that is. But the initial feeling, um, you know, just like having to cover your face because like, I mean, it's like with modesty culture, like with everything coming up to that, like you cover yourself because there's something that's, you know, like inappropriate about you or your body, like that shouldn't be shown, you know? And I just, I couldn't help but think like, what's so sacred that like my face is inappropriate. Sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I even felt bad for feeling that way because, you know, I, I felt like I shouldn't, but, um, yeah, I just, that's what it felt like, you know, it's just like, there's something wrong with you, you know, this, this part's really, really special. So you got to be covered up. And so, um, I couldn't, I couldn't concentrate like on what we were doing because after that, cause I remember like looking over at the men and I can see their faces, you know, um, and you know, they're doing their thing. And, and then I would look over cause the veil is really sheer. So you can still see around you. So I would look back at the women around me and I, you can see a little bit of maybe somebody's hair, you know, um, outside and, and uh, obviously different heights and stuff, but like, it was just all white. I like, I, we were like ghosts, you know, or like, I mean, burkas even, but like, 
even worse because like even like the most like extreme burkas still will have like an isolate you know what i mean but, like we don't even have an isolate like we are it's just really just white blobs and and so i just it was just such an unsettling thing i just kept looking over at the men and seeing the individuals and then looking at the women and just seeing blobs you know mm. and then back at the men and back at the women like they're I just literally kept, faceless yeah wow i, I felt i that. felt erased in a way like mm. like our yeah, just we're not individuals anymore. Like, who knows who's who that is, you know? But you do know for the men because you can still I've see them. I've never thought about that. Wow. I mean, of yeah. course, because I'm a man. You know what I mean? But, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, that was a really tough part for me. Um, but Have you again, thought like, about that, Jen, that, that the veil made you faceless? Um, <clears throat> I, didn't, I didn't use those same words um, as Maven, but I... I feel it. I do remember as soon as I was asked to cover up that I was like, why it? Yeah. I was kind of like, didn't understand all of a sudden. Like, you know, I thought this was supposed to be some amazing place that I would, you know, receive these like, you know, recognition and gifts and stuff from God, you know, and, um, that it would, you know, make this plan more clear for me, um, when I went through and it did the opposite for me. Well, doing this on the heels of the Sandra Tanner DNC 132 episode where women are just talked about in DNC 132, like they're cattle, like they're literally, yeah. they're called Servant. property. Yeah. yeah. Then Can the idea of covering them. the faces to make them faceless mm -hmm. just takes on extra, just unpleasant meaning. Mm -hmm. so I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. I, I did watch that last night, but what I'm is I'm trying to project back. You're it's not like you're some feminist and, and feminist mm. is good for me now, but back at the time, it's not like yeah. you were some feminist no. educated woman. You're uh, literally a super a orthodox word. <laughs> politically conservative, <laughs> right, orthodox committed devout Mormon woman. Yeah. But these things are just natively disturbing you. They hurt. I I that's why I feel like as much as it appears that women will toe the line, um, that doesn't mean that we don't feel these things. And maybe there's some differences between what we feel, but I, I feel really confident saying that there's there's not any woman in the church that has genuinely not noticed uh, the sexism and has not ever once felt lesser because of it. They might deny it. Um, I, I, but I mean, I would have most of the time as a believing, but, but even, even as a believer, I would say in a safe enough space, I think probably with just other women that I really trusted, we would, we could talk about this kind of stuff. Um, but not with, not with men and not mm -hmm. in a, not in like really where there's too many women around because then you start policing each other. But. And really quickly, the, you know, just in the past few years, the church has changed the temple ceremony in a few very key ways, one of which being they eliminated the veil for women. And let me just ask you, does that make it all better for you? Or um, no? no, I mean, yes, <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm really happy that, that uh, other young girls like don't have to have that like <laughs> knife in the heart kind of experience. Um, but at the same time, I already know that there's a lot of people who disbelieve the older generations about things like penalties, which I'll, I'll come to in a second. Um, so I, in a way it, it's, it's actually more erasure because I know um, there's going to be people who see this, who don't believe me um, at some point, maybe not now it's fresh enough and, you know, in enough minds, but at some point there's like, that's not that she's lying. You know, what's the big deal. The temple ceremony right. is not, not sexist. You know, right. <laughs> yeah. And also there's just the idea of 180 whatever years of Mormon women had to go through it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's also like, we were taught it was revelation, direct revelation from God. So like, why are they changing it? Yeah. Right. And, and going back to that first covenant, um, I forgot this part. Like I, what hurt the most about it was not the inequality, but just <clears throat> feeling like, uh, you know, it's like the men got to do this and I didn't, but it was a covenant with heavenly father and he made it this way he doesn't want a covenant with me for this one. So that's, an, it's just like really hard not to feel lesser, you know, even when it's coming from God, because that doesn't just like magically make it better. Um, yeah. It was, it was kind of back like to that priesthood feeling again. Like why, um, why doesn't he want to have me? Like, I love him. I'm here for him. I don't even have a husband, you know, 
I'm here to make covenants with God, but he doesn't want me to. He would rather me go through a, a mortal guy instead. So that, I think that was what hurt about that part. Um, was it? Yeah. When you, when you were at that part, um, another thing that like comes to my mind during that same part is, did you feel like Eve was blamed for everything? That's a good question. Um, I don't know if I like would have gotten that necessarily from the temple. Cause I feel like it's there kind of in, in the teachings anyway. And I think generically in Christianity, kind mm-hmm. of a, a blame the woman. Mm-hmm. Kind like of in thing. the film. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe that wasn't, maybe that didn't, maybe that wasn't, no, that, wasn't that was more, you. that was more for you. Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering if, cause another of my friend said it to me first. So I know it was something for her. Um, so I'm just wondering, I was just wondering if that stood out to you too. Um, I don't think it did because I, I feel like, um, I, I guess it was part of the story I already knew, even though like, it, it like more like to say that like we appreciate you for what she did because she, she got the ball rolling, you know, on, on the whole moral experience that we're supposed to have. Um, I think, um, and that's okay if it yeah, wasn't. I that's okay if it wasn't. Yeah, it seemed normal to me. But I, what really got me more was that that she never talked again. That she never yeah. spoke again once that they yeah. were out. So, um, um, yeah, because we you, we know the story. You know, we're told the story in the Bible, and and we know the story. But for some reason, seeing it played out in front of you um, with actors and on a screen, and the different tones of their voice and the the blaming yeah. in words for some reason um, hit me yeah. that day. Because I think that makes sense. I mean, because it is there in the scriptures, but like mm-hmm. how many scriptures do we, I mean, just with the, the whole Sandra Tanner episode, like how many scriptures do you read over? I just not let really sink in, you know, mm-hmm. um, but it's in there. And I, and I, so I'd, I only noticed it actually because there was a guy uh, on my mission. He was not a, a member of the church, but he was a neighbor. I kind of brought up this story um, as a comparison to King David. He was talking about how David like admits that he did wrong, like with Bathsheba. Um, and so, and, and you know, and all of these, like, um, I think, uh, you know, all this poetic language coming from him, like being repentant about it. He's like, whereas Adam, Adam just like straight up kind of blames God. He's like, this, this woman that you gave to me, she ate it first. So, so then I did, you know? And, mm-hmm. and so that was like the first time that language, I, even after the temple, like that I had noticed that, yeah, like Adam's totally just being like, not just that she did it, but like you, you gave her to me, God, and she did it. And so not my fault, you know, it, it's kind of a, a cowardly thing. So, mm-hmm. but, but that kind of realization came later. Um, but yeah, so i so going back to the temple, there's a lot going on and it is all new. So even though like these, these moments are happening, there's still all of the other stuff. So it's pretty easy for it to kind of just go out of your mind as you're going on to the next thing. And so I, I don't think there were really any other like, um, major moments then. But I, I, I mean, there was one panic moment when, like, when they're going through all the things that you say, and um, when you get to the last, I, I guess, name, and it's just this, you know, big, huge, long thing. I just had one panic. Moment where I was like, I'm not going to remember all of that. But then I was like, of course, they know that. They know that it's going to be fine. And yeah, so it was. So um, I go through. Oh, actually, I did participate in the prayer circle um, with my dad, and I, because I, like, under the idea that that would be special. So it was special to me at the time. Um, you know, that I got to do that, but then it was kind of like doing all of that all over again with the veil and also being in the, uh, oh yeah, like the, the, the prayer circle around the temple altar. I did forget to put that in here, but that was an uncomfortable moment for me because it's just so culty, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I mean, you try to justify things like when you're believing, like there's always, there's no end to it, like the way that you can justify something. So even like, I felt really uncomfortable with this chanting. It just like really called back, like just the creepy ceremonies from like Hollywood movies. So that's who I blamed. I was like, you know, Satan is just so smart. Like he, he, he was probably part of these like Hollywood depictions of ma- making this look really creepy in like dark rooms or blood sacrifices and weird robed people. And, and, you know, like for this reason, so that righteous people going through the temple would make that association and feel icky because of it. Like I really did like come up with this whole scenario in my mind of just how ahead of the ball Satan is on things. And I, I blamed Satan for my uncomfortable feelings at these, this chanting at this altar like because of Hollywood because of course he runs Hollywood right 
So anyway, that was a moment. <laughs> and so I would always just kind of berate myself for feeling uncomfortable, like anytime that happened by just being like, just like, you know, have not worldly ideas, but try to have celestial like views of, of this. And this is really sacred and, you know, too sacred for your face. But anyway, um, so I get through, I'm in the celestial room, like when we finally get there. And I do remember, I was thinking, I, I did feel like it was the spirit. I felt... Um, I did feel kind of peaceful and calm. And I think part of it like was because just because it's over. It's a long thing and you just don't know what to expect. So you're, there's a lot of like, nervousness, right? So I think just having completed it, there's just kind of like that coming down kind of a feeling. I feel like that's what it was. And then also just a sense of accomplishment because I, like, my whole life, again, just like from a very young age, it's like the temple, the temple, the temple. Like when you get older, this is the goal. You want to go to the temple and again, purity, be pure for the temple so that you can go. And, and so I think I had the sense of like, um, I made it, you know, like this is what like people have been worried about. I've been worried about like, it's a minefield out there. Satan and his fiery darts, like that seminary video, like where he's like always waiting to try to get you to pull you off the path. I feel like, you know, I felt like I made it. I stayed faithful. I stayed true. So I got here. So I feel like that's the primary source of like the good feeling I had mm -hmm. was this kind of like, I did it, you know. And, well, and you, you end up in that gorgeous celestial room yeah, that the chandelier yeah, is very that's, sparkly and very Everyone pretty. has to be quiet. <laughs> yeah. And so you have time to think. So- yeah. And, and again, like you're finished with everything. So you can kind of like uh, come down from that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So I think, I think that's what I was feeling. And also just the kind of, I guess the initiation of it, like I'm an adult now, I feel like, you know, it's a there's not this, thing. yeah, this thing that I'm waiting for or whatever, like that, you know, whatever there's kind of, when you get to the temple, you'll understand, you know, this or that. And, and just the, yeah, I was just like, I, I'm in, I'm in, I made it, you know, anyway. Um, there was this cute little lady from my ward who came up um, and I remember her asking like how, like how I'm feeling and I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good. And I, my dad was like close to me um, at this moment and this lady, I still just remember her face. Like she was smiling and it, and that's what I think makes it so weird to me. Um, she, and she's really short. I'm really short, but she's even shorter. So I remember like her looking up at me with this smile on her face um, and she just says, well, you know, back when I went through the first time, there used to be penalties. <laughs> and I had known about them. I, I wonder if I maybe had heard a rumor or something. I don't know. I just remember saying, oh, really? And then, yeah, she's smiling. She says, yeah, we used to mind. And she did it. She said, we used to mind slitting our throat or cutting our stomachs open. And again, like there's this weird smile on her face about it. And I'm horrified. It's like, so she did it, you know, she's like, like cutting our throats and like disemboweling ourselves. And I just remember feeling sick to my stomach because like, that is not, why would that be in there? It, it just seems so barbaric, you know? So I, yeah, I just, a, a bunch of like emotions really randomly. First of all, like my initial reaction was like, she's lying. That was the, the, my very first thought. She's lying. But then I was like, dad, we're, we're in the celestial room. Like who would do that? She's a sweet old lady. Why would she lie about it? You know? Um, and then like, and I remember my dad just kind of like fading out from my view, you know, I was like, I know he heard that. I know he heard that. And he's just kind of walking away. And so it's kind of like what your friend, like <laughs> by not saying something like, you know, and so, yeah. So I had a moment, I just a, like, just really like that scramble, you know, the, the cognitive dissonance, something's wrong here. Got to fix it. I need a bandaid. I need a bandaid really quick. And so what I came up with at the time, I, I, I remember just kind of doing a weird little laugh. I was just like, okay, uh, early saints, they were really they were really intense about some of these things, weren't they? <laughs> and that was enough to make me feel better. Like, cause I mean, cause you hear things, you know, like from Brigham Young's time, like it's, it's, all kinds of stuff happened, you know? And I was just like, you know, that. It's called thought, it's called thought stopping. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, and I needed something, but I, this was like the longest I remember, like really, really scrambling in my brain to try to come up with something to fix something that really seems so horrifying to me. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the bad, that was good enough. Like the saints were very, zealous, I guess. Another thing your story is teaching me is that a lot of times the undue influence isn't always something that's overtly 
wielded by the church. A lot of the times we exert undue influence on ourselves. We condition and brainwash ourselves. Absolutely. I know I did that. I mean, I'm, this is yeah. like the third or fourth time in your story where I'm like, she's kind of brainwashing herself. Yeah. You can't kind of, you can't totally blame the church necessarily for all I think of they it. They taught me to do it. But <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, but I, I, if we're going back kind of like to the, the scrupulosity, I, I was really worried about apostasy, you know, so thoughts were really scary to me, even just like a, a really minor one, even just being uncomfortable with things at the temple. That was a, like a potential you know, thing that could grow. So, um, yeah. So just, it just even like just being dissatisfied with something, uh, especially like temple stuff. Cause that's from heavenly father. Right. Um, that's a place to inject like your own pride where you think you could know something or run something better than God or better than the priesthood holders and prophets and apostles that he calls for something. So yeah, it didn't take much for an idea to feel dangerous to me. And, and all of these words, so like it's push them out, you know, um, and, and you can do that really successfully a lot until you go to the temple the next time. And then you have to, <laughs> you have to deal with it again and deal with the veil again. And so, um, yeah, so that, that is something too, cause I, I wasn't a feminist, but I did like the church is saying like, you know, that rhetoric, like just different roles, but you're equal still, but in different ways, you know? And so like, I really held on to that and, um, and I, and I felt, you know, there's an answer for everything. And I remember being told once, like, uh, the, the people who work at the temple, you know, the, the temple matrons, like, uh, they know a lot of stuff. I mean, first of all, they're older because, and of course, every time you go to the temple, you're supposed to learn new things. So th there's this idea that the older people in the church who've been to the temple, so I just have all of this knowledge, you know, which never really quite came true for me as much as I went, it was the same stuff, you know, but, um, I remember like really being under the impression and, I guess you guys could tell me if you thought this too, or if you remember being told this, but I, I remember thinking like, I, I can ask one of these women uh, in the celestial, room, like where it's appropriate, of course, so you go through the whole thing. So I remember like getting up the courage once because it's so quiet in there, like you don't talk, you know, but I was like, I just really want to know why we have to veil our faces. So I, I, I went up to one of the ladies standing there in the celestial room and I asked her like, hey, do you know, do you know why we have to veil our faces? And her face, she just looked like deer in the headlights, like no idea. And, uh, I remember her just, just telling me like, um, to pray about it basically. And like, well, obviously I have, I've been trying to figure this out for a while. And so I thought maybe she just had this kind of special knowledge. So I remember that being a real disappointment. Cause I, I, I thought that this was, you know, the ladies at the temple would be the beacon of knowledge and know like some deeper secrets, I guess. Um, so anyway, um, I never figured it out. I do remember, like, if we just kind of fast forward a little bit and then we can come back to, like, where I'm at in the story. Um, the temple was just always rough, like, every time. Um, like, for those same points, like, they, as much as you try to justify, like, push them away, like, they, they, they still hurt. And so I, uh, I would just struggle and struggle and struggle. And this was, like, also, like, way after Kate Kelly and the ordained movement. I think one of the, one of the last times I went to the temple I thought to myself, like, you know what, maybe, maybe the issue is like, as much as the church says we're equal and stuff, like, like if we're really, really honest, um, maybe we're not really like, even in God's eyes, like not, not enough to where like some churches like really think like men are up here and like women are like way down here, you know, but I was thinking like, maybe it is true. Like this is where the men are and women are just like under just a little bit right here. And maybe the reason why, like, I struggle so much every time is because, like, in my, again, like, this vain pride vanity, I'm trying to elevate myself, like, above my station by trying to feel equal with the men. So this was, like, a, a thought that I had, like, and again, like, trying to make myself feel better about it. It did not work, but that was the thought was, like, maybe you just, you need to accept this and then it won't like hurt so much to see it because you're not trying to make yourself more than like what you should be. So, um, that was a really sad thought, but I did feel like, I mean, I, I'm a believer. I see, you know, I've been in the church my whole life, but I really felt like, you know, maybe it's true. You know, God wants men to like, to do all of these things. And, uh, like he doesn't want women doing that, you know? So yeah, I think that was probably one of the last times I went, that's in the future though, but we can, so we can come back. I think that's, um, for me, the same, 
the same feeling, one of the same feelings I got um, within the temple, which I think is sad that even, even to my heavenly father, I won't ever be good enough. Like, I just had this feeling like I'm not. Yeah. Like I'm, this is the place where I'm supposed to be like in the highest degree of the celestial kingdom. I'm doing everything right. You know, I've got my card, <laughs> had all the interviews. I, I answered all the same questions that the boys answer. Um, you know, I'm supposed to be in, in the same place. You know, the celestial room is supposed to be in the same, same place, same level. And I didn't feel like that in there. Yeah. Even in that space, I still felt less than. I think maybe not even in that space, but like especially in that space, but because I feel like almost in regular life, it, it's a little bit easier to pretend, you know, um, yeah. and it's just kind of depending on your personal dynamics with everybody else. But I think with it being the temple, like this is about God and this is like what God has set up. So it's just like really, really clear, like this is what God says and this is how you are different, you know, I guess. Yeah. I really did. And, you know, like John was saying, I'm, I wasn't a feminist. I didn't consider myself a feminist because that feminism, like that was a bad word. That was, that was an F word in my house, you know, um, because it wasn't, feminism wasn't equality. It, you know, it was, it, again, like this kind of a um, caricature of it, of, um, you know, well, Rush men Limbaugh, hating women. Rush Limbaugh women hate, was, yeah. called them feminazis. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yep, I am familiar <laughs> with that term. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, so it, it, again, it, it, yeah, I just wanted to feel like... I just wanted to feel equally loved as a daughter as it seemed like the sons were loved. So, mm. um, yeah, so that was, yeah, that was tough, but I get like, I, you still pers like the temple is supposed to be super great. So like, you still say all the right things, you know, I, I, you know, I, things are rough. It's cause I haven't been to the temple in a while or I, I, I went to the temple this weekend. I felt so peaceful, you know, like you, you say the things, you know, um, anyway, um, Afterwards, I, my dad said, I, he said this to my other brother too, um, but it was just kind of like a joke. Like, uh, um, I think he said like, uh, the church is still true is, is what it was. Like we were just sitting in the car, it was just kind of quiet for a while. And, and that's what he said. The church is still true. Another thought stopper. Yeah. But I was like, no, I'm fine. Cause I really did feel like I'm it was fine. fine. Like I honestly felt like I came out of this, like definitely better than some of my friends. And so I think I did, I overall, I felt fine. And I, I, again, like those, those initial things, I, I wasn't ruminating on them at all. Like it was just the first time. So like, yeah, it's just moving on and all right, now I know, uh, you know, again, like I'm in the inner circle. I, I've, I've got the underwear now. And, um, I like, I still, like, I sometimes wonder, like, man, I just, I was so accepting of that. I know there's a lot of people that really had a hard time with it. I did think it was kind of strange, but I was like, I don't know. I just, like, I accepted the, it reminds you of your covenants. That's good enough for me, you know? So yeah. Um, it's just weird. Like how, okay. You can be with like random things sometimes, but, um, but the, like the church was my life. I, again, I, I just believed everything. I didn't have any reason to question anything. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I go on, uh, my mission Yeah, you know, I'm in the MTC for a couple weeks. I, I think that was a pretty normal experience. I, I don't really have much like, to share there. Um, I, this was something that I hadn't mentioned actually earlier, but I, because, because of the toxicity in the home, I had started to be really a lot less expressive about myself. And it was just kind of because it did seem like, again, the kind of the, the superstition, I didn't, good things, if you like them too much, you don't get to keep them. And so mm -hmm. a lot of times like, again, and this would also like, again, come from my brother, like, like I said, uh, like when he was upset, like th something would get broke or someone would get hurt. Um, it was, it was kind of like that kind of a thing. But even like with my relationship with my mother, it seemed like, uh, things that I liked were often used as, as leverage and, and, and reused over and over. It, it makes sense as a parent, as a general parenting strategy, you know, if you do need to discipline your kids, that if there's something that they like, that you withhold that I'm it's, it wasn't like that. It, it just was kind of constant and it just kind of depended at, it, at least to me, it felt like it really depended on my mother's feelings rather than any kind of like fairness or set expectations or rules, they would change. So I couldn't ever really know that I knew the right expectations to follow. So it was easier to not care. Um, and I, I guess the biggest example of that was, this was one of the, like the last things, like before, I, I guess I just kind of internalized the strategy of not caring um, was uh, like, it, it would have been my first concert. It was tickets to InSync. They were coming to Las Vegas. And so um, 
I don't know if people don't know, like it was the boy band era, like Backstreet Boys, in sync, like 98 Degrees, like this was all like the big thing. So um, yeah, so we were, we that was the thing, my mom had bought concert tickets. And so those were constantly used as leverage, like over and over again. And so I remember one day I was supposed to clean my room, which I did. Um, and, and normally that was really rough for me. So that it, like, um, I, I was a very disorganized kid. I'm still disorganized in a lot of ways, but um, it was no small feat to actually do that. So I did it, but my bed was a little bit messed up because I had been sitting on it. So I had like pulled my blanket up around me. But when my mom got home, you know, and I had taken it off and I went out and she came and saw the bed wasn't made, which again, just super minor. Um, but I, I feel like she was upset with me and I feel like that was used as an excuse rather as like the real reason why. So she was like, I'm going to cancel these tickets. I think she wanted a reaction from me, like begging or pleading or something. And I just remember saying like, okay, like, and so she's like, I'm, I'm, I think she thought I was calling her bluff. I, I guess maybe kind of was, but she, I'm going to do it. And so she did. Um, and then she was mad at me. She's like, those were expensive tickets. You know, I just remember thinking like, you're the one that canceled them. Like we could still go that that was you, you know, but that was just one example. Yeah. So just, I was afraid to like things or to show that I liked things. And this was how I was starting to be. Um, and even like relationships with people, I think it, I felt vulnerable. If you show you like people, then they know that they can hurt you maybe. So this is where like my mission was really good for me because I didn't realize what a robot that I had turned into by this point. So, um, yeah, so I start my mission. I have a wonderful, wonderful trainer. Um, I really love my mission president and it, so coming in where I was at, um, the previous mission president had, it had been kind of a baseball baptism kind of mission. It was all about the numbers. So like, I, I'm hearing all these things that like rumors and stuff that like really just are like a year away or a couple months, like from, um, cause I only had one mission present. I was there like right in the middle of his tenure. Right. I'm hearing about like hot tub baptisms happening at like 1am at people's houses and things like that. Right. <laughs> um, it, it's just really crazy. And, and, you know, my trainer had been here through part of that. So like, she also talked to me like about it, what, what it was like. And so she's like, I really like this mission president. Um, cause we really are focused on the quality and I'm really, really grateful for that. So, um, it seems like every mission's either a baseball baptism mission or a reaction or response or recovery from a baseball baptism mission. Yeah. You're either in one or the other. <laughs> yeah. Cause we, we, they had to, I mean, obviously have taken all the lessons and preach my gospel is pretty new at this point. So I remember like not all missions even had it, they, most were starting to mine did. So mine was a preach my gospel mission. Um, but yeah, this is, this is new. And so like the focus really was like, uh, was supposed to be on, on quality, but, um, I, uh, we, somebody, they had to come to church four times minimum. So there was, there was a minimum one month between like when you meet somebody and baptize them, if they came to church immediately, like right away. Um, and then, uh, children, uh, would have to like, they, they would have to have a member parent or like they, we would basically, it was really rare, but if a child wanted to be baptized that did not have member parents or like at least a member parent, like we would have a, a commitment from the parents to bring this kid to church every single week. We would commit the parents to do that until they were old enough to drive themselves or take themselves some way. So I don't think we really baptized any kids that didn't have, you know, uh, but I mean, there was a part member family. Like one of my baptisms was a child of a, a woman who was a member and the husband was not. And I, I, we had to have this talk with her. So, um, yeah, stuff like that. And, um, uh, the previous missionaries too, I think spent a lot of time at members houses, which I think may be kind of a problem everywhere because of the like mission culture of kind of like the mission worship, but just like, everyone has family members out. So I, I almost feel like there's this kind of like, reciprocation. You want to treat the missionaries well in your area because you hope that members will, will treat your relatives and loved ones well, wherever they're at. Um, so we had really strict rules about being with members. Like we, uh, you know, dinners had to be an hour only we were supposed to eat that first half hour and teach a lesson the, ha the second half, but like never worked because they were never ready <laughs> on time. Like when we got there and then, um, the, uh, like we just weren't allowed to hang out there at all. And I think our, um, we were also limited just, I think like once or twice a week. And so I remember in my first area, they would, uh, buy groceries for us a lot to kind of make up for the fact that like we couldn't get a lot of meals with them. So, um, so those were, kind of, I guess, the rules we were coming in. And, and I, of course, I think when there's like a baseball baptism culture, 
I, there's usually a disobedient culture too, I think. So, um, yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> we, we were not allowed headphones at all. Like on, on my mission, anything like that was going to be listened to had to be listened to by both companions. Um, and that was something I, like he was very strict on when I met my mission president in the mission home, um, was if you get caught, like even having headphones, I didn't even bring any with me cause I knew that beforehand. But if you got caught with them, just like listening to an earbud, like they would send you home. Mm. That's what he said. That's strict. Yeah. I think that like lessened over time, but that's like where I came in at. So, um, my parents both, uh, ended up remarrying other people, uh, within the first six months of my mission. Um, my mother was first, and this was back in the time where you couldn't, you could only call home twice a year. There was mother's day and then there was Christmas day. So I, it was May. I talked to my mother on mother's day. She was on LDS singles, which was like pretty new at that time. And like, that was one of the big places to go online to meet other Mormons. Um, and so she was uh, going to meet a guy the next day and she was really excited about it. So, um, yeah, so I have my talk with her. She, uh, I, I get my email, um, for, on P day, which we had, like, it was Thursdays for us. And she like, she did something with him every day leading up until that point. She was really excited and she already was talking about marriage with that. And so we, uh, I mean, I didn't think too much of it cause it is kind of normal to like, I mean, I even talked about marriage on first dates with people. Um, but then the next P day, it was more up to step about how in love with this guy she was. And she had said like, we really are, uh, we're getting married. Um, and so I, uh, again, I just thought like, this is just the, the plan, you know? And so I got a phone call that Saturday from my mission president saying that my mom wanted to talk to me, you know, about getting married. And I, I just, I don't know if she wanted my opinion or something, but I was in the mindset, like she's a, she's an adult, you know? So like, if she wants to get married, she can get married. It seems like it, it, she's definitely going really quickly, but that's also not that unusual in, in, in the church. So um, it was the next uh, P day, which was the first week of June that I found out that she had married um, uh, by the end of May. So met and married within within a couple weeks. Yeah. yeah. And so that did surprise me. I, but still at the end of the day, I just thought like she's, yeah, you know. Yeah. And one thing that might blow the minds of people who don't know about Mormon missions is that you're not allowed to go home to your own parents' weddings because as a missionary, you can't even go home for significant family members dying usually, or, or it's stigmatized if you do. So it sounds like both your parents get married and you don't get to attend either wedding. Right. Yeah. And I think I, maybe just because of the family environment, I was pretty surprisingly okay with it. So it was a... Uh, my companion at the time seemed a lot more freaked out about it than I was. She had a very uh, close and, and cohesive family. And so um, this is like finding out that my mother got married. I, she she would continually ask me over the next, like, are you sure you okay? Like, do you need to talk about it? And I would say, no, I'm, re I'm really fine. I, I don't need to talk about it. And uh, yeah, so I think it's just really wild for her um, that I had that kind of reaction. But I guess that's just where I was. Um, my dad uh, took a little bit longer, but he also met his wife on LDS Singles. Um, so they had just a couple months uh, courtship and then uh, and they got married. So between uh, the new like step parents and then uh, a bunch of step, there was 10 new family members <laughs> that I got that I never met um, within that first six months. So yeah. Um, and then, I mean, I did deal with some like anxiety and depression. It was definitely tough, like going out, tracking and things like that. And so I did have times where I stayed in of course, and I did feel guilty for doing that. Um, but I, I was able to usually kind of push through it. And so in some ways I think it was kind of good because I had dealt with some like almost debilitating anxiety at school. Once things started getting really uh, tough for me, I would, um, I would just, I mean, and this is what's sad, like I, I had been in Hawaii, but there were some days that I, or I mean, like several days in a row that I would be maybe like at least 20 hours like in my dorm room, like not even going outside just because I was so overwhelmed with life and with things. So I think that was one good thing about the mission was the fact like, did you had to go out anyway? We had a companion and, you know, it was most of the time it was scarier to me to have to call the mission president or his wife to say that we're not going out than it was to like at least go out. And so I learned from that, like I can do hard things. And sometimes if there's something just really overwhelming and just taking just one step, you know, um, so sometimes just like getting out the door, you know, or that first knock on that first door and things got a lot better after that. So, um, in a way, I think for me, that was actually really 
uh, really good for me to see. Like it's not always the end of the world um, when it feels like it. Um, of course, there's some sexism on the mission. Again, this is like this is before the age range was dropped, so their sisters were very very rare. I think the most that we had, we represented almost 10 percent of the mission, but uh, that was the most. Um, I and I think maybe that was like 18 sisters um, in like 120 missionaries. Um, I think a lot of the sexism was really just kind of us being an afterthought because it was just like a small portion of things. So um, I remember like when it was starting to get to be summer and really hot at a ZOE conference, our, our mission president announced to the elders, you know, they didn't have to wear the jackets or the long sleeves anymore. Of course, unless you, you were tattooed, then you do continue to have to wear the long sleeves. And um, after that announcement, he was getting ready to sit down. And my mission president's wife was amazing. She's a spitfire of a person. I think um, if I ever heard her give a talk like in general conference in like that, that primary voice, I would be personally devastated because she has her own voice and she was very spunky. So um, yeah, I loved her anyway. So she, um, uh, she just like pipes up, you know, uh, what about the sisters? And uh, like, he comes back to the mic, but I remember him being kind of confused and just looking at her and being like, what about them? Because like, we can already wear short sleeves and things like that. So, um, yeah. So he's like, what, you know, what, what do they need? And she just yells out pantyhose <laughs> and everybody starts giggling, of course, like the elders and, and then us. Um, and he was like, are the, are those hot? And she was like, yeah, and they are. But I think just because it's like a really thin material, it's just something like that guys would never think about that. They are really hot and they can be really suffocating. So even in skirts, even in the summertime. Um, so yeah, so that was just kind of like a funny thing. And so the mission president was like, okay, um, sisters, you don't, you don't have to wear pantyhose. Which is a, we don't call him that, but it's so it's funny. And then um, there was a, one area I got put into with a companion right after elders um, so they, I guess whitewashing is, is the term, um, putting in a whole new companion. And so when we got there, um, the bedroom did not have any kind of curtains or covering at all. It's just a big open window. And not only that, but just behind uh, our, our apartment, uh, the land kind of like went up a little bit. So if someone was back there, they would be standing higher or like at level with the window. So they looking in the window, you can see the entire bedroom and like you can see our beds. So like if someone were standing out there, they could watch us sleeping, right? So of course, we are not comfortable with this. And so we call the office elders, like maybe maybe guys don't care, you know, cause they never like have to worry about their safety or whatever. Um, so, but yeah, it was definitely a concern to us. So I, I remember we called the office elders to ask like, can we like, get some blinds or, you know, something over? Um, and they, uh, they kind of like joked around, like made fun of us. Like, oh, of course the sisters want curtains. Like it's, it's not good enough for them. Like they got it, you know. Like have to, you know, and like we pushed back and we're like, this is a wide open window. And they're like, who's going to be back there? It's like, it doesn't matter <laughs> who's going to be back there or the likelihood, just like the fact that someone can, I, you, you don't want like for something to happen first before you go, oh, okay. Like now this makes sense. Um, but I, we didn't get curtains and like, you don't get enough like stipend money. We weren't going to spend money on that. So I had, um, an American flag, my brother, the one close in age to me, um, he had, um, joined the military and, and he had been over in Afghanistan. So like I had gotten this flag from him. So that's like, that's what we put up for our window covering. Those are, I guess, really like the only complaints, like I said, like, uh, my, my leaders, like the district leaders I had, I thought were really great. Um, there was one that noticed that I, I struggled to take compliments very well. So he made that a personal assignment. And uh, so when we, like I would have conversations with him in the weekly or nightly check-ins, he would give me a, con a compliment or more than one sometimes. And he was, you know, and I had to say, I just had to say thank you and and not refute it or try to change the subject or you know anything like that um and he did that for a while and it was excruciating at the time but it was but it was really good for me um and my companions were really good for me too they were helping me get out of my shell like my again my first my trainer was great she was very communicative and so i, I felt like I, I i trusted her and i could share my feelings with her she didn't push me but i know some trainers can be like just really forceful and you know go for it, you know, th this is your door, you, you know, and just be really strict about it. But she, um, I mean, she still pushed me to do things. She didn't just let me get away with anything, but, um, but she didn't feel like it was her job to be like my military commander, I guess, like, and, and like forcing me to do things if I was feeling really unsure. So 
I had really good companions. Um, I, I just, I had one that wasn't very good for me, but, um, other than that, I, um, I remember really learning like the truth really matters. And I, I guess it's surprising to me now, like how many people will stay in the church, even if they, they believe or know it, it's not true. But the, my mission it really just drove things home. I mean, one, there was a talk from a mission president in his own conference once where he just was saying, like, we teach this because it's true, not because like, you know, it's a good place to raise families or, you know, values and, and things like that. Like, if it's not true, like this is, this is not worth it. What we're doing here is not worth it. So I remember like really taking it in, like, yeah, we're here because this is the truth. And not only that, but I, I used to ask people all the time, like, if, if this, if this church were the true church, would you join it? Which is a really common question. And I get that now. And, um, I just laugh because I didn't realize what a terrible question that was. But to me, I thought it was genius because if they, it, it just showed if they really cared or not to me about truth. So if I said, if this was true, would you join it? If they said anything other than yes, then I didn't think they cared about it. But I had a Jehovah's Witness actually like hit me with that first once, which surprised me. And I had never really considered it from another point of view like that. So I, I did. I like took it genuinely. And I thought about like, what if... Uh, I was wrong being Mormon my whole life. And it was actually the Jehovah's Witnesses. And I was able to come through a revelation or, you know, some kind of spiritual experience. I came to this conclusion, like, would I be willing to leave the church and and join that? You know, no more birthdays and, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and I thought to myself, I would, because if that is God's church and if that's where he is, that is what I care about. And so I just remember that kind of just really driving it home for me as well. I'm not just in this because I was born in it. I believe it and I'm here because I think it, it is true. And that's what matters to me. So that was a big, uh, I guess, impact and kind of a recurring theme throughout my mission. Um, and then, uh, so in my first area, I actually spent half my mission there. I was there for nine months um, and uh, three companionships. And that's where I met uh, my first uh, first trans person, at least that, um, you know, that I was told was trans. And uh, that was a, a sister, Jennifer Blackwell. Yeah. Which, uh, I think you may be familiar with. We interviewed <laughs> so, her. Yeah, yeah. We can put that in the show notes. Yeah. Um, it's it's <clears throat> funny. I had actually connected with her through Steph. Steph had posted a picture. I knew a little bit about her story. I just, I knew that she was from Utah. I knew that she had left her family and that they didn't really have anything to do with her anymore, like her, like her children. And I remember thinking that that was really sad. But of course, for where I was then, I was like, it's understandable though, you know, Um um, which really is a, a pity, but I, um, so I, the, and this was, I feel like pretty recently when I, after I lost my faith is when I saw, um, Steph's, uh, photo, uh, selfie that she posted and the ex Mormon read it. And, and she, she was saying like, I'm going to see, um, you know, I, another mother or my other mother that I don't know. I just, the title made me think <laughs> she's visiting a trans mother that she has not seen or had a relationship with. And I, I remember thinking, I, I wonder if that um, you know, if, if that's sister Blackwell and I really, and when I, like, I saw the picture, I thought it looked like her, but then I, I couldn't decide. I kept flip flopping like back and forth. Like, yeah, that's what I think this is her kid. No, it's not. It's no, it's just, it, yes, it is. I think it is. So I, I finally messaged. Um, anyway, so yeah, but I wasn't expecting stuff to be on the show either. So that was like a new thing and kind of a, a an interesting surprise, but. And for listeners, viewers who don't know. So Jennifer raised Mormon, I think in Idaho, but think, ultimately comes out transitions uh, comes out as a, as a trans female leaves like in the eighties. Leaves her, yeah. 80s, in the eighties yeah. leaves her family, her Mormon family moves away, becomes ostracized from her child um, who later transitions herself. Right. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty powerful. Story. It is a powerful yeah. story. I definitely recommend if they haven't seen it to check it out. Yeah, that's where I met her. She was in the ward I was in and I, we didn't interact with her very much, but I did know a little bit about her story. And of course we saw her every week. So like my next area was in Allentown, Pennsylvania. I, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Billy Joel. <laughs> He's got oh, his yeah. song. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're living here in Allentown. It's an apt song. I listened to it after it. I was like, you know, I get it because it it's definitely, there's, I mean, and this was, yeah, a lot of poverty. Rust Belt. Yeah. And this was also, um, so there were elders, they were, they were in actual Allentown. The sisters were in the suburb areas around it. And that's kind of how the mission was. They, they did not put sisters in Philly. 
they had the elders down there. We were put in like, you know, the more considered safer areas, right? So yeah, so there's a pair of elders and a pair of sisters. Like we shared this ward and the sisters had the car because our area was more spread out and they could do more on foot in the in the city where they were, right? Um, but this was a really interesting ward like because of it, because there was such a huge split between like rich suburbs where most of white people lived and most of the black people were in the city and they were poorer. And this ward was... I was just really burnt out by the elders from that previous mission. Um, I think that was the mission where there was like a, the 1 a.m. hot tub baptism. And this is another thing too. Like, I mean, it the gospel is taught a lot as if like it's like a this panacea. Like it'll fix anything. Like it can fix poverty, right? If you're righteous. I mean, even like in my own family, even though I wasn't seeing it, the whole prosperity gospel thing. So it's... Um, this is the area that I really learned, like the church can't fix deep poverty issues. If there's addictions, um, if there's um, just a lot of unhealthiness and you just, you just can't fix it by being baptized or just going to church on Sunday when there's like, there's systemic issues, like we, you, you just don't have resources, you know? And I guess I, this is another sexism thing actually I did notice because, um, uh, I mean, it, it, this was overt. They really, really wanted us to focus on uh, priesthood holders or potential priesthood holders. So this was something like we would be told, like, you know, I did try to find guys. Like, of course, we're not going to turn away women who want to join the church. But, you know, but if, if we found a new investigator that was a woman, um, it, like we would always be asked, like, you know, is she married? Does she have a husband or a boyfriend or, uh, or a father in the home or brother or, you know, a teenage son, like anybody, is there anybody else also like we get like a guy that we can be sure to try to pull in as well, like to have priesthood holders. So it, it definitely, um, I think kind of added to the idea that, uh, women just aren't, aren't worth as much, you know, like a, a, a woman convert is not worth as much as a male convert. That one last area that I was in, um, um, I had, a, there was an investigator and her husband was really sick. It was like stage four lung cancer. And so he wasn't part of the lessons much because it was like deteriorating, it was going downhill really quick. Um, but she was a really great woman. She had had a lot of the discussions, but she just, like, she didn't get baptized because she was just taking care of her husband mostly. So um, uh, he ended up in the hospital. Like again, like things were really starting to go downhill. Like it, we knew it was going to be the end. And so we actually got our, um, the elders to come and give him a blessing and they just kind of, you know, it was a nice blessing, but you know, thankfully they didn't have the hubris to promise full healing. Um, that would have been really bad, but they like best blessed him basically to, to go on in, into the next life, you know? And so, um, I, I, they decided to do like home hospice. Like he wanted to be able to die at home when it happened. He didn't want to be in the hospital for that. And so um, th something happened. There's just, I, I guess, the, the day that they decided to take him home, they didn't have enough people or something because he was a pretty big guy. And the, the, well, the place that they lived in, it was not uh, like, handy, it, it didn't have a ramp or anything. There was like several concrete steps. So he was bring, brought home in an ambulance so he could have all the right life support stuff like to get him in. But the, I guess the ambulance staff, it was that on route realized like we're not going to have enough to be able to get this guy up steps if there's not any other way inside the house. So our investigator called us in a panic and she was like, is there anyone that can help? And we didn't think there would be because the, she did not live close to any members, but we go ahead and we call up, you know, the elders quorum president. Um, and we're like, is, is there anyone around? Can we get any guys here? Like, you know, heavy, like big guys that like, can help get this guy in, in up these concrete steps into the house. And it just so happened like that he and like the second counselor from the bishopric were like a couple blocks away. They, they happened to be out together. They happened to be in that neighborhood. So it just really seemed like, you know, like God was watching out. This is a miracle. So they come and they're able to get there right as the ambulance gets there. Um, my companion and I go up, like we're standing on either side of the door. I'm like holding it open. Um, they, they bring him up um, and they bring him across the threshold. And as, as soon as he's across the threshold, um, I, I see him stiffen up. And I didn't realize what had happened at first. I thought maybe because of the bump, it was just kind of like a, a cringe, like a, a pain kind of a thing. But um, um, he passed away. I guess in a way, like, he got what he wanted. But um, 
like a lot of his family were there or they were on their way for the transport. They weren't expecting him to go like right then and there and that day, you know, they thought they had at least like a few weeks. So I remember like his mom wasn't there because she had gone to the pharmacy to get some medicines for him that he was going to need, you know, um, and I, I remember feeling like, oh, kind of really awkward. Like, this is obviously a very like painful moment. Um, so I remember, like, going up to her and asking, like, do you want us to leave? And she was like, no, I want you to stay. So um, so we did. And, and, you know, we were happy to. Um, I remember his mom coming home and, um, you know, and finding out he was gone and, and her cry over that um, and the other relatives coming and things like that. And I, I just, like, I didn't know what to do, you know. I, I wanted to help but like I just this is not something that they ever go over you know um but there was there was a lady there like from the county I guess I think I, I don't know what she got there but I, she had to be I think for the body just to make sure like they didn't you know I don't know but she was there she just kind of set up she had paperwork and she just set up in a corner just out of the way I remember going up to her because, I mean, part of me kind of felt like I should know what to do because I'm a missionary, you know, for, for God. And, you know, I should have like the right, perfect, beautiful thing to say, you know, um, but I didn't. And I, um, so I, I just went up to this lady and she's used to this. This is part of her is dealing with death and, you know, things like this. So I remember like, going up to her and saying like, I don't know what to do, you know. And she was really great. And she said, you know, just, just listen they're they're gonna want to talk about them they're want to they're gonna want to tell stories they'll be crying they'll be laughing but just listen ask them questions get them talking about their loved one and like some of the best advice like to date that I I've received about something like this and I, I remember even at the time thinking like isn't it interesting that like something so poignant and so important and useful was it was not something ever given to me by the church, you know, but I, I had to get as a representative of, of the Lord, you know, from a lady. But I mean, um, but it was great. And so that's what we did. I'm really, really grateful that it was not in my mind to be like, this is a great missionary opportunity to like talk about the plan of salvation to all these non-members. You know, I, I am really grateful that that's not where I was at, because um, that would have been really awful. But um, there was a point where, like, his mother that like, came up to me and she said, "I found his baptismal certificate from some Protestant, you know, like, vacation Bible school or something from when he was a kid." So I, she, I remember her saying, "Like, I'm so glad I found this." You know, I, I was really worried. You know, and of course, like in our theology, it doesn't matter anyway. This is not from us. It's not from the like priesthood, it's not you know, a legitimate baptism. it's not legitimate, mm -hmm. you know, but of course I, I, I don't say that cause that's dumb. <laughs> and yeah. And so, um, but I still, I wanted, so I said, you know, I think, um, I think God really cares about our hearts and, and he, I don't think he would care even if that, if you didn't, if that piece of paper wasn't there, uh, I, I don't think he would be in hell. I, I think, you know, God loves your son like you love him. And so, like that's as far as I went with that. Um, but yeah, I just kind of like moved around. So like, it's just starting to get later. Like obviously we were there for several hours, but like it still just didn't feel quite right to go home yet. Um, so I am, so I, I think I had the phone. So I call our, our district leader and explain what happened. Like <laughs> this person passed away. And so we're here with the family and, uh, um, Again, a really great leader. He's like, I'm so sorry, sisters. Just let us know if there's anything that you need, you know, just take your time. And um, yeah, we're really sorry that that happened. And so, you know, we said, thank you. And we will try to get home at a reasonable time, of course. It's just like, just when it feels right. So all of those calls are supposed to go up the chain to the mission president. So um, I don't think anything, like that's it as far as I'm concerned. But a few minutes later, we get a phone call from uh, our zone leaders and, um, so I answer it and they say like, hey, what's up? We heard you're not home. So I thought maybe there's maybe some kind of a miscommunication between the district leader and the zone leader. Um, so I just started explaining again, like, well, our, our, uh, our investigator's husband passed away. We're here with the family. You know, um, we'll, we'll try to get home when we can. And he says to me, uh, um, he says, sister, well, what does the white handbook say about curfew? And I remember just, I mean, I really liked my leaders. And even if like up to this point, if they had some kind of a weird assignment in a, in a district leader meeting or a zone meeting, 
I, I always went with it. It was never a big deal. So, but you know, I just, I wanted to support them in their leadership. So even if they did something I thought was stupid, like it was my job to sustain and support. This is the first time I was ever just like, excuse me, what, you know? Um, so what I, what I said back was, I know what's in the white handbook elder. Um, and if there's people who don't know, like that's, it's all of the rules that we're supposed to follow as a missionary, which includes curfew and when you're supposed to be home. So um, yeah, so he tried to kind of like obedience brings blessings me, uh, give me a lesson on this, you know, and I just, I remember feeling so confident. This is one of like the first times like, feeling confident going against a leader, going against a man, specifically somebody like it, you know, with uh, some authority over me. And I said, um, I, so I just pushed back on it and I said, I know what the white handbook says. We're not going to stay here all night. We're not going to be unreasonable. When the time is right, we'll go home and I'll call and I'll let you know when we get there. And I told him, because again, I, I had a really good mission president who like really cared about real stuff and people, you know, I was like 99% sure if he had a problem with it, uh, he could ask the mission president and he would uh, side with us. And so I invited him to do that. I said, if you have a problem with it, you can go ahead uh, and call president. And, and then if he has a problem with it, he can call us and didn't hear back. And I really <laughs> want to know sometimes if he did call or not, because I kind of hope he did, because I feel like if he did, I think he would have gotten a really good reaming from president. And so in my mind, I'm kind of hoping that he got one. But um, anyway, but even this guy, I, I don't know if he'll recognize this story. It's been a long time. Maybe he won't remember. But I, I mean, I've heard from other sources that he does, he regrets how he was as a leader, that this is actually something that he realized that was maybe unhealthy about what he did it. So I, I hear he's like a really, really great guy now. So I just wanted to put that out there. But is there any final, I, I know you have that story about the temple after your mission. Yeah, I can, we can wrap up with that. I, okay. I, uh, after my mission, I was in the temple. I don't even remember which one anymore, but the, uh, they had asked for volunteers to do ceilings. They said they needed some, some people. So it was me and then some other, um, uh, return missionary guy, um, that I had never met before who was, you know, the proxy husband across from the altar while I was the proxy wife. And the sealer was the previous mission president of my mission. And I remember like when I learned who he was, um, I, I went, we went through and did all of the sealings, but I was wondering if I should say something or, or mention it. I wasn't very impressed with him because of what happened under his leadership. Um, but when we were done with the sealings, he started talking to the guy that had been the proxy husband for these, uh, asked, you know, you just back from a mission, he says, yep, where did you serve? He says where he served, they have this whole conversation and, uh, and I'm sitting, I'm standing right next to him and I'm, and I'm just trying to think like, what am I going to say? Like when he, when he talks to me and he, he asks me like, you know, if, when I, if I came back from a mission and where I served and when I say like I served in his mission, what am I going to say? Um, but when he was done uh, talking to the guy, he just left the room. And I remember kind of thinking like, oh yeah, like why, why would he, why would he talk to me? <laughs> like, why would he think? Cause women still like didn't serve a lot. So like, why would he even think to ask me if I served a mission? It was just another thing where I was just like, I remember feeling silly for feeling equal, like for feeling like I was going to get yeah, like equal attention uh, as, as the guy that I was standing right next to. But mm, I'm so that's sorry. it. Yeah, that's the mission. So if you had to describe the state of your testimony and the state of your mental health and well-being and self-confidence at the end of your mission. What? I would actually say it was improved um, then from when I went out. Uh, I, which it seems rare, I guess, but maybe that just might be the stories that I hear, the stories that you're allowed to tell, you know, now that you, you aren't really allowed to say before. But yeah, I, I think overall it was very good for me. There were definitely some things that hurt. There were things, some, there were things that weren't good, but overall I, I really did, I think, benefit from it. How so? Um, I think from, uh, from the companions I had that helped me like learn how to act like a human being again, um, just from the elders that I treated me really well. I mean, I gave the few examples, but those were really standouts. I never felt like they, uh, thought less of me. So I, I really did feel like, uh, a, a, com like a com camaraderie with them. And then, uh, my mission president, he just, he cared about the right things. And so I just think if I had been 
under the previous mission president where it was all numbers, I think that would have really hurt my testimony. And so I think that's probably why it was strengthened because it, it really did match up to a lot of what I thought missionary work would be, which is trying to find, you know, that, that golden person. So other than just like a few things here and there, I'm, I'm learning to uh, be friends. I'm learning to express myself. I'm learning to uh, e even have like conversations ab about criticisms and in a, a, a neutral way without freaking out. And, uh, and overall my testimony was improved. I would say I, mm -hmm. I really felt like, um, I, I, I really felt like I, I knew Jesus and, and, and like what it was to like really love and care about people. So, mm. yeah. Oh, well, that's, um, you know, I, I feel really good about my mission experience as well. And that's one of the really hard, maybe ambivalent things about struggling with your Mormon experience is there are so many experiences that were often good or healthy or that even strengthened you. And it sounds like your mission was that for you. It was, yeah, it was one step at least out of uh, my shell. I, the church still had me in one, but I yeah. think, I guess a, a, a different one than I, the family was, I, yeah. I got me in, I guess. So, yeah. 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 So, so I guess we're, we'll complete part two now. And, uh, well, when we do the interview for part three, it's going to be kind of how do you go from being a valiant, righteous, <laughs> empowered return missionary with the best mental health and well-being you'd ever had? How do you go from that to Maven? To Maven. <laughs> how do you fall so far? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that'll be part three. Or there rise <laughs> so high. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> nice, Jen. All right. Okay. Well, thanks, Maven. This yep. has been fun. And and listeners and viewers, thanks for tuning in today. Um, you know, join us next time for part three, where we find out how Maven becomes Maven. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Maven. All right. We'll see you guys soon for part three of this story. See you soon.